Introduction of History of the Kings of Britain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth Translated by Aaron Thompson and J. A. Giles Introduction The British history, of which we now offer to the public a revised translation, has been to our early dramatic poets what the ill-fated house of Oedipus was to the tragic writers of ancient Greece. Those who have felt pleasure in the Comus of Milton, Drayton's Polyolbion, and still more in the King Lear of Shakespeare, will not be sorry to see the source, whence these great poets drew their materials, made more accessible to the English reader. It is necessary to state this at the outset. We do not insert the British history in our series of early English records as a work containing an authentic narrative. Nor do we wish to compare Geoffrey of Monmouth with Bede in point of veracity. But the fact of his having supplied our early poets so large a portion of their subjects, and the universal belief which at one time prevailed as to the authenticity of his history, make it, in every respect, a question whether he ought not to be preserved, whilst the ample allusions and, if we may use the expression, the groundwork on which many of the facts are based, enable us indubitably to introduce him into our series as an addition, though secondary in value, to materials which our readers will find not to be inexhaustible, respecting our early history. The work was translated into English by Thompson, and published in eight volumes, in the year 1718. He followed, for the most part, Comeline's edition of the original, Heidelberg Folio, 1587. Prefixed to the work is a long introduction in which the translator endeavours to defend his author from the charge of having inserted the narrative which he professes to have translated from the old British tongue. It is now, of course, universally admitted that the whole series of British kings, from Brutus downwards, is a tissue of fables, but it may readily be conceded that Geoffrey did not view the matter in this light. Nor shall we be disposed in the present day to deny the conclusion at which the translator arrives, that the work contains a large quantity of matter which is fabulous, but that Geoffrey has done no more than fulfil the task which he took upon himself of translating it from the original language. The following are a few of Thompson's arguments, which we give by way of specimen. 1. That upon its first appearance in the world, the book met with a universal approbation, and that too from those who had better opportunities of examining the truth of it, as there were then more monuments extant, and the traditions were more fresh and uncorrupted concerning the ancient British affairs, than any critics of the present age can pretend to. 2. That, except William of Newburgh, about the end of the reign of Richard I, it met with no opponents, even down to the seventeenth century but was, on the contrary, quoted by all, in particular by Edward I, in a controversy before Boniface VIII. 3. That we see in this history the traces of venerable antiquity. 4. That the story of Bruta and the descent of the Britons from the Trojans was universally allowed by Geraldus Cambriensis and others, and was opposed, for the first time, by John of Westhamstead, who lived in the fifteenth century. That Polydore Virgil's contempt for it proceeded from his wish to preserve unimpaired the glory of the Romans, and Buchanan's observations betray his ignorance of the story. 5. That Leyland, who lived under Henry the Eighth, Humphrey Lloyd, Sir John Price, Dr. Keyes, Dr. Powell, and others, have supported the story of Bruta, etc. 
it will not be necessary to follow them further. Let us then consider the account which Geoffrey himself gives of the work which he offered to his contemporaries. This account, in the words of the former translator, and with his additional remarks upon it, is as follows. The story, as collected from himself, Leyland, Bale and Pitts, is that Walter Mapes, alias Calanus, Archdeacon of Oxford, who flourished in the reign of Henry I, and of whom Henry of Huntingdon, and other historians as well as Geoffrey himself, make honourable mention, being a man very curious in the study of antiquity, and a diligent searcher into ancient libraries, and especially after the works of ancient authors, happened, while he was in America, to light upon a history of Britain, written in the British tongue, and carrying marks of great antiquity. And being overjoyed at it, as if he had found a vast treasure, he in a short time after came over to England, where inquiring for a proper person to translate this curious but hitherto unknown book, he very opportunely met with Geoffrey of Monmouth, a man profoundly versed in the history and antiquities of Britain, excellently skilled in the British tongue, and withal, considering the time, an elegant writer both in verse and prose, and so recommended this task to him. Accordingly, Geoffrey, being incredibly delighted with this ancient book, undertook the translating of it into Latin, which he performed with great diligence, approving himself, according to Matthew Paris, a faithful translator. At first, he divided it into four books, written in a plain and simple style, and dedicated it to Robert, Earl of Gloucester, a copy whereof is said to be at Bennett College in Cambridge, which was never yet published. But afterwards he made some alterations, and divided it into eight books, to which he added the book of Merlin's Prophecies, which he had also translated from British verse into Latin prose, prefixing to it a preface, and a letter to Alexander, Bishop of Lincoln. A great many fabulous and trifling stories were inserted into the history. But that was not his fault. His business as a translator was to deliver them faithfully, such as they were, and to leave them to the judgment of the learned to be discussed. To prove the truth of this relation, and to answer at once all objections against Geoffrey's integrity, one needs no other argument than an assurance that the original manuscript which Geoffrey translated, of whose antiquity the curious are able to judge in a great measure by the character, or any ancient and authentic copy of it is yet extant. And indeed, Archbishop Usher mentioned an old Welsh chronicle in the Cotonian Library that formerly was in the possession of that learned antiquary, Humphrey Lloyd, which he says is thought to be that which Geoffrey translated. But if that be the original manuscript, it must be acknowledged that Geoffrey was not merely a translator, but made some additions of his own, since, as that most learned prelate informs us, the account that we have in this history of the British Flamens and Arch Flamens is nowhere to be found in it. But besides this, there are several copies of it in the Welsh tongue, mentioned by the late ingenious and learned Mr. Lloyd in his Archaeologia Britannica. And I myself have met with a manuscript of the history of our British affairs, written above a hundred years ago by Mr. John Lewis, and shortly to be published, wherein the author says that he had the original of the British history in parchment written in the British tongue before Geoffrey's time, as he concludes from this circumstance, that in his book Geoffrey's preface was wanting, and the preface to his book was the second chapter of that published by Geoffrey. My ignorance of the Welsh tongue renders me unqualified for making any search into these matters. And though the search should be attended with never so much satisfaction to those who are able to judge of the antiquity of manuscripts, yet to the generality of readers other arguments would perhaps be more convincing. The above extract informs the English reader of the date at which Geoffrey lived, 
and every other particular necessary to be known respecting the history of the work. In the present edition, the translation of Thompson has been followed, revised, and corrected wherever the phraseology appeared to be unsuited to the more accurate ears of the present day. A short chronology of the history has been added, which may not be thought out of place by the lovers of Shakespeare, Milton, and our early poets. J. A. Giles, Windlesham Hall, November, 1842 End of Introduction Book One, Part One of History of the Kings of Britain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth Translated by Aaron Thompson and J. A. Giles Book One, Chapter One The Epistle Dedicatory to Robert, Earl of Gloucester Whilst occupied on many and various studies, I happened to light upon the history of the kings of Britain, and wondered that in the account which Gildas and Bede, in their elegant treatises, had given of them, I found nothing said of those kings who had lived here before the incarnation of Christ, nor of Arthur, and many others who succeeded after the incarnation, though their actions both deserved immortal fame and were also celebrated by many people in a pleasant manner and by heart, as if they had been written. Whilst I was intent upon these, and such like thoughts, Walter, Archdeacon of Oxford, a man of great eloquence, and learned in foreign histories, offered me a very ancient book in the British tongue, which, in a continued regular story and elegant style, related the actions of them all, from Brutus, the first king of the Britons, down to Cadwallader, the son of Cadwallo. At his request, therefore, though I had not made fine language my study, by collecting florid expressions from other authors, yet contented with my own homely style, I undertook the translation of that book into Latin. For if I had swelled the pages with rhetorical flourishes, I must have tired my readers by employing their attention more upon my words than upon the history. To you, therefore, Robert, Earl of Gloucester, this work humbly sues for the favour of being so corrected by your advice that it may not be thought to be the poor offspring of Geoffrey of Monmouth, but when polished by your refined wit and judgment, the production of him who had Henry, the glorious King of England, for his father, and whom we see an accomplished scholar and philosopher, as well as a brave soldier and expert commander, so that Britain with joy acknowledges that in you she possesses another Henry. Chapter 2 The First Inhabitants of Britain Britain, the best of islands, is situated in the Western Ocean, between France and Ireland, being 800 miles long and 200 broad. It produces everything that is useful to man, with a plenty that never fails. It abounds with all kinds of metals, and has plains of large extent, and hills fit for the finest tillage, the richness of whose soil affords variety of fruits in their proper seasons. It has also forests, well stored with all kinds of wild beasts. In its lawns, cattle find good change of pasture, and bees variety of flowers for honey. Under its lofty mountains lie green meadows, pleasantly situated, in which the gentle murmurs of crystal springs, gliding along clear channels, give those that pass an agreeable invitation to lie down on their backs 
and slumber. It is likewise well watered with lakes and rivers, abounding with fish. And besides the narrow sea, which is on the southern coast towards France, there are three noble rivers, stretching out like three arms, namely the Thames, the Severn, and the Humber, by which foreign commodities from all countries are brought into it. It was formerly adorned with eight and twenty cities, of which some are in ruins and desolate, others are still standing, beautified with lofty church towers, wherein religious worship is performed according to the Christian institution. It is lastly inhabited by five different nations, the Britons, Romans, Saxons, Picts, and Scots, whereof the Britons before the rest did formerly possess the whole island from sea to sea, till divine vengeance, punishing them for their pride, made them give way to the Picts and Saxons. But in what manner, and from whence, they first arrived here, remains now to be related in what follows. Chapter 3 Brutus, being banished after the killing of his parents, goes into Greece. After the Trojan War, Aeneas, flying with Ascanius from the destruction of their city, sailed to Italy. There he was honourably received by King Latinus, which raised against him the envy of Turnus, king of the Rutli, who thereupon made war against him. Upon then engaging in battle, Aeneas got the victory, and having killed Turnus, obtained the kingdom of Italy, and with it Lavinia, the daughter of Latinus. After his death, Ascanius, succeeding in the kingdom, built Alba upon the Tiber, and begat a son named Silvius, who in pursuit of a private amour took to wife a niece of Lavinia. The damsel soon after conceived, and the father of Scanius, coming to the knowledge of it, commanded his magicians to consult of what sex the child should be. When they had satisfied themselves in the matter, they told him she would give birth to a boy who would kill his father and mother, and after travelling over many countries in banishment, would at last arrive at the highest pitch of glory. Nor were they mistaken in their prediction, for at the proper time the woman brought forth a son, and died of his birth. But the child was delivered to a nurse, and called Brutus. At length, after fifteen years were expired, the youth accompanied his father in hunting, and killed him undesignedly by the shot of an arrow. For as the servants were driving up the deer towards him, Brutus, in shooting at them, smote his father under the breast. Upon his death he was expelled from Italy, his kinsmen being enraged him for so heinous a deed. Thus banished, he went into Greece, where he found the posterity of Helanus, son of Priamus, kept in slavery by Pandrasus, the king of Greeks. For after the destruction of Troy, Pyrrhus, the son of Achilles, had brought hither in chains Helanus and many others. And to revenge upon them, the death of his father had given command that they should be held in captivity. Brutus, finding they were by descent his old countrymen, took up his abode among them, and began to distinguish himself by his conduct and bravery in war, so as to gain the affection of kings and commanders, and above all the young men of the country. For he was esteemed a person of great capacity, both in council and war, and signalised his generosity to his soldiers, by bestowing among them all the money and spoil he got. His fame, therefore, spreading over all countries, the Trojans from all parts began to flock to him, desiring under his command to be freed from the subjection to the Greeks, which they assured him 
might easily be done, considering how much their number was now increased in the country, being seven thousand strong, besides women and children. There was likewise then in Greece a noble youth named Assaracus, a favourer of their cause. For he was descended on his mother's side from the Trojans, and placed great confidence in them, that he might be able, by their assistance, to oppose the designs of the Greeks. For his brother had a quarrel with him, for attempting to deprive him of three castles which his father had given him at his death, on account of his being the only son of a concubine. But as the brother was a Greek, both by his father's and mother's side, he had prevailed with the king and the rest of the Greeks to espouse his cause. Brutus, having taken a view of the number of his men, and seen how Azarachus's castles lay open to him, complied with their request. Chapter 4 Brutus's Letter to Pandrasus Being, therefore, chosen their commander, he assembled the Trojans from all parts, and fortified the towns belonging to Assaracus. But he himself, with Assaracus and the whole body of men and women that adhered to him, retired to the woods and hills, and then sent a letter to the king in these words. Brutus, general of the remainder of the Trojans, to Pandrasus, king of the Greeks, sends greeting. As it was beneath the dignity of a nation descended from the illustrious race of Dardanus, to be treated in your kingdom otherwise than the nobility of their birth required, they have betaken themselves to the protection of the woods. For they have preferred living after the manner of wild beasts upon flesh and herbs with the enjoyment of liberty to continuing longer in the greatest luxury under the yoke of slavery. If this gives your majesty any offence, impute it not to them, but pardon it, since it is the common sentiment of every captive to be desirous of regaining his former dignity. Let pity, therefore, move you to bestow on them freely their lost liberty, and permit them to inhabit the thickets of the woods to which they have retired to avoid slavery. But if you deny them this favour, then by your permission and assistance let them depart into some foreign country. Chapter 5 Brutus, falling upon the forces of Pandrasus by surprise, routs them and takes Antigonus, the brother of Pandrasus, with Anacletus, prisoner. Pandrasus, perceiving the purport of the letter, was beyond measure surprised at the boldness of such a message from those whom he had kept in slavery. And having called a council of his nobles, he determined to raise an army in order to pursue them. But while he was upon his march to the deserts where he thought they were, and to the town of Sparatinum, Brutus made a sally with three thousand men, and fell upon him unawares. For having intelligence of his coming, he had gone into the town the night before, with a design to break forth upon them unexpectedly, while unarmed, and marching without order. The sally being made, the Trojans briskly attack them, and endeavour to make a great slaughter. The Greeks, astonished, immediately give way on all sides, and with the king at their head, hasten to pass the river Acalon, which runs near the place, but in passing are in great danger from the rapidity of the stream. Brutus galls them in their flight, and kills some of them in the stream, and some upon the banks, and running to and fro, rejoices to see them in both places exposed to ruin. But Antigonus, the brother of Pandrasus, grieved at this sight, rallied his scattered troops, and made a quick return upon the furious Trojans. For he rather chose to die making a brave resistance, 
than to be drowned in a muddy pool in a shameful flight. Thus attended with a close body of men, he encouraged them to stand their ground, and employed his whole force against the enemy with great vigour, but to little or no purpose. For the Trojans had arms, but the others none. And from this advantage they were more eager in the pursuit, and made a miserable slaughter. Nor did they give over the assault till they had made near a total destruction, and taken Antigonus and Anacletus, his companion, prisoners. Chapter 6 The Town of Sparatinum Besieged by Pandrasus Brutus, after the victory, reinforced the town with six hundred men, and then retired to the woods, where the Trojan people were expecting his protection. In the meantime Pandrasus, grieving at his own flight and his brother's captivity, endeavoured that night to reassemble his broken forces. And the next morning went with a body of his people, which he had got together, to besiege the town, into which he supposed Brutus had put himself with Antigonus and the rest of the prisoners that he had taken. As soon as he was arrived at the walls, and had viewed the situation of the castle, he divided his army into several bodies, and placed them round in different stations. One party was charged not to suffer any of the besieged to go out, another to turn the courses of the rivers, a third to beat down the walls with battering ramps and other engines. In obedience to these commands, they laboured with their utmost force to distress the besieged. A night coming on, made choice of their bravest men to defend their camp and tents from the incursions of the enemy, while the rest, who were fatigued with labour, refreshed themselves with sleep. Chapter 7 The Besieged Ask Assistance of Brutus But the besieged, standing on top of the walls, were no less rigorous to repeal the force of the enemy's engines, and assault them with their own, and cast forth darts and firebrands with a unanimous resolution to make a valiant defence. And when a breach was made through the wall, they compelled the enemy to retire, by throwing upon them fire and scalding water. But being distressed through scarcity of provision and daily labour, they sent an urgent message to Brutus to hasten to their assistance, for they were afraid they might be so weakened as to be obliged to quit the town. Brutus, though desirous of relieving them, was under great perplexity as he had not enough men to stand a pitched battle, and therefore made use of a stratagem, by which he proposed to enter the enemy's camp by night, and having deceived their watch, to kill them in their sleep. But because he knew this was impracticable without the concurrence and assistance of some Greeks, he called to him Anacletus, the companion of Antigonus, and with a drawn sword in his hand, spake to him after this manner. Noble youth, your own and Antigonus's life is now at an end, unless you will faithfully perform what I command you. This night I design to invade the camp of the Greeks, and fall upon them unawares. But I'm afraid of being hindered in the attempt, if the watch should discover the stratagem since it will be necessary, therefore, to have them killed first. I desire to make use of you to deceive them, that I may have the earlier access to the rest. Do you therefore manage this affair cunningly? At the second hour of the night, go to the watch, and with fair speeches tell them that you have brought away Antigonus from prison, and that he has come to the bottom of the woods where he lies hid among the shrubs, and cannot get any further, 
by reason of the fetters with which you will pretend that he is bound. Then you will conduct them, as if it were to deliver him, to the end of the wood, where I will attend with a band of men ready to kill them. Chapter 8 Anacletus, in fear of death, betrays the army of the Greeks. Anacletus, seeing the sword threatening him with immediate death while those words were being pronounced, was so terrified as to promise upon oath that on condition he and Antigonus should have longer life granted them, he would execute his command. Accordingly, the agreement being confirmed, at the second hour of the night he directs his way towards the Grecian camp. And when he was come near it, the watch, who were then narrowly examining all the places where anyone could hide, ran out from all parts to meet him, and demanded the occasion of his coming, and whether it was not to betray the army. He, with a show of great joy, made the following answer, I come not to betray my country, but having made my escape from the prison of the Trojans, I fly hither to desire you would go with me to Antigonus, whom I have delivered from Brutus's chains. For being not sighed to come with me for the weight of his fetters, I have a little while ago caused him to lie hid among the shrubs at the end of the wood, till I could meet with someone whom I might conduct to his assistance. While they were in suspense about the truth of his story, there came one who knew him, and after he had saluted him, told them who he was, so that now, without any hesitation, they quickly called their absent companions, and followed him to the wood where he had told them Antigonus lay hid. But at length, as they were going among the shrubs, Brutus, with his armed bands, springs forth and falls upon them while under the greatest astonishment with the most cruel slaughter. From thence he marches directly to the siege, and divides his men into three bands, assigning to each of them a different part of the camp, and telling them to advance discreetly and without noise, and, when entered, not to kill anybody till he, with his company, should be possessed of the king's tent, and should cause the trumpet to sound for a signal. Chapter 9 The Taking of Pandrasus When he had given them these instructions, they forthwith softly entered the camp in silence, and taking their appointed stations, awaited the promised signal, which Brutus delayed not to give as soon as he had got before the tent of Pandrasus. To assault which was the thing he most desired. At hearing the signal, they forthwith drew their swords, enter in among the men in their sleep, make quick destruction of them, and allowing no quarter in this manner, traverse the whole camp. The rest, awakened at the groans of the dying, and seeing their assailants, were like sheep, seized with a sudden fear, for they despaired of life, since they had neither time to take arms, nor to escape by flight. They run up and down without arms, among the armed, whithersoever the fury of the assault harries them, but are on all sides cut down by the enemy rushing in. Some that might have escaped were in the eagerness of flight dashed against rocks, trees, or shrubs, and increased the misery of their death. Others that had only a shield, or some such covering for their defence, in venturing among the same rocks to avoid death, fell down in the hurry and darkness of the night, and broke either legs or arms. Others that escaped both these disasters, but did not know whither to fly, were drowned in the adjacent rivers, and scarcely one got away without some unhappy accident befalling him. Besides, the garrison in the town, upon notice of the coming of their fellow soldiers, sallied forth and redoubled the slaughter. 
End of Book One, Part One. Book One, Part Two of History of the Kings of Britain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth. Translated by Aaron Thompson and J. A. Giles. Chapter 10 A Consultation About What Is To Be Asked Of The Captive King. But Brutus, as was said before, having possessed himself of the king's tent, made it his business to keep him a safe prisoner, for he knew he could more easily attain his ends by preserving his life than by killing him. But the party that was with him, allowing no quarter, made an utter destruction in that part which they had gained. The night being spent in this manner, when the next morning discovered to their view so great an overthrow of the enemy, Brutus, in transports of joy, gave full liberty to his men to do what they pleased with the plunder, and then entered the town with the king, to stay there till they had shared it among them. Which done, he again fortified the castle, gave orders for burying the slain, and retired with his forces to the woods in great joy for the victory. After the rejoicings of his people on this occasion, their renowned general summoned the oldest of them, and asked their advice, what he had best desire of Pandrasus, who, being now in their power, would readily grant whatever they would request of him, in order to regain his liberty. They, according to their different fancies, desired different things. Some urged him to request that a certain part of the kingdom might be assigned them for their habitation, others that he would demand leave to depart, and to be supplied with necessaries for their voyage. After they had been a long time to spend what to do, one of them, named Mempricius, rose up, and having made silence, spoke to them thus. What can be the occasion of your suspense, fathers, in a matter which I think so much concerns your safety? The only thing you can request, with any prospect of a firm peace, and security to yourselves and your posterity, is liberty to depart. For if you make no better terms with Pandrasus for his life, than only to have some part of the country assigned you to live among the Greeks, you will never enjoy a lasting peace, while the brothers sons or grandsons of those whom you killed yesterday shall continue to be your neighbours. So long as the memory of their father's deaths shall remain, they will be your mortal enemies, and upon the least trifling provocation will endeavour to revenge themselves nor will you be sufficiently numerous to withstand so great a multitude of people. And if you shall happen to fall out among yourselves, their number will daily increase, yours diminish. I propose, therefore, that you request of him his eldest daughter, Ignoge, for a wife for our general, and with her 
gold, silver, corn, and whatever else shall be necessary for our voyage. If we obtain this, we may, with his leave, remove to some other country. Chapter 11 Pandrasus gives his daughter Ignoge in marriage to Brutus, who, after his departure from Greece, falls upon a desert island, where he is told by the oracle of Diana what place he is to inhabit. When he had ended this speech, in words to this effect, the whole assembly acquiesced to his advice, and moved that Pandrasus might be brought in among them, and condemned to a most cruel death, unless he should grant this request. He was immediately brought in, and being placed in a chair above the rest, and informed of the tortures prepared for him, unless he would do what was commanded him, he made them this answer. Since my ill fate has delivered me and my brother Antigonus into your hands, I can do no other than grant your request, lest a refusal may cost us our lives, which are now entirely in your power. In my opinion, life is preferable to all other considerations. Therefore, wonder not that I am willing to redeem it at so great a price. But though it is against my inclination that I obey your commands, yet it seems matter of comfort to me that I am to give my daughter to so noble a youth, whose descent from the illustrious race of Priamus and Anchises is clear, both from that greatness of mind which appears in him, and the certain accounts we have had of it. For who less than he could have released from their chains the banished Trojans, when reduced under slavery to so many great princes? Who else could have encouraged them to make head against the Greeks? Or, with so small a body of men, vanquished so numerous and powerful an army, and taken their king prisoner in the engagement? And therefore, since this noble youth has gained so much glory by the opposition which he has made to me, I give him my daughter Ignoge, and also gold, silver, ships, corn, wine and oil, and whatever you will find necessary for your voyage. If you shall alter your resolution, and think it fit to continue among the Greeks, I will grant you the third part of my kingdom for your habitation. If not, I will faithfully perform my promise, and for your greater security will stay as a hostage among you till I have made it good. Accordingly, he held a council, and directed messengers to all the shores of Greece, to get ships together. Which done, he delivered them to the Trojans, to the number of three hundred and twenty-four, laden with all kinds of provision, and married his daughter to Brutus. He made also a present of gold and silver to each man according to his quality. When everything was performed, the king was set at liberty, and the Trojans, now released from his power, set sail with a fair wind. But Ignoge, standing upon the stern of the ship, swooned away several times in Brutus's arms, and with many tears and sighs lamented the leaving of her parents and country, nor ever turned her eyes from the shore while it was in sight. Brutus, meanwhile, endeavoured to assuage her grief by kind words and embraces intermixed with kisses, and ceased not from these blandishments till she grew weary of crying and fell asleep. During these and other accidents, the winds continued fair for two days and a night together, when at last they arrived at a certain island 
called Laogosia, which had been formerly wasted by the incursions of pirates and was then uninhabited. Brutus, not knowing this, sent three hundred armed men ashore to see who inhabited it. But finding nobody, killed several kinds of wild beasts which they met with in the groves and woods, and came to a desolate city in which they found a temple of Diana, and in it a statue of that goddess which gave answers to those that came to consult her. At last, loading themselves with the prey which they had taken in hunting, they returned to their ships, and give their companions an account of this country and city. Then they advised their leader to go to the city, and after offering sacrifices, to inquire of the deity of the place what country was allotted them for their place of settlement. To this proposal all assented, so that Brutus, attended with Gerion the Augur, and twelve of the oldest men, set forward to the temple, with all things necessary for the sacrifice. Being arrived at the place, and presenting themselves before the shrine with garlands about their temples, as the ancient rites required, they made three fires to the three deities Jupiter, Mercury, and Diana, and offered sacrifices to each of them. Brutus himself, holding before the altar of the goddess a consecrated vessel filled with wine, and the blood of a white heart, with his face looking up to the image, broke silence in these words. Goddess of woods, tremendous in the chase, to mountain boars and all the savage race, wide o'er the ethereal walks extend thy sway, and o'er the infernal mansions void of day. Look upon us on earth, unfold our fate, and say what region is our destined seat. Where shall we next thy lasting temples raise, and choirs of virgins celebrate thy praise? These words he repeated nine times, after which he took four turns around the altar, poured the wine into the fire, and then laid himself down upon the heart's skin, which he had spread before the altar, where he fell asleep. About the third hour of the night, the usual time for deep sleep, the goddess seemed to present herself before him, and foretell his future success as follows. Brutus, there lies beyond the Gallic bounds, an island which the western sea surrounds. By giants once possessed, now few remain to bar thy entrance or obstruct thy reign. To reach that happy shore thy sails employ, their fate decrees to raise a second Troy, and found an empire in thy royal line, which time shall ne'er destroy, nor bounds confine. Awakened by the vision, he was for some time in doubt with himself whether what he had seen was a dream or a real appearance of the goddess herself, foretelling him to what land he should go. At last he called to his companions, and related to them in order the vision which he had in his sleep, at which they very much rejoiced, and were urgent to return to their ships, and while the wind favoured them to hasten their voyage towards the west in pursuit of what the goddess had promised. Without delay, therefore, they returned to their company, and set sail again, and after a course of thirty days came to Africa, being ignorant as yet whither to steer. From thence they came to the Philenian altars, 
and to a place called Salinai, and sailed between Ruskicada and the mountains of Azara, where they underwent great danger from pirates, whom, notwithstanding, they vanquished, and enriched themselves with their spoils. Chapter 12 Brutus enters Aquitaine with Corinius. From thence passing the river Malwa, they arrived at Mauritania, where, at last, for want of provisions, they were obliged to go ashore. And, dividing themselves into several bands, they laid waste the whole country. When they had well stored their ships, they steered to the Pillars of Hercules, where they saw some of those sea monsters called Sirens, which surrounded their ships and nearly overturned them. However, they made a shift to escape, and came to the Tyrrhenian Sea, upon the shores of which they found four several nations descended from the banished Trojans, that had accompanied Antenor in his flight. The name of their commander was Corinius, a modest man in matters of counsel, and of great courage and boldness, who in an encounter with any person, even of gigantic stature, would immediately overthrow him, as if he were a child. When they understood from whom he was descended, they joined company with him, and those under his government, who, from the name of their leader, were afterwards called the Cornish people, and indeed were more serviceable to Brutus than the rest of all his engagements. From thence they came to Aquitaine, and entering the mouth of the Loire, cast anchor. There they stayed seven days, and viewed the country. Gopherius Pictus, who was king of Aquitaine at that time, having an account brought him of the arrival of a foreign people with a great fleet upon his coasts, sent ambassadors to them to demand whether they brought with them peace or war. The ambassadors, on their way towards the fleet, met Corinius, who was come out with two hundred men to hunt in the woods. They demanded of him who gave him leave to enter the king's forests and kill his game, which by an ancient law nobody was allowed to do without leave from the prince. Corinius answered that as for that matter, there was no occasion for asking leave. Upon which, one of them, named Imbertus, rushing forward with a full-drawn bow, levelled a shot at him. Corinius avoids the arrow and immediately runs up to him, and with his bow in his hand breaks his head. The rest narrowly escaped, and carried the news of this disaster to Caphereus. The Pictavian general was struck with sorrow for it, and immediately raised a vast army to revenge the death of his ambassador. Brutus, on the other hand, upon hearing the rumour of his coming, sends away the women and children to the ships, which he took care to be well guarded, and commands them to stay there, while he, with the rest that are able to bear arms, should go to meet the army. At last, an assault being made, a bloody fight ensued, in which, after a great part of the day had been spent, Corinius was ashamed to see the Aquitanians so bravely stand their ground, and the Trojans maintaining the fight without victory. He therefore takes fresh courage, and drawing off his men to the right wing, breaks in upon the very thickest of his enemies, where he made such slaughter on every side, that at last he broke the line and put them all to flight. In this encounter he lost his sword, but by good fortune met with a battle-axe, with which he clave down to the waist every one that stood in his way. Brutus and everybody else, both friends and enemies, were amazed at his courage and his strength, for he brandished about his battle-axe among the flying troops, and terrified them not a little with these insulting words, With a fly, you cowards! Whither fly, ye base wretches? Stand your ground, 
that ye may encounter Corinius. What for shame? Do so many thousands of you fly one man? However, take this comfort for your flight, that you were pursued by one before whom the Tyrrhenian giants could not stand their ground, but fell down, slain in heaps together. Chapter 13 Gepharius Routed by Brutus At these words one of them, named Tabardus, who was a consul, returns with three hundred men to assault him. But Corinius, with his shield, wards off the blow, and lifting up his battle-axe, gave him such a stroke upon the top of his helmet, that at once he clave him down to the waist, and then rushing upon the rest, he made terrible slaughter by wheeling about his battle-axe among them, and, running to and fro, seemed more anxious to inflict blows upon the enemy than careful to avoid those they aimed at him. Some had their hands and arms, some their very shoulders, and some again their heads, and others their legs, cut off by him. All fought with him only, and he alone seemed to fight with all. Brutus, seeing him thus beset, out of regard to him, runs with a band of men to his assistance, at which the battle is again renewed with vigour and with loud shouts, and great numbers slain on both sides. But now the Trojans presently gain the victory, and put Gepharius with his Pictavians to flight. The king, after a narrow escape, went to several parts of Gaul, to procure succours among such princes as were related or known to him. At that time Gaul was subject to twelve princes, who with equal authority possessed the whole country. These receive him courteously, and promise with one consent to expel the foreigners from Aquitaine. Chapter 14 Brutus, after his victory over Gepharius, ravages Aquitaine with fire and sword. Brutus, in joy for the victory, enriches his men with the spoils of the slain, and then, dividing them into several bodies, marches into the country with a design to lay it waste, and load his fleet with the spoil. With this view, he sets the cities on fire, and seizes the riches that were in them, destroys the fields, and makes dreadful slaughter among the citizens and common people, being unwilling to leave so much as one alive of that wretched nation. While he was making this destruction all over Aquitaine, he came to a place where the city of Tours now stands, which he afterwards built, as Homer testifies. As soon as he looked out a place convenient for the purpose, he pitched his camp there, for a place of safe retreat when occasion should require. For he was afraid on account of Gepharius's approach with the kings and princes of Gaul, and a very great army, which was now come near the place, ready to give him battle. Having therefore finished his camp, he expected to engage with Gepharius in two days' time, placing the utmost confidence in the conduct and courage of the young men under his command. Chapter 15 Gopharius' Fight with Brutus Gopharius, being informed that the Trojans were in these parts, marched day and night, till he came within a close view of Brutus's camp and then with a stern look and disdainful smile, broke out into these expressions. O oh, wretched fate! Have these base exiles made a camp also in my kingdom? Arm, arm, soldiers, and march through their thickest ranks. We shall soon take these pitiful fellows like sheep, and disperse them throughout our kingdom for slaves. At these words, they prepared their arms, and advanced in twelve bodies towards the enemy. 
Brutus, on the other hand, with his forces drawn up in order, went forth bodily to meet them, and gave his men directions for their conduct, where they should assault, and where they should be upon the defensive. At the beginning of the attack, the Trojans had the advantage, and they made a rapid slaughter of the enemy, of whom there fell near two thousand, which so terrified the rest that they were on the point of running away. But as the victory generally falls to that side which has very much the superiority in numbers, so the Gauls, being three to one in number, though overpowered at first, yet at last joining in a great body together, broke in among the Trojans, and forced them to retire to their camp with much slaughter. The victory thus gained, they besieged them in their camp, with a desire not to suffer them to stir out, until they should either surrender themselves prisoners, or be cruelly starved to death with a long famine. In the meantime, Corinius, the night following, entered into consultation with Brutus, and proposed to go out that night by byways, and conceal himself in an adjacent wood till break of day. And while Brutus should sally forth upon the enemy in the morning twilight, he, with his company, would surprise them from behind, and put them to slaughter. Brutus was pleased with this stratagem of Corinius, who, according to his engagement, got out cunningly with three thousand men, and put himself under the covert of the woods. As soon as it was day, Brutus marshalled his men, and opened the camp to go out and fight. The Gauls meet him, and begin the engagement. Many thousands fall on both sides, neither party giving quarter. There was present a Trojan named Turanos, the nephew of Brutus, inferior to none but Corinius in courage and strength of body. He alone with his sword killed six hundred men, but at last was unfortunately slain himself by the number of Gauls that rushed upon him. From him the city of Tours derived its name, because he was buried there. While both armies were thus warmly engaged, Corinius came upon them unawares, and fell fiercely upon the rear of the enemy, which put new courage into his friends on the other side, and made them exert themselves with increased vigour. The Gauls were astonished at the very shout of Corinius's men, and thinking their number to be much greater than it really was, they hastily quitted the field. But the Trojans pursued them, and killed them in the pursuit, nor did they desist till they had gained a complete victory. Brutus, though, in joy for this great success, was yet afflicted to observe the number of his forces daily lessened while that of the enemy increased more and more. He was in suspense for some time, whether he had better continue the war or not. But at last he determined to return to his ships, while the greater part of his followers was yet safe, and hitherto victorious, and to go off in quest of the island which the goddess had told him of. So without further delay, with the consent of his company, he repaired to the fleet, and loading it with the riches and spoils he had taken, set sail with a fair wind towards the promised island, and arrived on the coast of Totnes. Chapter 16 Albion Divided Between Brutus and Corinius the island was then called Albion, and was inhabited by none but a few giants. Notwithstanding this, the pleasant situation of the places, the plenty of rivers abounding with fish, and the engaging prospect of its woods, made Brutus and his company very desirous to fix their habitation in it. They therefore passed through all the provinces, forced the giants to fly into the caves of the mountains, and divided the country among them according to the directions of their commander. 
After this they began to till the ground, and build houses, so that in a little time the country looked like a place that had been long inhabited. At last Brutus called the island after his own name, Britain, and his companions, Britons, for by these means he desired to perpetuate the memory of his name. From whence afterwards the language of the nation, which first bore the name of Trojan, or rough Greek, was called British. But Corinius, in imitation of his leader, called that part of the island which fell to his share Corinia, and his people Corinians after his name. And though he had his choice of the provinces before all the rest, yet he preferred this country, which is now called in Latin Cornubia, either from its being in shape of a horn, in Latin Cornu, or from the corruption of the said name. For it was a diversion to him to encounter the giants, which were in greater numbers there than in all the other provinces that fell to the share of his companions. Among the rest was one detestable monster named Gurmagot, in stature twelve cubits, and of such prodigious strength that at one shake he pulled up an oak as if it had been a hazel wand. On a certain day, when Brutus was holding a solemn festival to the gods in the port where they at first landed, this giant, with twenty more of his companions, came in upon the Britons, among whom he made a dreadful slaughter. But the Britons at last assembling together in a body, put them to the rout, and killed them every one but Gurmagot. Brutus had given orders to have him preserved alive, out of a desire to see a combat between him and Corinius, who took a great pleasure in such encounters. Corinius, overjoyed with this, prepared himself, and throwing aside his arms, challenged him to wrestle with him. At the beginning of the encounter, Corinius and the giant, standing front to front, held each other strongly in their arms, and panted aloud for breath. But Gurmagot presently grasping Corinius with all his strength, broke three of his ribs, two on his right side and one on his left, at which Corinius, highly enraged, roused up his whole strength, and snatching him upon his shoulders, ran with him, as fast as the weight would allow him, to the next shore and there, getting upon the top of a high rock, hurled down the savage monster into the sea, where, falling on the sides of craggy rocks, he was torn to pieces and coloured the waves with his blood. The place where he fell, taking its name from the giant's fall, is called Lam Gurmagot, that is, Gurmagot's Leap, to this day. Chapter 17. The Building of New Troy by Brutus, upon the River Thames. Brutus, having thus at last set eyes upon his kingdom, formed a design of building a city, and in order to it, travelled through the land to find out a convenient situation, and coming to the River Thames, he walked along the shore, and at last pitched upon a place very fit for his purpose. Here, therefore, he built a city, which he called New Troy, under which name it continued a long time after, till at last, by corruption of the original word, it came to be called Trinovantum. But afterwards, when Lud, the brother of Cassibellinum, who made war against Julius Caesar, obtained the government of the kingdom, he surrounded it with stately walls and towers of admirable workmanship, and ordered it to be called after his name, Caia Lud, that is, the city of Lud. But this very thing became afterwards the occasion of a great quarrel between him and his brother Nennius, who took offence at his abolishing the name of Troy in this country. Of this quarrel, Gildas the historian, has given a full account, for which reason I pass it over, for fear of debasing, by my account of it, 
what so great a writer has so eloquently related. Chapter 18 New Troy being built, and laws made for the government of it, it is given to the citizens that were to inhabit it. After Brutus had finished the building of the city, he made choice of the citizens that were to inhabit it, and prescribed them laws for their peaceable government. At this time, Eli the priest governed in Judea, and the Ark of the Covenant was taken by the Philistines. At this time also, the sons of Hector, after the expulsion of the posterity of Antinor, reigned in Troy, as in Italy did Silvius Aeneas, the son of Aeneas, the uncle of Brutus, and the third king of the Latins. End of Book One Part Two Book Two, Part One of History of the Kings of Britain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth. Translated by Aaron Thompson and J. A. Giles. Book Two Chapter One After the death of Brutus, his three sons succeed him in the kingdom. During these transactions, Brutus had by his wife Ignoge three famous sons, whose names were Locrin, Arbanact, and Camber, these, after their father's death, which happened in the twenty-fourth year after his arrival, buried him in the city which he had built, and then, having divided the kingdom of Britain among them, retired each to his government. Locrin, the eldest, possessed the middle part of the island, called afterwards from his name Lurgria. Camber had that part which lies beyond the River Severn, now called Wales, but which was for a long time called Cambria, and hence that people still call themselves in their British tongue Cambri. Albanact, the younger brother, possessed the country he called Albania, now Scotland. After they had a long time reigned in peace together, Humber, King of the Huns, arrived in Albania, and having killed Albanact in battle, forced his people to fly to Locrin for protection. Chapter 2 Locrin, having routed Humber, falls in love with Estraldis. Locrin, at hearing this news, joined his brother Camber, and went with the whole strength of the kingdom to meet the king of the Huns, near the river now called Humber, where he gave him battle and put him to the rout. Humber made towards the river in his flight, and was drowned in it, on account of which it has since borne his name. Locrin, after the victory, bestowed the plunder of the enemy upon his own men, reserving for himself the gold and the silver which he found in the ships, together with three virgins of admirable beauty, whereof one was the daughter of a king in Germany, whom with the other two Humber had forcibly brought away with him after he had ruined their country. Her name was Estraldis, and her beauty such as was hardly to be matched. No ivory, or new fallen snow, no lily could exceed the whiteness of her skin. Locrin, smitten with love, would have gladly married her, at which Corinius was extremely incensed, on account of the engagement which Locrin had entered into with him to marry his daughter. Chapter 3 
Quirinius resents the affront put upon his daughter. He went, therefore, to the king, and wielding a battle-axe in his right hand, vented his rage against him in these words, Do you thus reward me, Locrin, for the many wounds which I have suffered under your father's command in his wars with strange nations, that you must slight my daughter and debase yourself to marry a barbarian? while there is strength in this right hand that has been destructive to so many giants upon the Tyrrhenian coasts i will never put up with this affront and repeating this again and again with a loud voice he shook his battle-axe as if he was going to strike him till the friends of both interposed and after they had appeased Corinius, obliged locrin to perform his agreement Chapter 4. Locrin at last marries Gwendolina, the daughter of Corinius. Locrin therefore married Corinius's daughter, named Gwendolina, yet still retained his love for Estraldis, for whom he made apartments underground, in which he entertained her, and caused her to be honourably attended. For he was resolved, at least, to carry on a private amour with her, since he could not live with her openly for fear of Corinius. In this matter he concealed her, and made frequent visits to her for seven years together, without the privity of any but his most intimate domestics, and all under a pretense of performing some secret sacrifices to his gods, by which he imposed on the credulity of everybody. In the meantime, Estraldis became with child, and was delivered of a most beautiful daughter, whom she named Saber. Gwendolina was also with child, and she brought forth a son, who was named Madden, and put under the care of his grandfather Corinius to be educated. Chapter 5 Locrin is killed. Estraldis and Saber are thrown into a river. But in process of time, when Corinius was dead, Locrin divorced Gwendolina, and advanced Estraldis to be queen. Gwendolina, provoked beyond measure at this, retired into Cornwall, where she assembled together all the forces of that kingdom, and began to raise disturbances against Locrin. At last both armies joined battle near the river Stour, where Locrin was killed by the shot of an arrow. After his death, Gwendolina took upon her the government of the whole kingdom, retaining her father's furious spirit. For she commanded Estraldis and her daughter Saber to be thrown into the river, now called the Severn, and published an edict through all Britain that the river should bear the damsel's name hoping by this to perpetuate her memory, and by that the infamy of her husband. So that to this day the river is called in the British tongue Sabrun, which by the corruption of the same is, in another language, Sabrina. Chapter 6 Gwendolina delivers up the kingdom to Madden, her son after whom succeeds Menpricius. Gwendolina reigned fifteen years after the death of Locrin, who had reigned ten, and then advanced her son Madden, whom she saw now at maturity, to the throne, contenting herself with the country of Cornwall for the remainder of her life. At this time Samuel the prophet governed in Judea. Silvius Aeneas was yet living, and Homer was esteemed a famous orator and poet. Madden, now in possession of the crown, had by his wife two sons, Menpricius and Malim, and ruled the kingdom in peace and with care forty years. As soon as he was dead, the two brothers quarrelled for the kingdom, each being ambitious of the sovereignty of the whole island. Menpricius, impatient to attain his ends, enters into treaty with Malim, 
under colour of making a composition with him, and, having formed a conspiracy, murdered him in the assembly where their ambassadors were met. By these means he obtained the dominion of the whole island, over which he exercised such tyranny that he left scarcely a nobleman alive in it, and either by violence or treachery oppressed every one that he apprehended might be likely to succeed him, pursuing his hatred to his whole race. He also deserted his own wife, by whom he had a noble youth named Abraucus, and addicted himself to sodomy, preferring unnatural lust to the pleasures of the conjugal state. At last, in the twentieth year of his reign, while he was hunting, he retired from his company into a valley where he was surrounded by a great multitude of ravenous wolves and devoured by them in a horrible manner. Then did Saul reign in Judea and Eurystheus in Lacedaemonia. Chapter 7 Ebraucus, the successor of Menprichius, conquers the Gauls and builds the towns Caer Ebrauc, etc. Menprichius being dead, Ebraucus, his son, a man of great stature and wonderful strength, took upon him the government of Britain, which he held forty years. He was the first after Brutus who invaded Gaul with a fleet, and distressed its provinces by killing their men and laying waste their cities. And, having by these means enriched himself with an infinite quantity of gold and silver, he returned victorious. After this, he built a city on the other side of the Humber, which, from his own name, he called Cara Brauk, that is, the city of Abraucus, about the time that David reigned in Judea, and Silvius Latinus in Italy, and that Gad, Nathan, and Asaph prophesied in Israel. He also built the city of Aklad towards Albany, and the town of Mount Agnid, called at this time the Castle of Maidens, or the Mountain of Sorrow. Chapter 8 Erbraucus's twenty sons go to Germany, and his thirty daughters to Silvius Alba in Italy. This prince had twenty sons and thirty daughters by twenty wives, and with great valour governed the kingdom of Britain sixty years. The names of his sons were Brutus, surnamed Greenshield, Margadud, Sicilius, Regin, Morivid, Bladud, Lagon, Bodloan, Kincar, Spaden, Gaul, Darden, Eldad, Ivor, Gangu, Hector, Kerin, Rudd, Asarak, Buell. The names of his daughters were Gloini, Ignoni, Udas, Gwenlium, Gordid, Angharad, Gwendolo, Tangustal, Gorgon, Medlin, Methahel, Urar, Malior, Cambreda, Regan, Gale, Ekub, Nest, Choin, Stattard, Gladad, Ebron, Blagan, Abelac, Angais, Galais, the most celebrated beauty at that time in Britain or Gaul, Edra, Anaur, Stadile, Egron. All these daughters their father sent into Italy to Silvius Alba, who reigned after Silvius Latinus, where they were married among the Trojan nobility, the Latin and Sabine women refusing to associate with them. But the sons, under the conduct of their brother Asarachus, departed in a fleet to Germany, and having, with the assistance of Silvius Alba, 
subdued the people there, obtained that kingdom. Chapter 9 After Abraucus reigns Brutus, his son. After him, Leal. And after Leal, Hudibras. But Brutus, surnamed Greenshield, stayed with his father, whom he succeeded in the government, and reigned twelve years. After him reigned Leal, his son, a peaceable and just prince, who, enjoying a prosperous reign, built in the north of Britain a city called by his name, Carleal, at the same time that Solomon began to build the Temple of Jerusalem, and the Queen of Sheba came to hear his wisdom at which time also Silvius Epitus succeeded his father Alba in Italy. Leal reigned twenty-five years, but towards the latter end of his life grew more remiss in his government, so that his neglect of affairs speedily occasioned a civil dissension in the kingdom. After him reigned his son Hudibras, thirty-nine years, and composed the civil dissension among his people. He built Carlem or Canterbury, Car Gwen or Winchester, and the town of Mount Palador, now Shaftesbury. At this place an eagle spoke while the wall of the town was being built. And indeed I would have transmitted the speech to posterity had I thought it true as the rest of the history. At this time reigned Capis, the son of Epitus, and Haggai, Amos, Joel, and Azariah were prophets in Israel. End of Book Two, Part One Book Two, Part Two of History of the Kings of Britain this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth Translated by Aaron Thompson and J. A. Giles Chapter 10 Bladed succeeds Hudibras in the kingdom, and practices magical operations. Next succeeded Bladed, his son, and reigned twenty years. He built Carbardus, now Bath, and made hot baths in it for the benefit of the public, which he dedicated to the goddess Minerva, in whose temple he kept fires that never went out nor consumed to ashes, but as soon as they began to decay, were turned into balls of stone. About this time the prophet Elias prayed that it might not rain upon earth, and it did not rain for three years and six months. This prince was a very ingenious man, and taught necromancy in his kingdom. Nor did he leave off pursuing his magical operations, till he attempted to fly to the upper region of the air, with wings which he had prepared, and fell down upon the temple of Apollo in the city of Trinovantum, where he was dashed to pieces. Chapter 11 Lear, the son of Bladad, having no son, divides his kingdom among his daughters. After this unhappy fate of Bladad, Lear, his son, was advanced to the throne, and nobly governed his country sixty years. He built upon the river Saw a city, called in the British tongue Caer Lear, in the Saxon Lear Sester. He was without male issue, but had three daughters, whose names were Gonorilla, Ragau, and Cordiella, of whom he was dotingly fond but especially of his youngest, Cordiella. 
when he began to grow old, he had thoughts of dividing his kingdom among them, and of bestowing them on such husbands as were fit to be advanced to the government with them. But to make trial who was worthy to have the best part of his kingdom, he went to each of them to ask which of them loved him most. The question being proposed, Gonorilla, the eldest, made answer that she called heaven to witness she loved him more than her own soul. The father replied, Since you have preferred my declining age before your own life, I will marry you, my dearest daughter, to whomever you shall make choice of, and give you the third part of my kingdom. Then Regau, the second daughter, willing, after the example of her sister, to prevail upon her father's good nature, answered with an oath that she could not otherwise express her thoughts, but that she loved him above all creatures. The credulous father, upon this, made her the same promise that he did to her eldest sister, that is, the choice of a husband with the third part of his kingdom. But Cordiella, the youngest, understanding how easily he was satisfied with the flattering expressions of her sisters, was desirous to make trial of his affection after a different manner. My father, said she, is there any daughter that can love her father more than duty requires? In my opinion, whoever pretends to it must disguise her real sentiments under the veil of flattery. I have always loved you as a father, nor do I yet depart from my purposed duty and if you insist to have something more extorted from me, hear now the greatness of my affection, which I always bear you, and take this for a short answer to all your questions. Look how much you have, so much is your value, and so much do I love you. The father, supposing that she spoke this out of the abundance of her heart, was highly provoked, and immediately replied, since you have so far despised my old age, as not to think me worthy the love that your sisters express for me, you shall have from me the like regard, and shall be excluded from any share with your sisters in my kingdom. Notwithstanding, I do not say, but that since you are my daughter, I will marry you to some foreigner, if fortune offers you any such husband, but will never, I do assure you, make it my business to procure as honourable a match for you as for your sisters. Because, though I have hitherto loved you more than them, you have in requital thought me less worthy of your affection than they. And, without further delay, after consultation with his nobility, he bestowed his two other daughters upon the dukes of Cornwall and Albania, with half the island at present, but after his death the inheritance of the whole monarchy of Britain. It happened after this that Agonippus, king of the Franks, having heard the fame of Cordelia's beauty, forthwith sent his ambassadors to the king to demand her in marriage. The father, retaining yet his anger towards her, made answer that he was very willing to bestow his daughter, but without either money or territories, because he had already given away his kingdom with all his treasure to his eldest daughters, Gonorilla and Regau. When this was told Agonippus, he, being very much in love with the lady, sent again to King Lear to tell him that he had money and territories enough, as he possessed the third part of Gaul, and desired no more than his daughter only, that he might have heirs by her. At last the match was concluded and Cordiella was sent to Gaul, and married to Agonippus. Chapter 12 Lear, finding the ingratitude of his two eldest daughters, betakes himself to his youngest, Cordiella, in Gaul. A long time after this, when Lear came to be infirm through old age, the two dukes, on whom he had bestowed Britain with his two daughters, fostered an insurrection against him, and deprived him of his kingdom, and of all regal authority which he had hitherto exercised with great power and glory. 
At length, by mutual agreement, Maglaunus, king of Albania, one of his sons-in-law, was to allow him a maintenance of his own house, together with sixty soldiers who were to be kept for state. After two years' stay with his son-in-law, his daughter Gonorilla grudged the number of his men, who began to upbraid the ministers of the court with their scanty allowance, and having spoken to her husband about it, gave orders that the number of her father's followers should be reduced to thirty, and the rest discharged. The father, resenting this treatment, left Maglaunus and went to Henwinus, Duke of Cornwall, to whom he had married his daughter Regau. Here he met with an honourable reception, but before the year was at an end, a quarrel happened between the two families, which raised Regau's indignation, so that she commanded her father to discharge all his attendants but five, and to be contented with their service. This second affliction was insupportable to him, and made him return again to his former daughter, with hopes that the misery of his condition might move her in some sentiments of filial pity, and that he, with his family, might find a subsistence with her. But she, not forgetting her resentment, swore by the gods he should not stay with her, unless he would dismiss his retinue, and be content with the attendance of one man, and with bitter reproaches told him how ill his desire of vainglorious pomp suited his age and poverty. When he found that she was by no means to be prevailed upon, he was at last forced to comply, and dismissing the rest, to take up with one man only. But by this time he began to reflect more sensibly with himself upon the grandeur from which he had fallen, and the miserable state to which he was now reduced, and to enter upon thoughts of going beyond the sea to his youngest daughter. Yet he doubted whether he should be able to move her commiseration, because, as was related above, he had treated her so unworthily. However, disdaining to bear any longer such base usage, he took ship for Gaul. In his passage, he observed that he had only the third place given him among the princes that were with him in the ship. At which, with deep sighs and tears, he burst forth into the following complaint. O irreversible decrees of the fates, that never swerve from your stated course! Why did you ever advance me to an unstable felicity, since the punishment of lost happiness is greater than the sense of present misery? The remembrance of the time when vast numbers of men obsequiously attended me in the taking of cities and wasting the enemy's countries more deeply pierces my heart than the view of my present calamity which has exposed me to the derision of those who were formerly prostrate at my feet. Oh, the enmity of fortune! Shall I ever again see the day? when I may be able to reward those according to their deserts who have forsaken me in my distress. How true was thy answer, Cordiella, when I asked thee concerning thy love to me! As much as you have, so much is your value, and so much do I love you. While I had anything to give, they valued me, being friends not to me but to my gifts. They loved me then, but they loved my gifts much more. When my gifts ceased, my friends vanished. But with what face shall I presume to see you, my dearest daughter, since in my anger I married you upon worse terms than your sisters, who, after all the mighty favours they have received from me, suffer me to be in banishment and poverty? As he was lamenting his condition in these and the like expressions, he arrived at Caritia, where his daughter was, and waited before the city while he sent a messenger to inform her of the misery that he was fallen into, and to desire her relief for a father who suffered both hunger and nakedness. Cordiella was startled at the news, and wept bitterly, and with tears asked how many men her father had with him. The messenger answered, 
he had none but one man, who had been his armour-bearer, and was staying with him without the town. Then she took what money she thought might be sufficient, and gave it to the messenger, with orders to carry her father to another city, and there give out that he was sick, and to provide for him bathing, clothes, and all other nourishment. She likewise gave orders that he should take into his service forty men, well clothed and accoutred, and that when all things were thus prepared, he should notify his arrival to King Agonippus and his daughter. The messenger quickly returning, carried Leah to another city, and there kept him concealed, till he had done everything that Cordiella had commanded. Chapter 13 He is very honourably received by Cordiella and the King of Gaul. As soon as he was provided with his royal apparel, ornaments and retinue, he sent word to Agonippus and his daughter that he was driven out of his kingdom of Britain by his sons-in-law and was come to them to procure their assistance for recovering his dominions. Upon which they, attended with their chief ministers of state and the nobility of the kingdom, went out to meet him and received him honourably and gave into his management the whole power of Gaul, since such time as he should be restored to his former dignity. Chapter 14 Leah, being restored to the kingdom by the help of his son-in-law and Cordiella, dies. In the meantime, Agonippus sent officers over all Gaul to raise an army, to restore his father-in-law to his kingdom of Britain. Which done, Leah returned to Britain with his son and daughter, and the forces which they had raised, where he fought with his sons-in-law and routed them. Having thus reduced the whole kingdom to his power, he died in the third year after. Agonippus also died, and Cordiella, obtaining the government of the kingdom, buried her father in a certain vault, which she ordered to be made for him under the river Saw, in Leicester and which had been built originally under the ground to the honour of the god Janus. And here all the workmen of the city, upon the anniversary solemnity of that festival, used to begin their yearly labours. Chapter 15 Cordiella, being imprisoned, kills herself. Margan, aspiring to the whole kingdom, is killed by Cunidagius. After a peaceable procession of the government for five years, Cordiella began to meet with disturbances from the sons of her sisters, being both young men of great spirit, whereof one named Margan was born to Maglaunus, and the other named Cunidagius to Henuinus. These, after the death of their fathers, succeeding them in their dukedoms, were incensed to see Britain subject to a woman and raised forces in order to raise a rebellion against the Queen. Nor would they desist from hostilities till, after a general waste of their countries and several battles fought, they at last took her and put her in prison, where for grief at the loss of her kingdom she killed herself. After this they divided the island between them, of which the part that reaches from the north side of the Humber to Caithness fell to Margan. The other part from the same river westward was Cunidagius's share. At the end of two years, some restless spirits that took pleasure in the troubles of the nation had access to Margan and inspired him with vain conceits, by representing to him how mean and disgraceful it was for him not to govern the whole island which was due his right by birth. Stirred up with these and the like suggestions, he marched with an army through Cunidagius's country, and began to burn all before him. The war thus breaking out, he was met by Cunidagius with all his forces, who attacked Margan, killing no small number of his men, and putting him to flight, pursued him from one province to another, till at last he killed him in a town in Cambria, which, since his death, has been by the country people called Margan to this day. 
after the victory cunodagius gained the monarchy of the whole island which he governed gloriously for three-and-thirty years at this time flourished the prophets isaiah and hosea and rome was built upon the eleventh of the calendar of may by the two brothers romulus and remus chapter sixteen the successors of cunodagius in the kingdom ferrex is killed by his brother porrex in a dispute for the government at last cunodagius dying was succeeded by his son rivallo a fortunate youth who diligently applied himself to the affairs of the government in his time it rained blood three days together and there fell vast swarms of flies followed by a great mortality among the people after him succeeded gurgustius his son after him sicilius after him jago the nephew of gurgustius after him kinmarcus the son of sicilius after him gorbogudo who had two sons ferrex and porrex when their father grew old they began to quarrel about the succession but porrex who was the most ambitious of the two forms a design of killing his brother by treachery which the other discovering escaped and passed over into gaul there he procured aid from Suard, king of the franks with which he returned and made war upon his brother coming to an engagement ferrex was killed and all his forces cut to pieces when their mother whose name was wyden came to be informed of her son's death she fell into a great rage and conceived a mortal hatred against the survivor for she had a greater affection for the deceased than for him so that nothing else would appease her indignation for his death than her revenging it upon her surviving son she took therefore her opportunity while he was asleep fell upon him and with the assistance of her women tore him to pieces from that time a long civil war oppressed the people and the island became divided under the power of five kings who mutually harassed each other chapter seventeen dunwallo molmutius gains the sceptre of britain from whom came the molmutine laws at length arose a youth of great spirit named dunwallo molmutius who was the son of cloten king of cornwall and excelled all the kings of britain in valour and gracefulness of person when his father was dead he was no sooner possessed of the government of that country that he made war against imna king of lurgris and killed him in battle hereupon rudaucus king of cambria and staterius king of albania had a meeting wherein they formed an alliance together and marched thence with their armies into dunwallow's country to destroy all before them dunwallow met them with thirty thousand men and gave them battle and when a great part of the day was spent in the fight and the victory yet dubious he drew off six hundred of his bravest men and commanded them to put on the armour of the enemies that were slain as he himself also did throwing aside his own thus accoutred he marched up with speed to the enemy's ranks as if he were of their party and approaching the very place where rudaucus and staterius were commanded his men to fall upon them in this assault the two kings were killed and many others with them but dunwallo molmutius fearing lest in this disguise his own men might fall upon him returned with his companions to put off the enemy's armour and take his own again and then encouraged them to renew the assault which they did with great vigour and in a short time got the victory by dispersing and putting flight to the enemy from hence he marched into the enemy's countries destroyed their towns and cities and reduced the people under his obedience when he had made an entire reduction of the whole island he prepared himself a crown of gold and restored the kingdom to its ancient state this prince established what britons call the Malmatine laws which are famous among the english to this day in these among other things of which st gildas wrote a long time after 
he enacted that the temples of the gods, as also cities, should have the privilege of giving sanctuary and protection to any fugitive or criminal that should flee to them from his enemy. He likewise enacted that the ways leading to those temples and cities, as also husbandmen's ploughs, should be allowed the same privilege. So that in his day the murders and cruelties committed by robbers were prevented, and everybody passed safe without any violence offered him. At last, after a reign of forty years spent in these and other acts of government, he died, and was buried in the city of Trinovantum, near the Temple of Concord, which he himself built, when he first established his laws. End of Book Two, Part Two Book Three, Part One of History of the Kings of Britain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth. Translated by Aaron Thompson and J. A. Giles. Book Three, Chapter One. Brennius quarrels with Bellinus, his brother, and in order to make war against him, marries the daughter of the king of the Norwegians. After this, a violent quarrel happened between his two sons, Bellinus and Brennius, who were both ambitious of succeeding to the kingdom. The dispute was which of them should have the honour of wearing the crown. After a great many sharp conflicts that passed between them, the friends of both interposed, and brought them to agree on the division of the kingdom on these terms, that Bellinus should enjoy the crown of the island, with the dominions of Lurgria, Cambria, and Cornwall, because, according to the Trojan constitution, the right of inheritance would come to him as the elder and Brennius, as being the younger, should be subject to his brother, and have for his share Northumberland, which extended from the river Humber to Caithness. The covenant therefore being confirmed upon these conditions, they ruled the country for five years in peace and justice. But such a state of prosperity could not long stand against the endeavours of faction for some lying incendiaries gained access to Brennius, and addressed him in this manner. "'What sluggish spirit has possessed you, that you can bear subjection to Bellinus, to whom by parentage and blood you are equal? Besides your experience in military affairs, which you have gained in several engagements, when you so often repulsed Culfus, general of the marini in his invasions of our country and drove him out of your kingdom be no longer bound by a treaty which is a reproach to you but marry the daughter of elsingius king of the norwegians that with his assistance you may recover your lost dignity the young man inflamed with these and the like specious suggestions, hearkened to them, and went to Norway, where he married the king's daughter, as his flatterers had advised him. Chapter 2 Brennius's sea-fight with Gwiltschthlak, king of the Dacians. Gwiltschthlak and Brennius's wife are driven ashore and taken by Bellinus. In the meantime, his brother, informed of this, was violently incensed that without his leave he had presumed to act thus against him. Whereupon he marched into Northumberland, and possessed himself of that country, and the cities in it, which he garrisoned with his own men. Brennius, upon notice given him of what his brother had done, prepared a fleet to return to Britain with a great army of Norwegians. 
but while he was under sail with a fair wind, he was overtaken by Gwiltslack, king of the Dacians, who had pursued him. This prince had been deeply in love with the young lady that Brennius had married, and out of mere grief and vexation for the loss of her, had prepared a fleet to pursue Brennius with all expedition. In the sea fight that happened on this occasion, he had the fortune to take the very ship in which the lady was, and brought her in among his companions. But, during the engagement, contrary winds arose on a sudden, which brought on a storm, and dispersed the ships upon different shores, so that the king of the Dacians, being driven up and down, after a course of five days, arrived with the lady at Northumberland, under dreadful apprehensions, as not knowing upon what country this unforeseen casualty had thrown him. When this came to be known to the country people, they took them and carried them to Bellinus, who was upon the sea-coast, expecting the arrival of his brother. There were, with Gwiltlack's ship, three others, one of which had belonged to Brennus's fleet. As soon as they had declared to the king who they were, he was overjoyed at this happy accident, while he was endeavouring to revenge himself on his brother. Chapter 3 Belinus in a battle routs Brennius, who thereupon flees to Gaul. A few days after appeared Brennius, with his fleet again got together, and arrived in Albania, and having received information of the capture of his wife and others, and that his brother had seized the kingdom of Northumberland in his absence, he sent his ambassadors to him to demand the restitution of his wife and kingdom and, if he refused them, to declare that he would destroy the whole island from sea to sea, and kill his brother whenever he could come to an engagement with him. On the other hand, Belinus absolutely refused to comply with his demands, and assembling together the whole power of the island, went into Albania to give him battle. Brennius, upon advice that he had suffered a repulse, and that his brother was upon his march against him, advanced to meet him in a wood called Calatirium, in order to attack him. When they were arrived on the field of battle, each of them divided his men into several bodies, and approaching one another, began the fight. A great part of the day was spent in it, because on both sides the bravest men were engaged, and much blood was shed by reason of the fury with which they encountered each other. So great was the slaughter that the wounded fell in heaps, like standing corn cut down by reapers. At last the Britons prevailing, the Norwegians fled with their shattered troops to their ships, but were pursued by Bellinus and killed without mercy. Fifteen thousand men fell in the battle, nor were there a thousand of the rest that escaped unhurt. Brennius, with much difficulty securing one ship, went as fortune drove him to the coasts of Gaul, but the rest that attended him were forced to skulk up and down wherever their misfortunes led them. Chapter 4 The King of Dacia, with Brennius's wife, is released out of prison. Belinus, after this victory, called a council of his nobility to advise with them what he should do with the king of the Dacians, who had sent a message to him out of prison that he would submit himself and the kingdom of Dacia to him, and also pay a yearly tribute if he might have leave to depart with his mistress. He offered likewise to confirm this covenant with an oath and the giving of hostages. When this proposal was laid before the nobility, they unanimously gave their assent that Belinus should grant Gwiltslack his petition upon the terms offered. Accordingly he did grant it, and Gwiltslack was released from prison and returned with his mistress into Dacia. Chapter 5 Belinus revives and confirms the Malmatine laws 
especially about the highways. Bellinus now finding no body in the kingdom of Britain able to make head against him, and being possessed of the sovereignty of the whole island from sea to sea, confirmed the laws his father had made, and gave command for a settled execution of justice through his kingdom. But above all things, he ordered that the cities, and the roads leading to them, should enjoy the same privilege of peace that Dunwallow had established. But there arose a controversy about the roads, because the limits determining them were unknown. The king, therefore, willing to clear the law of all ambiguities, summoned all the workmen of the island together, and commanded them to pave a causeway of stone and mortar, which should run the whole length of the island, from the Sea of Cornwall to the shores of Caithness, and lead directly to the cities that lay along that extent. He commanded another to be made over the breadth of the kingdom, leading from Menevia, that was situated upon the Domitian Sea, to Hamo's port, and to pass through the interjacent cities. Other two he also made obliquely through the island for a passage to the rest of the cities. He then confirmed to them all honours and privileges, and prescribed a law for the punishment of any injury committed upon them. But if any one is curious to know all that he decreed concerning them, let him read the Malmatine laws, which Gildas the historian translated from British into Latin, and King Alfred into English. Chapter 6 Brennius, being made Duke of the Allobroge, returned to Britain to fight with his brother. While Bellinus was thus reigning in peace and tranquillity, his brother Brennius, who, as we have said before, was driven upon the coasts of Gaul, suffered great torments of mind. For it was a great affliction to him to be banished from his country, and to have no power of returning to retrieve his loss. Being ignorant what course to take, he went among the princes of Gaul, accompanied only with twelve men. And when he had related his misfortune to every one of them, but could procure assistance from none, he went at last to Serginus, Duke of the Allobroge, from whom he had an honourable reception. During his stay here, he contracted such an intimacy with the Duke, that he became the greatest favourite in the court. For in all affairs, both of peace and war, he showed a great capacity, so that this prince loved him with a paternal affection. He was, besides, of a graceful aspect, tall and slender in stature, and expert in hunting and fowling, as became his princely birth. So great was the friendship between them, that the duke resolved to give him his only daughter in marriage, and in case he himself should have no male issue, he appointed him and his daughter to succeed him in his kingdom of the Allobroge after his death. But if he should have a son, then he promised his assistance to advance him to the kingdom of Britain. Neither was this the desire of the duke only, but of all the nobility of his court, with whom he had very much ingratiated himself. So then, without further delay, the marriage was solemnised, and the princes of the country paid their homage to him as the successor to the throne. Scarcely was the year at an end before the duke died, and then Brennius took his opportunity of engaging those princes of the country firmly in his interest, whom before he had obliged with his friendship. And he did this by bestowing generously upon them the duke's treasure, which had been hoarded up from the time of his ancestors. But that which the Allobroge most esteemed him for was his sumptuous entertainments, and keeping an open house for all. Chapter 7 Bellinus and Brennius, being made friends by the mediation of their mother, proposed to subdue Gaul. When he had thus gained universal affection, he began to consult with himself how he might take revenge upon his brother Bellinus. 
and when he had signified his intentions concerning it to his subjects, they unanimously concurred with him, and expressed their readiness to attend him to whatever kingdom he pleased to conduct them. He therefore soon raised a vast army, and having entered into a treaty with the Gauls for a free passage through their country into Britain, fitted out a fleet upon the coast of Neustria, in which he set sail, and with a fair wind arrived at the island. Upon hearing the rumour of his coming, his brother Belinus, accompanied with the whole strength of the kingdom, marched out to engage him. But when the two armies were drawn out in order of battle, and just ready to begin the attack, Conwenna, their mother, who was yet living, ran in great haste through the ranks, impatient to see her son, whom she had not seen for a long time. As soon, therefore, as she had with trembling steps reached the place where he stood, she threw her arms around his neck, and in transports kissed him. Then uncovering her bosom, she addressed herself to him, in words interrupted with sighs, to this effect. My son, remember these breasts which gave you suck, and the womb wherein the Creator of all things formed you, and from whence he brought you forth into the world, while I endured the greatest anguish. By the pains, then, which I suffered for you, I entreat you to hear my request. Pardon your brother, and moderate your anger. You ought not to revenge yourself upon him who has done you no injury. As for what you complain of, that you were banished your country by him, if you duly consider the result, in strictness can it be called injustice? He did not banish you to make your condition worse, but forced you to quit a manner that you might attain a higher dignity. At first you enjoyed only a part of a kingdom, and that in subjection to your brother. As soon as you lost that, you became his equal by gaining the kingdom of the Allobroge. What has he then done but raised you from a vassal to be a king? Consider further that the difference betwixt you began not through him, but through yourself, who with the assistance of the king of Norway raised an insurrection against him. Moved by these representations of his mother, he obeyed her with a composed mind, and, putting off his helmet of his own accord, went straight with her to his brother. Belinus, seeing him approach with a peaceable countenance, threw down his arms and ran to embrace him, so that now, without more ado, they again became friends, and disarming their forces, marched with them peaceably together to Trinovantum. And here, after consultation what enterprise to undertake, they prepared to conduct their confederate army into the provinces of Gaul, and to reduce that entire country to their subjection. Chapter 8 Belinus and Brennius, after the conquest of Gaul, march with their army to Rome. They accordingly passed over into Gaul the year after, and began to lay waste that country. The news of which, spreading through these several nations, all the petty kings of the Franks entered into a confederacy, and went out to fight against them. But the victory falling to Belinus and Brennius, the Franks fled with their broken forces, and the Britons and the Allobroge, elevated with their success, ceased not to pursue them till they had taken their kings and reduced them to their power. Then, fortifying the cities which they had taken, in less than a year they brought the whole kingdom into subjection. At last, after a reduction of all the provinces, they marched with their whole army towards Rome, and destroyed the cities and villages as they passed through Italy. Chapter 9 The Romans make a covenant with Brennius, but afterwards break it, for which reason Rome is besieged and taken by Brennius. 
In those days the two consuls of Rome were Gabius and Porsena, to whose care the government of the country was committed. When they saw that no nation was able to withstand the power of Bellinus and Brennius, they came, with the consent of the Senate, to them to desire peace and amity. They likewise offered large presents of gold and silver, and to pay a yearly tribute, on condition that they might be suffered to enjoy their own in peace. The two kings, therefore, taking hostages of them, yielded to their petition, and drew back their forces into Germany. While they were employing their arms in harassing that people, the Romans repented of their agreement, and again, taking courage, went to assist the Germans. This step highly enraged the kings against them, who concerted measures how to carry on a war with both nations, for the greatness of the Italian army was a terror to them. The result of their counsel was that Bellinus with the Britons stayed in Germany to engage with the enemy there, while Brennius and his army marched to Rome to revenge on the Romans their breach of treaty. As soon as the Italians perceived their design, they quitted the Germans and hastened to get before Brennius in his march to Rome. Bellinus had intelligence of it, and speedily marched with his army the same night, and possessing himself of a valley through which the enemy was to pass, they hid there in expectation of their coming. The next day the Italians came in full march to the place, but when they saw the valley glittering with the enemy's armour, they were struck with confusion, thinking Brennius and the Galli Sasson were there. At this favourable opportunity, Bellinus, on a sudden, rushed forth and fell furiously upon them. The Romans, on the other hand, thus taken by surprise, fled the field, since they neither were armed nor marched in any order. But Bellinus gave them no quarter, and was only prevented by night coming on from making a total destruction of them. With this victory, he went straight to Brennius, who had now besieged Rome three days. Then, joining their armies, they assaulted the city on every side, and endeavoured to level the walls, and, to strike a greater terror into the besieged, erected gibbets before the gates of the city, and threatened to hang up the hostages whom they had given, unless they would surrender. But the Romans, nothing moved by the sufferings of their sons and relations, continued inflexible and resolute to defend themselves. They therefore sometimes broke the force of the enemy's engines, by other engines of their own, sometimes repulsed them from the walls with showers of darts. This so incensed the two brothers, that they commanded four and twenty of their noblest hostages to be hanged in the sight of their parents. The Romans, however, were only more hardened at the spectacle, and having received a message from Gabius and Porsena, their councils, that they would come the next day to their assistance, they resolved to march out of the city and give the enemy battle. Accordingly, just as they were ranging their troops in order, the consuls appeared with their reassembled forces, marching up to the attack and advancing in a close body fell on the Britons and the Allobroge by surprise, and being joined by the citizens that sallied forth, killed no small number. The brothers, in great grief to see such destruction made of their fellow soldiers, began to rally their men, and breaking in upon the enemy several times, forced them to retire. In the end, after the loss of many thousands of brave men on both sides, the brothers gained the day, and took the city, not, however, till Gabius was killed and Porsena taken prisoner. This done, they divided among their men all the hidden treasure of the city. End of Book 3 Part 1
Translated by Aaron Thompson and J. A. Giles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten. Brennius oppresses Italy in a most tyrannical manner. Bellinus returns to Britain. After this complete victory, Brennius stayed in Italy, where he exercised unheard of tyranny over the people. But the rest of his actions and his death, seeing that they are given in the Roman histories, I shall here pass over, to avoid prolixity and meddling with what others have treated of, which is foreign to my design. But Bellinus returned to Britain, which he governed during the remainder of his life in peace. He repaired the cities that were falling to ruin, and built many new ones. Among the rest he built one upon the river Usk, near the Sea of the Severn, which was, for a long time, called Kairosk, and was the metropolis of Demetis. But after the invasion of the Romans it lost its first name, and was called the City of Legions, from the Roman legions which used to take up their winter quarters in it. He also made a gate of wonderful structure in Trinovantum, upon the bank of the Thames, which the citizens call after his name Belling's Gate, to this day. Over it he built a prodigiously large tower, and under it a haven or quay for ships. He was a strict observer of justice, and re-established his father's laws everywhere throughout the kingdom. In his days there was so great an abundance of riches among the people, that no age before or after is said to have shown the like. At last, when he had finished his days, his body was burnt, and the ashes put up in a golden urn, which they place at Trinovantum, with wonderful art on the top of the tower above mentioned. Chapter 11 Gurgwint Brabtruck, succeeding his father Bellinus, reduces Dacia, which was trying to shake off his yoke. He was succeeded by Gurgwint Babtruck, his son, a sober, prudent prince, who followed the example of his father in all his actions, and was a lover of peace and justice. When some neighbouring provinces rebelled against him, inheriting with them the bravery of his father, he repressed their insolence in several fierce battles, and reduced them to a perfect subjection. Among many other things it happened that the king of the Dacians, who paid tribute in his father's time, refused not only tribute, but all manner of homage to him. This he seriously resented, and passed over in a fleet to Dacia, where he harassed the people with a most cruel war, slew their king, and reduced the country to its former dependence. Chapter 12 Ireland is given to be inhabited by the Barclenses, who had been banished out of Spain. At that time, as he was returning home from his conquest through the Orkney Islands, he found thirty ships full of men and women and upon inquiring of them the occasion of their coming thither, their leader, named Partholoim, approached him in a respectful and submissive manner, and desired pardon and peace, telling him that he had been driven out of Spain, and was sailing round these seas in quest of a habitation. He also desired some small part of Britain to dwell in, that they may put an end to their tedious wanderings for it was now a year and a half since he had been driven from his country, all of which time his company had been out at sea. When Gurgwint Brabtruck understood that they came from Spain, and were called Barclenses, he granted them pardon, and sent men with them to Ireland, which was then wholly uninhabited, and assigned it to them. There they grew up, and increased in number, and have possessed that island to this very day. Gurgwint Brabtruck, after this, 
ended his days in peace, and was buried in the city of legions, which, after his father's death, he ornamented with buildings and fortified with walls. Chapter 13 Gwethelin, reigning after Gurgwint Brabtruck, the Martian law is instituted by Marcia, a noblewoman. After him, Gwethelin wore the crown, which he enjoyed all his life, treating his subjects with mildness and affection. He had for his wife a noble lady named Marcia, accompanied in all kinds of learning. Among many other admirable productions of her wit, she was also the author of what the Britons call the Martian Law. This, also among other things, King Alfred translated, and called it in the Saxon tongue, Pa Mapchekli Lager. Upon the death of Gwethelin, the government of the kingdom remained in the hands of this queen and her son Sicilius, who was then but seven years old, and therefore unfit to take the government upon himself alone. Chapter 16 Gwethelin's Successors in the Kingdom For this reason, the mother had the sole management of affairs committed to her, out of a regard for her great sense and judgment. But on her death, Sicilius took the crown and government. After him reigned Chimerus his son, to whom succeeded Danius his brother. After his death, the crown came to Morvidus, whom he had by his concubine Tagastella. He would have been a prince of extraordinary worth had he not been addicted to immoderate cruelty, so far that in his anger he spared nobody if any weapon were at hand. He was of a graceful aspect, extremely liberal, and of such vast strength as to not have his match in the whole kingdom. Chapter 15 Morvidus, a most cruel tyrant, after the conquest of the king of the Marini, is devoured by a monster. In his time, a certain king of the Marini arrived with a great force in Northumberland and began to destroy the country. But Morvidus, with all the strength of the kingdom, marched out against him and fought him. In this battle, he alone did more than the greatest part of his army, and after the victory, suffered none of the enemy to escape alive. For he commanded them to be brought to him, one after another, that he might satisfy his cruelty in seeing them killed. And when he grew tired of this, he gave orders that they should be flayed alive and burnt. During these and other monstrous sets of cruelty, an accident happened, which put a period to his wickedness. There came from the coast of the Irish Sea a most cruel monster that was continually devouring the people upon the sea coasts. As soon as he heard of it, he ventured to go and encounter it alone, but when he had in vain spent all his darts upon it, the monster rushed upon him, and with open jaws swallowed him up like a small fish. Chapter 16 Gorbonian, a most just king of the Britons He had five sons, whereof the eldest, Gorbonian, ascended the throne. There was not in his time a greater lover of justice and equity, or a more careful ruler of the people. The performances of due worship to the gods, and doing justice to the common people, was his continual employment. Through all the cities of Britain he repaired the temples of the gods, and built many new ones. In all his days the island abounded with riches, more than all the neighbouring countries, for he gave great encouragement to husbandmen in their tillage, by protecting them from any injury or oppression of their lords. And the soldiers he simply rewarded with money, so that no one had occasion to do wrong to another. 
amidst these and many other acts of his innate goodness he paid the debt of nature and was buried at trinovantum chapter seventeen arth gallo is deposed by the britons and is succeeded by elidur who restores him again his kingdom after him arth gallo his brother who was dignified with the crown and in all his actions he was the very reverse of his brother he everywhere endeavoured to depress the nobility and advance the baser sort of the people he plundered the rich and by these means amassed vast treasures but the nobility disdaining to bear his tyranny any longer made an insurrection against him and deposed him and then advanced elidur his brother who was afterwards surnamed the pious on account of his commiseration to arthgallo in distress for after five years possession of the kingdom as he happened to be hunting in the wood calitarium he met his brother that had been deposed for he had travelled over several kingdoms to desire assistance for the recovery of his lost dominions but had procured none and being now no longer able to bear the poverty to which he was reduced he returned back to britain with a design to repair to those who had been formerly his friends it was at this time as he was passing through the wood his brother elidur who little expected it got sight of him and forgetting all injuries ran to him and affectionately embraced him now as he had long lamented his brother's affliction he carried him with him to the city alalud where he hid him in his bedchamber after this he feigned himself sick and sent messengers over the whole kingdom to signify to all his prime nobility that they should come to visit him accordingly when they were all met together at the city where he lay he gave orders that they should come into his chamber one by one softly and without noise his pretence for which was that their talk would be a disturbance to his head should they all crowd in together thus in obedience to his commands and without the least suspicion of any design they entered his house one after another but elidur had given charge to his servants who were set ready for the purpose to take each of them as they entered and cut off their heads unless they would again submit themselves to arthgallo his brother thus he did with every one of them apart and compels them through fear to be reconciled to arthgallo at last the agreement being ratified elidur conducted arthgallo to york where he took the crown from his own head and put it on that of his brother from this act of extraordinary affection to his brother he obtained the surname of pious arthgallo after this reigned ten years and made amends for his former maladministration by pursuing measures of an entirely opposite tendency in depressing the baser sort and advancing men of good birth in suffering every one to enjoy his own and exercising strict justice towards all men at last sickness seizing him he died and was buried in the city caelia chapter eighteen elidur is imprisoned by peridur after whose death he is a third time advanced to the throne then elidur was again advanced to the throne and restored to his former dignity but while in his government he followed the example of his eldest brother gorbonian in performing all acts of grace his two remaining brothers virginius and peridur raised an army and made war against him in which they proved victorious so that they took him prisoner and shut him up in the tower at trinovantum where they placed a guard over him then they divided the kingdom betwixt them that part which is from the river humber westward falling to virginius's share and the remainder with all albania to peridur's 
After seven years, Virginius died, and so the whole kingdom came to Peridio, who from that time governed the people with generosity and mildness, so that he even excelled his other brothers who had preceded him. Nor was any mention now made of Elidio. But irresistible fate at last removed him suddenly, and so made way for Elidio's release from prison, and advancement to the throne a third time, who finished the course of his life in just and virtuous actions, and after death left an example of piety to his successors. Chapter 19 The Names of Elidio's Thirty-Three Successors Elidio being dead, Gorbonian's son enjoyed the crown, and imitated his uncle's wise and prudent government, for he abhorred tyranny, and practised justice and mildness towards the people. Nor did he ever swerve from this rule of equity. After him reigned Margan, the son of Arthgallo, who, being instructed by the examples of his immediate predecessors, held the government in peace. To him succeeded Enionus his brother, who took a contrary course, and in the sixth year of his reign was deposed, for having preferred a tyrannical to a just and legal administration. In his room was placed his kinsman Idwallo, the son of Virginius, who being admonished by Enionus's ill success, became a strict observer of justice and equity. To him succeeded Runno, the son of Peridio, whose successor was Gerontius, the son of Elidio. After him reigned Catellus, his son. After Catellus, Coilus. After Coilus, Porrex. After Porrex, Cherin. This prince had three sons, Fulgenius, Eldardus, and Andragius, who all reigned one after another. Then succeeded Euryanus, the son of Andragius, after whom reigned in order Eliad, Cledaucus, Clitonus, Gugintius, Marianus, Bladuno, Cap, Uenus, Sicilius, Blegbred. This last prince, in singing and playing upon musical instruments, excelled all the musicians that had been before him so that he seemed worthy of the title of the God of Jesters. After him reigned Arthmael, his brother. After Arthmael, Eldol, to whom succeeded in order Radion, Rudertius, Sesmuel Penisil, Pier, Capoia, and Clegucillus, the son of Capoia, a man prudent and mild in all his actions and who above all things made it his business to exercise true justice among his people. Chapter 20 Heli's Three Sons, the first of whom, viz. Lud, gives his name to the city of London. Next to him succeeded his son Heli, who reigned forty years. He had three sons, Lud, Cesabalaun, and Nennius, of whom Lud, being the eldest, succeeded to the kingdom after his father's death. He became famous for the building of cities, and for rebuilding the walls of Trinovantum, which he also surrounded with innumerable towers. He likewise commanded the citizens to build houses, and all other kinds of structures in it, so that no city in all foreign countries, to a great distance round, could show more beautiful palaces. He was, withal, a warlike man, and very magnificent in his feasts and public entertainments. And though he had many other cities, yet he loved this above them all, and resided in it to the greater part of the year, for which reason it was afterwards called Caerlud, and, by corruption of the word, London and again by change of languages, in process of time, London, as also by foreigners who arrived here, and reduced this country under their subjection, it was called Londres. 
at last, when he was dead, his body was buried by the gate, which to this time is called in the British tongue, after his name, Path Lud, and in the Saxon, Ludsgarter. He had two sons, Androgeus and Tenoantius, who were incapable of governing on account of their age, and therefore their uncle Cassibelaun was preferred to the kingdom in their room. As soon as he was crowned, he began to display his generosity and magnificence to such a degree that his fame reached to distant kingdoms, which was the reason that the monarchy of the whole kingdom came to be invested in him and not in his nephews. Notwithstanding, Cassibelaun, from an impulse of piety, would not suffer them to be without their share in the kingdom, but assigned a large part of it to them. For he bestowed the city of Trinovantum with the dukedom of Kent on Androgeus, and the dukedom of Cornwall on Tenuantius. But he himself, as possessing the crown, had the sovereignty over them, and over all the other princes of the island. End of Book 3, Part 2book 4 part 1 of history of the kings of britain this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org history of the kings of britain by geoffrey of monmouth translated by aaron thompson and j a giles Book 4, Chapter 1 Julius Caesar Invades Britain About this time it happened, as is found in the Roman histories, that Julius Caesar, having subdued Gaul, came to the shore of the Rutini, and when from thence he had got a prospect of the island of Britain, he inquired of those about him what country it was, and what people inhabited it. Then, fixing his eyes upon the ocean, as soon as he was informed of the name of the kingdom and the people, he said, In truth, we Romans and the Britons have the same origin, since both are descended from the Trojan race. Our first father, after the destruction of Troy, was Aeneas. There's Brutus, whose father was Silvius, the son of Ascanius, the son of Aeneas. But I am deceived if they are not very much degenerated from us, and know nothing of the art of war, since they live separated by the ocean from the whole world. They may easily be forced to become our tributaries, and subject to the Roman state. But before the Romans offer to invade or assault them, we must send them word that they pay tribute as other nations do, and submit themselves to the Senate, for fear we should violate the ancient nobility of our father Priamus by shedding the blood of our kinsmen. All of which he accordingly took care to signify by writing to Cassibelaun, who in great indignation returned him an answer in the following letter. Chapter 2. Cassibelaun's Letter to Julius Caesar Cassibelaun, King of the Britons, to Gaius Julius Caesar We cannot but wonder, Caesar, at the avarice of the Roman people, since their insatiable lust for money cannot let us alone though the dangers of the ocean have placed us in a manner out of the world. But they must have the presumption to covet our substance, which we have hitherto enjoyed in quiet. Neither is this indeed sufficient. We must also choose subjection and slavery to them before the enjoyment of our native liberty. Your demand, therefore, Caesar, is scandalous since the same vein of nobility 
flows from Aeneas in both Britons and Romans, and one and the same chain of consanguinity unites us, which ought to be a band of firm union and friendship. It was that which you should have demanded of us, and not slavery. We have learned to admit of the one, but never to bear the other. And so much have we been accustomed to liberty, that we are perfectly ignorant what it is to admit to slavery. And if even the gods therefore should attempt to deprive us of our liberty, we would, to the utmost of our power, resist them in defence of it. Know then, Caesar, that we are ready to fight for that and our kingdom, if, as you threaten, you shall attempt to invade Britain. Chapter 3 Caesar is routed by Cassibelan. On receiving this answer, Caesar made ready his fleet, and waited for a fair wind to execute his threats against Cassibelan. As soon as the wind stood fair, he hoisted his sails, and arrived with his army at the mouth of the river Thames. The ships were now just come close to land, when Cassibelan, with all his forces, appeared on his march against them. And coming to the town of Durobellum, he consulted with his nobility how to drive out the enemy. There was present with him Belinus, general of his army, by whose counsel the whole kingdom was governed. There were also his two nephews, Androgeus, Duke of Trinovantum, and Tenuantius, Duke of Cornwall, together with three inferior kings, Critias, king of Albania, Guertheith of Venedotia, and Britail of Domitia, who, as they had encouraged the rest to fight the enemy, gave their advice to march directly to Caesar's camp, and drive them out of the country before they could take any city or town. For if he should possess himself of any fortified places, they said it would be more difficult to force him out, because he would then know whither to make a retreat with his men. To this proposal they all agreed, and advanced towards the shore where Julius Caesar had pitched his camp. And now both armies drew out in the order of battle, and began the fight, wherein both bows and swords were employed. Immediately the wounded fell in heaps on each side, and the ground was drenched with the blood of the slain, as much as if it had been washed with the sudden return of the tide. While the armies were thus engaged, it happened that Nennius and Androgeus, with the citizens of Canterbury and Trinovantum, whom they commanded, had the fortune to meet with the troop in which Caesar himself was present. And upon an assault made, the general's cohorts were very nearly routed by the Britons, falling upon them in a close body. During this action, fortune gave Nennius an opportunity of encountering Caesar. Nennius, therefore, boldly made up to him, and was in great joy that he could but give so much as one blow to so great a man. On the other hand, Caesar, being aware of his design, stretched out his shield to receive him, and with all his might struck him upon the helmet with his drawn sword, which he lifted up again with an intention to finish the first blow, and make it mortal. But Nennius carefully prevented him with his shield, upon which Caesar's sword, glancing with great force from the helmet, became so firmly fastened therein, that when, by the intervention of the troops, they could no longer continue the encounter, the general was not able to draw it out again. Nennius, thus becoming master of Caesar's sword, threw away his own, and pulling the other out, made haste to employ it against the enemy. Whomsoever he struck with it, he either cut off his head, or left him wounded without hope of recovery. While he was thus exerting himself, he was met by Labienus, a tribune, whom he killed at the very beginning of the encounter. At last, after the greatest part of the day was spent, the Britons poured in so fast, and made such vigorous efforts, that by the blessing of God they obtained the victory. And Caesar, with his broken forces, retired to his camp and fleet. 
the very same night, as soon as he had got his men together again, he went on board his fleet, rejoicing that he had the sea for his camp. And upon his companions dissuading him from continuing the war any longer, he acquiesced in their advice, and returned back to Gaul. Chapter 4 Nennius, the brother of Cassibelan, being wounded in battle by Caesar, dies. Cassibelan, in joy for this triumph, returned solemn thanks to God, and calling the companions of his victory together, amply rewarded every one of them, according as they had distinguished themselves. On the other hand, he was very much oppressed with grief for his brother Nennius, who lay mortally wounded and at the very point of death. For Caesar had wounded him in the encounter, and the blow which he had given him proved incurable, so that fifteen days after the battle he died, and was buried at Trinovantum by the north gate. His funeral exequies were performed with regal pomp, and Caesar's sword put into the tomb with him, which he had kept possession of, when struck into his shield in the combat. The name of the sword was Crocia Mors, Yellow Death, as being mortal to everybody that was wounded with it. Chapter 5 Caesar's Inglorious Return to Gaul After this flight of Caesar, and his arrival on the Gallic coast, the Gauls attempted to rebel and throw off his yoke, for they thought he was so much weakened that his forces could no longer be a terror to them. Besides, a general report was spread among them that Cassibelan was now out at sea, with a vast fleet to pursue him in his flight. On which account the Gauls, growing still more bold, began to think of driving him from their coasts. Caesar, aware of their designs, was not willing to engage in a doubtful war with a fierce people, but rather chose to go to all their first nobility, with open treasures, and reconcile them with presents. To the common people he promised liberty, to the dispossessed the restitution of their estates, and to the slaves their freedom. Thus he that had insulted them before with the fierceness of a lion, and plundered them of all, now, with the mildness of a lamb, fawns on them with submissive abject speeches, and is glad to restore all again. To these acts of meanness he was forced to condescend till he had pacified them, and was able to regain his lost power. In the meantime, not a day passed without his reflecting upon his flight and the victory of the Britons. Chapter 6. Cassibelan forms a stratagem for sinking Caesar's ships. After two years were expired, he prepared to cross the sea again, and revenge himself on Cassibelan, who, having intelligence of his design, everywhere fortified his cities, repaired the ruined walls, and placed armed men at all the ports. In the river Thames, on which Caesar intended to sail up to Trinovantum, he caused iron and leaden stakes, each as thick as a man's thigh, to be fixed under the surface of the water, that Caesar's ships might founder. He then assembled all the forces of the island, and took up his quarters with them near the sea coasts, in expectation of the enemy's coming. Chapter 7 Caesar, a second time, vanquished by the Britons. After he had furnished himself with all necessaries, the Roman general embarked with a vast army, eager to revenge himself on a people that had defeated him, in which he undoubtedly would have succeeded if he could but have brought his fleet safe to land. But this he was not able to do. For in sailing up the Thames to Trinovantum, the ships struck against the stakes, which so endangered them all on a sudden, that many thousands of men were drowned, while the ships being pierced sunk into the river. Caesar, upon this, 
employed all his force to shift his sails, and hastened to get back again to land. And so those that remained, after a narrow escape, went on shore with him. Casabalan, who was present upon the bank, with joy observed the disaster of the drowned, but grieved at the escape of the rest. And upon him giving a signal to his men, made an attack upon the Romans, who, notwithstanding the danger they had suffered in the river, when landed, bravely withstood the Britons, and, having no other fence to trust to but their own courage, they made no small slaughter, but yet suffered a greater loss themselves than that which they were able to give the enemy. For their number was considerably diminished by their loss in the river, whereas the Britons, being hourly increased with new recruits, were three times their number, and by that advantage defeated them. Caesar, seeing he could no longer maintain his ground, fled with a small body of men to his ships, and made the sea his safe retreat. And as the wind stood fair, he hoisted his sails, and steered to the shore of the Morini. From thence he repaired to a certain tower, which he had built at a place called Odnia, before his second expedition to Britain. For he durst not trust the fickleness of the Gauls, whom he feared would fall upon him a second time, as we have said already they did before, after the first flight he was forced to make before the Britons. And on that account he had built this tower for a refuge to himself, that he might be able to maintain his ground against a rebellious people, if they should make insurrection against him. Chapter 8 Evelinus Kills Hirolglass Androdreus Desires Caesar's Assistance Against Cassibelaun Cassibelaun, elevated with joy for this second victory, published a decree to summon all the nobility of Britain, with their wives, to Trinovantum, in order to perform solemn sacrifices to their tutelary gods who had given them victory over so great a commander. Accordingly they all appeared, and prepared a variety of sacrifices, for which there was a great slaughter of cattle. At this solemnity they offered forty thousand cows and a hundred thousand sheep, and also fowls of several kinds without number, besides thirty thousand wild beasts of several kinds. As soon as they had performed these solemn honours to their gods, they feasted themselves on the remainder, as was usual at such sacrifices, and spent the rest of the day and night in various plays and sports. Amidst these diversions, it happened that two noble youths, whereof one was nephew to the king, the other to Duke Androdreus, wrestled together, and afterwards had a dispute about the victory. The name of the king's nephew was Hiroglass, the other's Evelinus. As they were reproaching each other, Evelinus snatched up his sword and cut off the head of his rival. This sudden disaster put the whole court into a consternation, upon which the king ordered Evelinus to be brought before him, that he might be ready to undergo such punishment as the nobility should determine and that the death of Hiroglass may be revenged upon him if he were unjustly killed. Androdreus, suspecting the king's intentions, made answer that he had a court of his own, and that whatever should be alleged against his own men ought to be determined there. If, therefore, he were resolved to demand justice of Evelinus, he might have it at Trinovantum, according to ancient custom, Casabalan, finding he could not attain his ends, threatened Androdreus to destroy his country with fire and sword if he would not comply with his demands. But Androdreus, now incensed, scorned all compliances with him. On the other hand, Casabalan, in a great rage, hastened to make good his threats and ravage the country. This forced Androdreus to make use of daily solicitations to the king by means of such as were related to him, or intimate with him, to divert his rage. But when he found these methods ineffectual, 
he began in earnest to consider how to oppose him. At last, when all other hopes failed, he resolved to request assistance from Caesar, and wrote a letter to him to this effect. Androgeus, king of Trinovantum, to Gaius Julius Caesar, instead of wishing death as formerly, now wishes health. I repent that I ever acted against you when you made war against the king. Had I never been guilty of such exploits, you would have vanquished Casabalown, who is so swollen with pride since his victory, that he is endeavouring to drive me out of his coasts, who procured him that triumph. Is this a fit reward for my services? I have settled him in an inheritance, and he endeavours to disinherit me. I have a second time restored him to the kingdom, and he endeavours to destroy me. All this I have done for him in fighting against you. I call the gods to witness I have not deserved his anger, unless I can be said to deserve it for refusing to deliver up my nephew, whom he would have condemned to die unjustly. Of which, that you may better be able to judge, hear this account of the matter. It happened that for joy of the victory we performed solemn honours to our tutelary gods, in which, after we had finished our sacrifices, our youth began to divert themselves with sports. Among the rest, our two nephews, encouraged by the example of others, entered the lists, and when mine had got the better, the other, without any cause, was incensed and just going to strike him, but he avoided the blow, and taking him by the hand that held the sword, strove to wrest it from him. In this struggle, the king's nephew happened to fall upon the sword's point, and died upon the spot. When the king was informed of it, he commanded me to deliver up the youth, that he might be punished for murder. I refused to do it, whereupon he invaded my provinces with all his forces, and has given me very great disturbance. Flying, therefore, to your clemency, I desire your assistance, that by you I may be restored to my dignity, and by me you may gain possession of Britain. Let no doubts or suspicion of treachery in this matter detain you. Be influenced by the common motive of mankind. Let past enmities beget a desire of friendship, and after defeat make you more eager for victory. Chapter 9 Cassibelaun, being put to flight, and besieged by Caesar, desires peace. Caesar, having read the letter, was advised by his friends not to go to Britain upon a bare verbal invitation of the Duke, unless he would send such hostages as might be for his security. Without delay, therefore, Androgeus sent his son Scaver, with thirty young noblemen nearly related to him. Upon delivery of the hostages, Caesar, relieved from his suspicion, reassembled his forces, and with a fair wind, arrived at the port of Rutupi. In the meantime, Cassibelaun had begun to besiege Trinovantum and ravage the country towns. But finding that Caesar was arrived, he raised the siege and hastened to meet him. As soon as he entered a valley near Duroburnia, he saw the Roman army preparing their camp, for Androgeus had conducted them to this place for the convenience of making a sudden assault upon the city. The Romans, seeing the Britons advancing towards them, quickly flew to their arms and ranged themselves in several bodies. The Britons also put on their arms and placed themselves in their ranks. But Androgeus, with five thousand men, lay hid in a wood hard by, 
to be ready to assist Caesar and spring forth on a sudden upon Casabalan and his party. Both armies now approached to begin the fight, some with bows and arrows, some with swords, so that much blood was shed on both sides, and the wounded fell down like leaves in autumn. While they were thus engaged, Androdreus sallied forth from the wood, and fell upon the rear of Casabalan's army, upon which the hope of the battle entirely depended. And now, what with the breach which the Romans had made through them just before, what with the furious eruption of their own countrymen, they were no longer able to stand their ground, but were obliged with their broken forces to quit the field. Near the place stood a rocky mountain, on the top of which was a thick hazel wood. Hither, Casabalan fled with his men after he found himself worsted, and having climbed up to the top of the mountain, bravely defended himself and killed the pursuing enemy. For the Roman forces with those of Androgeus pursued him to disperse his flying troops, and climbing up the mountain after them made many assaults, but all to little purpose. For the rockiness of the mountain and great height of its top was a defence to the Britons and the advantage of higher ground gave them an opportunity of killing great numbers of the enemy. Caesar hereupon besieged the mountain that whole night, which had now overtaken them, and shut up all the avenues to it, intending to reduce the king by famine, since he could not do it by force of arms. Such was the wonderful valour of the British nation in those times, that they were able to put the conqueror of the world twice to flight, and being ready to die for the defence of their country and liberty, they, even though defeated, withstood him whom the whole world could not withstand. Hence Lucan, in their praise, says of Caesar, Terra quaestia ostendit Turga Britannia. With pride he fought the Britons, but when found, dreaded their force and fled the hostile ground. Two days were now passed, when Casabalan, having consumed all his provisions, feared famine would oblige him to surrender himself prisoner to Caesar. For this reason, he sent a message to Androgeus to make his peace with Julius, lest the honour of the nation might suffer by his being taken prisoner. He likewise represented to him that he did not deserve to be pursued to death for the annoyance which he had given him, as soon as the messengers had told this to Androgeus, he made answer, That prince deserves not to be loved, who is in war as mild as a lamb, but in peace cruel as a lion. Ye gods of heaven and earth, does my lord then condescend to entreat me now, when before he took upon him to command? Does he desire to be reconciled and make his submission of Caesar? of whom Caesar himself had before desired peace? He ought therefore to have considered that he who was able to drive so great a commander out of the kingdom was able also to bring him back again. I ought not to have been so unjustly treated, who had then done him so much service, as well as now so much injury. He must be mad, who either injures or reproaches his fellow soldiers by whom he defeats the enemy. The victory is not the commander's, but theirs who lose their blood in fighting for him. However, I will procure him peace if I can, for the injury which he has done me is sufficiently revenged upon him, since he sues for mercy to me. Chapter 10 Androdreus's speech to Caesar. Androdreus, after this, went to Caesar, and after a respectful salutation, addressed him in this manner. You have sufficiently revenged yourself upon Casabalan, and now let clemency take place of vengeance. What more is there to be done that he make his submission and pay tribute to the Roman state? To this Caesar returned him no answer, 
upon which Androgeus said again, My whole engagement with you, Caesar, was only to reduce Britain under your power by the submission of Cassipolaun. Behold, Cassipolaun is now vanquished, and Britain, by my assistance, becomes subject to you. What further service do I owe you? God forbid that I should suffer my sovereign, who sues to me for peace, and makes me satisfaction for the injury which he has done me, to be in prison or in chains. It is no easy matter to put Cassipolaun to death, while I have life. And if you do not comply with my demand, I shall not be ashamed to give him my assistance. Caesar, alarmed at these menaces of Androgeus, was forced to comply, and entered into peace with Cassipolaun, on condition that he should pay a yearly tribute of three thousand pieces of silver. So then, Julius and Cassibelaun from this time became friends, and made presents to each other. After this, Caesar wintered in Britain, and the following spring returned into Gaul. At length, he assembled all his forces, and marched towards Rome against Pompey. End of Book 4, Part 1book 4 part 2 of history of the kings of britain this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org history of the kings of britain by geoffrey of monmouth translated by aaron thompson and j a giles Chapter 11. Tenuantius is made king of Britain after Cassibelaun. After seven years had expired, Cassibelaun died and was buried at York. He was succeeded by Tenuantius, Duke of Cornwall, and brother of Androgeus, for Androgeus was gone to Rome with Caesar. Tenuantius, therefore, now wearing the crown, governed the kingdom with diligence. He was a warlike man, and a strict observer of justice. After him, Cimbelinus, his son, was advanced to the throne, being a great soldier, and brought up by Augustus Caesar. He had contracted so great a friendship with the Romans, that he freely paid them tribute, when he might very well have refused it. In his days was born our Lord Jesus Christ, by whose precious blood mankind was redeemed from the devil, under which they had been before enslaved. Chapter 12 Upon Guiderius's refusing to pay tribute to the Romans, Claudius Caesar invades Britain. Cimbelinus, when he had governed Britain ten years, begat two sons, the elder named Guiderius, the other Arviragus. After his death, the government fell to Guiderius. This prince refused to pay tribute to the Romans, for which reason Claudius, who was now emperor, marched against him. He was attended in this expedition by the commander of his army, who was called in the British tongue Louis Hamo by whose advice the following war was to be carried on. This man, therefore, arriving at the city of Portchester, began to block up the gates with a wall, and denied the citizens all liberty of passing out, for his design was either to reduce them to subjection by famine, or kill them without mercy. Chapter 13 Lewis Hamo a Roman, by wicked treachery, kills Guiderius. Guiderius, upon the news of Claudius's coming, assembled all the soldiery of the kingdom, and went to meet the Roman army. In the battle that ensued, he began the assault with great eagerness, 
and did more execution with his own sword than the greater part of his army. Claudius was now on the point of retreating to his ships, and the Romans very nearly routed, when the crafty Hamo, throwing aside his own armour, put on that of the Britons, and as a Briton, fought against his own men. Then he exhorted the Britons to a vigorous assault, promising them a speedy victory, for he had learned their language and manners, having been educated among the British hostages at Rome. By these means he approached, by little and little, to the king, and, seizing an opportunity to approach, stabbed him while under no apprehension of danger, and then escaped through the enemy's ranks to return to his men with the news of his detestable exploit. But Arviragus, his brother, seeing him killed, forthwith put off his own and put on his brother's habiliments, and, as if he had been Guiderius himself, encouraged the Britons to stand their ground. Accordingly, as they knew nothing of the king's disaster, they made a vigorous resistance, fought courageously, and killed no small number of the enemy. At last the Romans gave ground, and, dividing themselves into two bodies, basely quitted the field. Caesar, with one part, to secure himself, retired to his ships. But Hamo fled to the woods, because he had not time to get to the ships. Arviragus, therefore, thinking that Claudius fled along with him, pursued him with all speed, and did not leave off harassing him from place to place, till he overtook him upon a part of the sea-coast, which, from the name of Hamo, is now called Southampton. There was at the same place a convenient haven for ships, and some merchant ships at anchor. And, just as Hamo was attempting to get on board them, Arviragus came upon him unawares, and forthwith killed him. And ever since that time the haven has been called Hamo's Port. Chapter 14 Arviragus, King of Britain, makes his submission to Claudius, who, with his assistance, conquers the Orkney Islands. In the meantime Claudius, with his remaining forces, assaulted the city above mentioned, which was then called Caeperis, now Portchester, and presently levelled the walls, and having reduced the citizens to subjection, went after Arviragus, who had entered Winchester. Afterwards he besieged that city, and employed a variety of engines against it. Arviragus, seeing himself in these straits, called his troops together, and opened the gates to march out and give him battle. But, just as he was ready to begin the attack, Claudius, who feared the boldness of the king and the bravery of the Britons, sent a message to him with a proposal of peace, choosing rather to reduce them by wisdom and policy than run the hazard of a battle. To this purpose, he offered a reconciliation with him, and promised to give him his daughter if he would only acknowledge the kingdom of Britain subject to the Roman state. The nobility hereupon persuaded him to lay aside thoughts of war, and be content with Claudius's promise, representing to him at the same time that it was no disgrace to be subject to the Romans, who enjoyed the empire of the whole world. By these and many other arguments, he was prevailed upon to hearken to their advice, and make his submission to Caesar. After which, Claudius sent to Rome for his daughter, and then, with the assistance of Arviragus, reduced the Orkney and the provincial islands to his power. Chapter 15 Claudius gives his daughter Genuissa for a wife to Arviragus, and returns to Rome. As soon as the winter was over, those that were sent for Claudius's daughter returned with her, and presented her to her father. The damsel's name was Genuissa, and so great was her beauty that it raised the admiration of all that saw her. 
after her marriage with the king, she gained so great an ascendant over his affections, that he in a manner valued nothing but her alone, insomuch that he was desirous to have the place honoured where the nuptials were solemnised, and moved Claudius to build a city upon it, for a monument to posterity of so great and happy a marriage. Claudius consented to it, and commanded a city to be built, which after his name is called Caer Glau, that is Gloucester, to this day, and is situated on the confines of Domitia and Lurgria, upon the banks of the Severn. But some say that it derived its name from Duke Loius, a son that was born to Claudius there, and to whom, after the death of Arvaragus, fell the dukedom of Domitia. The city being finished, and the island now enjoying peace, Claudius returned to Rome, leaving to Arvaragus the government of the British islands. At the same time, the Apostle Peter founded the Church of Antioch, and afterwards coming to Rome was bishop there, and sent Mark the Evangelist into Egypt to preach the gospel which he had written. Chapter 16 Arvaragus revolting from the Romans, Vespasian is sent into Britain. After the departure of Claudius, Arvaragus began to show his wisdom and courage, to rebuild cities and towns, and to exercise so great authority over his own people that he became a terror to the kings of remote countries. But this so elevated him with pride that he despised the Roman power, disdained any longer subjection to the Senate, and assumed to himself the sole authority in everything. Upon this news, Vespasian was sent by Claudius to procure a reconciliation with Averagus, or to reduce him to the subjection of the Romans. When, therefore, Vespasian arrived at the haven of Rutupi, Averagus met him, and prevented him entering the port. For he brought so great an army along with him, that the Romans, for fear of his falling upon them, durst not come ashore. Vespasian upon this withdrew from that port, and shifting his sails arrived at the shore of Totnes. As soon as he was landed, he marched directly to besiege Carpenhuelgoit, now Exeter, and after lying before it seven days, was overtaken by Avaragus and his army, who gave him battle. That day great destruction was made in both armies but neither got the victory. The next morning, by the mediation of Queen Genuissa, the two leaders were made friends, and sent their men over to Ireland. As soon as winter was over, Vespasian returned to Rome, but Arviragus continued still in Britain. Afterwards, when he grew old, he began to show much respect to the Senate, and to govern his kingdom in peace and tranquillity. He confirmed the old laws of his ancestors, and enacted some new ones, and made very ample presents to all persons of merit, so that his fame spread over all Europe, and he was both loved and feared by the Romans, and became the subject of their discourse more than any king in his time. Hence Juvenal relates how a certain blind man, speaking of a turbot that was taken, said, Regum aliquem capies, aut de temino Britano decidit el viragus. A viragus shall from his chariot fall, or thee his lord some captive king shall call. In war, none was more fierce than he. In peace, none more mild. None more pleasing. Or in his presence, more magnificent. When he had finished his course of life, he was buried at Gloucester, in a certain temple which he had built and dedicated to the honour of Claudius. Chapter 17 Roderick, leader of the Picts, is vanquished by Marius. His son Marius, a man of admirable prudence and wisdom, succeeded him in the kingdom. In his reign a certain king of the Picts, named Roderick, 
came from Scythia with a great fleet, and arrived in the north part of Britain, which is called Albania, and began to ravage that country. Marius, therefore, raising an army, went in quest of him, and killed him in battle, and gained the victory. For a monument of which he set up a stone in the province, which from his name was afterwards called West Moorland, where there is an inscription retaining his memory to this day. He gave the conquered people that came with Roderick liberty to inhabit that part of Albania, which is called Caithness, that had been a long time desert and uncultivated. And as they had no wives, they desired to have the daughters and kinswomen of the Britons. But the Britons refused, disdaining to unite with such a people. Having suffered a repulse here, they sailed over into Ireland, and married the women of that country, and by their offspring increased their number. But let thus much suffice concerning them, since I do not propose to write the history of this people, or of the Scots, who derived their original from them and the Irish. Marius, after he had settled the island in perfect peace, began to love the Roman people, paying the tribute that was demanded of him, and in imitation of his father's example, practised justice, law, peace, and everything that was honourable in his kingdom. Chapter 18. Marius dying is succeeded by Coilus. As soon as he had ended his days, his son Coilus took upon him the government of the kingdom. He had been brought up from his infancy at Rome, and having been taught the Roman manners, had contracted a most strict amity with them. He likewise paid them tribute, and declined making them any opposition, because he saw the whole world subject to them, and that no town or country was out of the limits of their power. By paying, therefore, what was required of him, he enjoyed his kingdom in peace. And no king ever showed greater respect to his nobility, not only permitting them to enjoy their own with quiet, but also binding them to him with his continual bounty and munificence. Chapter 19 Lucius is the first British king that embraces the Christian faith together with his people. Coilus had but one son, named Lucius, who, obtaining the crown after his father's decease, imitated all his acts of goodness, and seemed to his people to be no other than Coilus himself revived. As he had made so good a beginning, he was willing to make a better end for which purpose he sent letters to Pope Eleutherius, desiring to be instructed by him in the Christian religion. For the miracles which Christ's disciples performed in several nations wrought a conviction in his mind, so that being inflamed with an ardent love of the true faith, he obtained the accomplishment of his pious request. For that holy Pope, upon receipt of this devout petition, sent to him two most religious doctors, Faginus and Divanus, who, after they had preached concerning the incarnation of the word of God, administered baptism to him, and made him a proselyte to the Christian faith. Immediately upon this, people from all countries, assembling together, followed the king's example, and being washed in the same holy laver, were made partakers of the kingdom of heaven. The holy doctors, after they had almost extinguished paganism over the whole island, dedicated the temples that had been founded in honour of many gods to the one only God and his saints, and filled them with congregations of Christians. There were then in Britain eight and twenty flamens, as also three arch flamens, to whose jurisdiction the other judges and enthusiasts were subject. These also, according to the apostolic command, they delivered from idolatry, and where there were flamens, made them bishops, where archflamens, archbishops. 
The seats of the Archflamens were at the three noblest cities, viz. London, York, and the city of Legions, which its old walls and buildings show to have been situated upon the river Usk in Glamorganshire. To these three, now purified from superstition, were made subject twenty-eight bishops and their dioceses. To the metropolitan of York were subject Dera and Albania, which the great river Humber divides from Lurgria. To the metropolitan of London were subject Lurgria and Cornwall. These two provinces the seven divides from Cambria or Wales, which were subject to the city of Legions. Chapter 20 Fagnus and Devanus give an account at home of what they had done in Britain. At last, when they had made an entire reformation here, the two prelates returned to Rome and desired the Pope to confirm what they had done. As soon as they had obtained a confirmation, they returned again to Britain, accompanied with many others, by whose doctrine the British nation was in a short time strengthened in the faith. Their names and acts are recorded in a book which Gildas wrote concerning the victory of Aurelius Ambrosius, and what is delivered in so bright a treatise needs not to be repeated here in a meaner style. End of Book 4 Part 2Book 5, Part 1 of History of the Kings of Britain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth. Translated by Aaron Thompson and J. A. Giles. Chapter 1 Lucius dies without issue, and is a benefactor to the churches. In the meantime, the glorious King Lucius highly rejoiced at the great progress which the true faith and worship had made in his kingdom, and permitted the possessions and territories which formerly belonged to the temples of the gods to be converted to a better use, and appropriated to Christian churches. And because a greater honour was due to them than to the others, he made large additions of lands and manor-houses, and all kinds of privileges to them. Amidst these and other acts of his great piety, he departed this life in the city of Gloucester, and was honourably buried in the cathedral church in the hundred and fifty-sixth year after our Lord's incarnation. He had no issue to succeed him, so that after his decease there arose dissension among the Britons, and the Roman power was much weakened. Chapter 2 Severus, a senator, subdues part of Britain. His war with Fulgenius when this news was brought to Rome, the Senate dispatched Severus, a senator, with two legions, to reduce the country to subjection. As soon as he was arrived, he came to a battle with the Britons, part of whom he obliged to submit to him, and the other part, which he could not subdue, he endeavoured to distress in several cruel engagements, and forced them to fly beyond Dera into Albania notwithstanding which, they opposed him with all their might under the conduct of Fulgenius, and often made great slaughter both of their own countrymen and of the Romans. For Fulgenius brought to his assistance all the people of the islands that he could find, and so frequently gained the victory. The emperor, not being able to resist the eruptions which he made, commanded a wall to be built between Dera and Albania, to hinder his excursions upon them. They accordingly made one, at the common charge from sea to sea, which for a long time hindered the approach of the enemy. But Fulgenius, 
when he was unable to make any longer resistance, made a voyage into Scythia to desire the assistance of the Picts towards his restoration. And when he had got together all the forces of that country, he returned with a great fleet into Britain and besieged York. Upon this news being spread through the country, the greatest part of the Britons deserted Severus and went over to Fulgenius. However, this did not make Severus desist from his enterprise, but calling together the Romans and the rest of the Britons that adhered to him, he marched to the siege and fought with Fulgenius. But the engagement proving very sharp, he was killed with many of his followers. Fulgenius also was mortally wounded. Afterwards Severus was buried at York, which city was taken by his legions. He left two sons, Basianus and Gita, whereof Gita had a Roman for his mother, but Basianus a Briton. Therefore, upon the death of their father, the Romans made Gita king, favouring him on account of his being a Roman by both his parents. But the Britons rejected him, and advanced Basianus as being their countryman by his mother's side. This proved the occasion of a battle between the two brothers, in which Gita was killed, and so Basianus obtained the sovereignty. Chapter 3 Carousius advanced to be king of Britain. At that time there was in Britain one Carousius, a young man of mean birth, who, having given proof of his bravery in many engagements, went to Rome and solicited the Senate for leave to defend with a fleet the maritime coasts of Britain from the incursions of barbarians, which if they would grant him, he promised to do more for the honour and service of the Commonwealth than by delivering up to them the kingdom of Britain. The Senate, deluded by his specious promises, granted him his request, and so, with his commission sealed, he returned to Britain. Then by wicked practices getting a fleet together, he enlisted into his service a body of the bravest youths, and putting out to sea, sailed round the whole kingdom, causing very great disturbance among the people. In the meantime, he invaded the adjacent islands, where he destroyed all before him, countries, cities, and towns, and plundered the inhabitants of all that they had. By this conduct, he encouraged all manner of dissolute fellows to flock to him in hope of plunder, and, in a very short time, was attended by an army which no neighbouring prince was able to oppose. This made him begin to swell with pride, and to propose to the Britons that they should make him their king, for which consideration he promised to kill and banish the Romans, and free the whole island from the invasions of barbarous nations. Accordingly, obtaining his request, he fell upon Basianus and killed him, and then took upon him the government of the kingdom. For Basianus was betrayed by the Picts, whom Fulgenius, his mother's brother, had brought with him into Britain, and who, being corrupted by the promises and presence of Carousius, instead of assisting Basianus, deserted him in the very battle, and fell upon his men, so that the rest were put into a consternation, and not knowing their friends from their foes, quickly gave ground, and left the victory to Carousius. Then he, to reward the Picts for this success, gave them a habitation in Albania, where they continued afterwards mixed with the Britons. Chapter 4 Electus kills Carousius, but is afterwards himself slain in flight by his Clepiodotus. When the news of these proceedings of Carousius arrived at Rome, the Senate commissioned Electus, with three legions, to kill the tyrant and restore the kingdom of Britain to the Roman power. No sooner was he arrived than he fought with Carousius, killed him, and took upon himself the government. After which he miserably oppressed the Britons 
for having deserted the commonwealth and adhered to Carousius. But the Britons, not enduring this, advanced as Clepiodotus, Duke of Cornwall, to be their king, and then, unanimously, marched against Electus and challenged him to battle. He was then at London, celebrating a feast to his tutelary gods. But, being informed of the coming of Asclepiodotus, he quitted his sacrifice and went out with all his forces to meet him and engaged with him in a sharp fight. But Asclepiodotus had the advantage and dispersed and put to flight Electus's troops and in the pursuit killed many thousands as also King Electus himself. After this victory, Livius Gallus, the colleague of Electus, assembled the rest of the Romans, shut the gates of the city, and placed his men in the towers and other fortifications, thinking by these means either to make a stand against Asclepiodotus, or at least to avoid imminent death. But Asclepiodotus, seeing this, laid siege to the city, and sent word to all the dukes of Britain that he had killed Electus with a great number of his men, and was besieging Gallus and the rest of the Romans in London, and therefore earnestly entreated them to hasten to his assistance, representing to them withal how easy it was to extirpate the whole race of the Romans out of Britain, provided they would all join their forces against the besieged. At this summons came the Domitians, Venedotians, Tyrians, Albanians, and all others of the British race. As soon as they appeared before the Duke, he commanded vast numbers of engines to be made, to beat down the walls of the city. Accordingly, everyone readily executed his orders with great bravery, and made a violent assault upon the city, the walls of which were in a very short time battered down, and a passage made into it. After these preparations, they began a bloody assault upon the Romans, who, seeing their fellow soldiers falling before them without intermission, persuaded Gallus to offer a surrender, on the terms of having quarter granted them, and leave to depart. For they were now all killed except one legion, which still held out. Gallus consented to the proposal, and accordingly surrendered himself and his men to Asclepiodotus, who was disposed to give them quarter. But he was prevented by a body of Venedotians, who rushed upon them, and the same day cut off all their heads upon a brook within the city, which from the name of the commander was afterwards called in the British tongue Nout Gallim, and in the Saxon Gallimborn. Chapter 5 Asclepiodotus Obtains the Crown Diocletian's Massacre of the Christians in Britain The Romans being thus defeated, Asclepiodotus, with the consent of the people, placed the crown upon his own head and governed the country in justice and peace ten years, and curbed the insolence and outrages committed by plunderers and robbers. In his days began the persecution of the Emperor Diocletian, and Christianity, which from the time of King Lucius had continued fixed and undisturbed, was almost abolished over the whole island. This was principally owing to Maximianus Herculius, general of that tyrant's army, by whose command all the churches were pulled down and all the copies of the holy scriptures that could be found were burnt in the public markets. The priests also, with the believers under their own care, were put to death, and with emulation pressed in crowds together for a speedy passage to the joys of heaven as their proper dwelling place. God therefore magnified his goodness to us, for as much as he did, in that time of persecution, of his mere grace, light up the bright lamps of the holy martyrs, to prevent the spreading of gross darkness over the people of Britain, whose sepulchres and places of suffering might have been a means of inflaming our minds with the greatest fervency of divine law, had not the deplorable impiety of barbarians 
deprived us of them. Among others of both sexes, who continued firm in the army of Christ, and suffered, were Alban of Verulam, and Julius, and Aaron, both of the city of legions. Of these, Alban, out of the fervour of his charity, when his confessor, Amphibalus, was pursued by the persecutors, and just ready to be apprehended, first hit him in his house, and then offered himself to die for him, initiating in this Christ himself, who laid down his life for his sheep. The other two, after being torn limb from limb, in a manner unheard of, received the crown of martyrdom, and were elevated up to the gates of the heavenly Jerusalem. Chapter 6 An Insurrection Against Asclepiodotus by Col, whose daughter Helena, Constantius, marries. In the meantime, Col, Duke of Caer Colvin, or Colchester, made an insurrection against King Asclepiodotus, and in a pitched battle killed him and took possession of his crown. The Senate, hearing this, rejoiced at the king's death, who had given much disturbance to the Roman power, and, reflecting on the damage which they had sustained by the loss of this kingdom, they sent Constantius the senator, a man of prudence and courage, who had reduced Spain under their subjection, and who was, above all the rest, industrious to promote the good of the commonwealth. Call, having information of his coming, was afraid to engage him in battle on account of a report that no king was able to stand before him. Therefore, as soon as Constantius was arrived at the island, Call sent ambassadors to him with offers of peace and submission, on condition that he should enjoy the kingdom of Britain and pay no more than the usual tribute to the Roman state. Constantius consented to this proposal, and so, Upon their giving hostages, peace was confirmed between them. The month after, Call was seized with a very great sickness, of which he died within eight days. After his decease, Constantius himself was crowned, and married the daughter of Call, whose name was Helena. She surpassed all the ladies in the country in beauty as she did all others of the time in her skill in music and in the liberal arts. Her father had no other issue to succeed him on the throne, for which reason he was very careful about her education, that she might be better qualified to govern his kingdom. Constantius, therefore, having made her the partner of his bed, had a son by her called Constantine, after eleven years were expired, he died at York, and bestowed the kingdom upon his son, who, within a few years after he was raised to this dignity, began to give proofs of heroic virtue, undaunted courage, and strict observance of justice towards his people. He put a stop to the depredations of robbers, suppressed the insolence of tyrants, and endeavoured everywhere to restore peace. Chapter 7 The Romans desire Constantine's assistance against the cruelty of Maxentius. At that time there was a tyrant at Rome named Maxentius, who made it his endeavour to confiscate all the estates of all the best of the nobility, and oppressed the commonwealth with his grievous tyranny. Whilst he, therefore, was proceeding in his cruelty, those that were banished fled to Constantine in Britain, and were honourably entertained by him. At last, when a great many such had resorted to him, they endeavoured to raise in him an abhorrence of the tyrant, and frequently expostulated with him after this manner. How long, Constantine, will you suffer our distress and banishment? Why do you delay to restore us to our native country? You are the only person of our nation 
that can restore to us what we have lost by driving out Maxentius. For what prince is to be compared with the king of Britain, either for brave and gallant soldiers, or for large treasures? We entreat you to restore us to our estates, wives, and children, by conducting us with an army to Rome. Chapter 8 Constantine, having reduced Rome, obtains the empire of the world. Octavius, Duke of the Wissians, is put to flight by Traherne. Constantine, moved with these and the like speeches, made an expedition to Rome, and reduced it under his power, and afterwards obtained the empire of the whole world. In this expedition he carried along with him three uncles of Helena, viz. Leolin, Traherne, and Marius, and advanced them to the degree of senators. In the meantime, Octavius, Duke of the Wissians, rebelled against the Roman proconsuls, to whom the government of the island had been committed, and having killed them, took possession of the throne. Constantine, upon information of this, sent Traherne, the uncle of Helena, with three legions, to reduce the island. Traherne came to shore near the city, which is in the British tongue called Caeparis, and having assailed it, took it in two days. This news spreading over the whole country, King Octavius assembled all the forces of the land, and went to meet him not far from Winchester, in a field called, in the British tongue, Mysurium, where he engaged with him in battle, and routed him. Traherne, upon this loss, betook himself with his broken forces to his ships, and in them made a voyage to Albania, in the provinces of which he made great destruction. When Octavius received intelligence of this, he followed him with his forces, and encountered him in Westmoreland, but fled, having lost the victory. On the other hand, Traherne, when he found the day was his own, pursued Octavius, nor ever suffered him to be at rest, till he had dispossessed him of both his cities and crown. Octavius, in great grief for the loss of his kingdom, went with his fleet to Norway, to obtain assistance from King Grunbert. In the meantime, he had given orders to his most intimate adherents to watch carefully all opportunities of killing Traherne, which accordingly was not long after done by a magistrate of a certain privileged town, who had a more than ordinary love for him. For as Traherne was one day upon a journey from London, he lay hid with a hundred men in the vale of a wood through which he was to pass, and there fell on him unawares and killed him in the midst of his men. This news being brought to Octavius, he returned back to Britain, where he dispersed the Romans, and recovered the throne. In a short time after this, he arrived to such greatness and wealth, that he feared nobody, and possessed the kingdom, until the reign of Gratian and Valentian. End of Book 5, Part 1Book 5, Part 2 of History of the Kings of Britain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth. Translated by Aaron Thompson and J. A. Giles. Chapter 9. Maximian is desired for a king of Britain. At last, in his old age, being willing to settle the government, he asked his council which of his family they desired to have for their king after his decease. 
for he had no son, and only one daughter, to whom he could leave the crown. Some, therefore, advised him to bestow his daughter with the kingdom upon some noble Roman, to the end that they might enjoy a firmer peace. Others were of the opinion that Conan Meriadoc, his nephew, ought to be preferred to the throne, and the daughter married to some prince of another kingdom with a dowry in money. While these things were in agitation among them, there came Caradoc, Duke of Cornwall, and gave his advice to invite over Maximian, the senator, and to bestow the lady, with the kingdom, upon him, which would be a means of securing to them a lasting peace. For his father Leolin, the uncle of Constantine, whom we mentioned before, was a Briton, but by his mother and place of birth he was a Roman, and by both parents he was descended of royal blood, and there was a sure prospect of a firm and secure peace under him, on account of the right which he had to Britain by his descent from the emperors, and also from the British blood. But the Duke of Cornwall, by delivering this advice, brought upon himself the displeasure of Conan, the king's nephew, who was very ambitious of succeeding to the kingdom, and put the whole court into confusion about it. However, Caradoc, being unwilling to recede from his proposal, sent his son Mauritius to Rome, to acquaint Maximian with what had passed. Mauritius was a person of large and well-proportioned stature, as well as great courage and boldness, and could not bear to have his judgment contradicted without a recourse to arms and duelling. On presenting himself before Maximian, he met with a reception suitable to his quality, and he had the greatest honours paid to him of any that were about him. There happened to be at that time a great contest between Maximian and the two emperors, Gratian and Valentinian, on account of his being refused the third part of the empire, which he demanded. When, therefore, Mauritius saw Maximian ill-treated by the emperors, he took occasion from thence to address him in this manner. Why need you, Maximian, stand in fear of Gratian, when you have so fair an opportunity of wresting the empire from him? Come with me into Britain, and you will take possession of that crown. For King Octavius, being now grown old and infirm, desires nothing more than to find some such proper person to bestow his kingdom and daughter upon. He has no male issue, and therefore has asked the advice of his nobility to whom he should marry his daughter with the kingdom. And they, to his satisfaction, have passed a decree that the kingdom and the lady be given to you, and have sent me to acquaint you with it. So that if you go with me and accomplish this affair, you may, with the treasure and forces of Britain, be able to return back to Rome, drive out the emperors, and gain the empire for yourself. For in this manner did your kinsman Constantius and several others of our kings who raised themselves to the empire. Chapter 10 Maximian, coming into Britain, artfully declines fighting with Conan. Maximian was pleased with the offer, and took his journey to Britain, but in his way subdued the cities of the Franks, by which he amassed a great treasure of gold and silver, and raised men for his service in all parts. Afterwards he set sail with a fair wind, and arrived at Hamo's port, the news of which struck the king with fear and astonishment, who took this to be a hostile invasion, whereupon he called to him his nephew Conan, and commanded him to raise all the forces of the kingdom, and go and meet the enemy. Conan, having made the necessary preparations, marched accordingly to Hamo's port, where Maximian had pitched his tents, who, upon seeing the approach of so numerous an army, was under the greatest perplexities what course to take. For as he was attended with a smaller body of men, and had no hopes of being entertained peaceably, he dreaded both the number 
and courage of the enemy. Under these difficulties, he called a council of the oldest men, together with Mauritius, to ask their advice what was to be done at this crucial juncture. It is not for us, said Mauritius, to hazard a battle with such a numerous and powerful army. Neither was the reduction of Britain by arms the end of our coming. Our business must be to desire peace and a hospitable treatment, till we can learn the king's mind. Let us say that we are sent by the emperors upon an embassy to Octavius, and let us with artful speeches pacify the people. When all had shown themselves pleased with this advice, he took with him twelve aged men with grey hairs, eminent beyond the rest for their quality and wisdom, and bearing olive branches in their right hands, and went to meet Conan. The Britons, seeing they were men of a venerable age, and that they bore olive branches as a token of peace, rose up before them in a respectful manner, and opened a way for their free access to their commander. Then presenting themselves before Conan Meriadoc, they saluted him in the name of the emperors and the senate, and told him that Maximian was sent to Octavius upon an embassy from Gratian and Valentinian. Conan made answer, Why is he then attended with so great a multitude? This does not look like the appearance of ambassadors, but the invasion of enemies. To which Mauritius replied, It did not become so great a man to appear abroad in a mean figure, or without soldiers for his guard, especially considering that by reason of the Roman power and the actions of his ancestors, he has become obnoxious to many kings. If he had but a small retinue, he might perhaps have been killed by the enemies of the Commonwealth. He is come in peace, and it is peace which he desires, for from the time of our arrival our behaviour has been such as to give no offence to anybody. We have bought necessities at our own expenses, as peaceable people do, and have taken nothing from any by violence. While Conan was in suspense, whether to give them peace or begin the battle, Caradoc, king of Cornwall, with others of the nobility, came to him, and dissuaded him from proceeding in the war after this representation. Whereupon, though much against his will, he laid down his arms and granted them peace. Then he conducted Maximian to London, where he gave the king an account of the whole proceeding. Chapter 11 The Kingdom of Britain is Bestowed on Maximian Caradoc, after this, taking along with him his son Mauritius, commanded everybody to withdraw from the king's presence, and then addressed him in these words. Behold, that which your more faithful and loyal subjects have long wished for is now, by the good providence of God, brought about. You commanded your nobility to give their advice how to dispose of your daughter and kingdom, as being willing to hold the government no longer on account of your great age. Some, therefore, were for having the kingdom delivered up to Conan, your nephew, and a suitable match procured for your daughter elsewhere, as fearing the reign of our people if any prince that is a stranger to our language should be set over us. Others were for granting the kingdom to your daughter, and some noblemen of our own country, who should succeed you after your death. But the greater number recommended some person descended of the family of the emperors, on whom you should bestow your daughter and crown. 
for they promised themselves a firm and lasting peace as the consequence of such a marriage, since they would be under the protection of the Roman state. See then, God has vouchsafed to bring you a young man who is both a Roman and also of the royal family of Britain, and to whom, if you follow my advice, you will not delay to marry your daughter. And indeed, should you refuse him, what right could you plead to the crown of Britain against him? For he is the cousin of Constantine, and the nephew of King Curl, whose daughter Helena possessed the crown by an undeniable hereditary right. When Caradoc had represented these things to him, Octavius acquiesced, and with the general consent of his people bestowed the kingdom, and his daughter, upon him. Conan Meriadoc, finding how things went, was beyond expression incensed, and retiring into Albania, used all his interest to raise an army that he might give disturbance to Maximian. And when he had got a great body of men together, he passed the Humber, and wasted the provinces on each side of it. At the news whereof, Maximian hastened to assemble his forces against him, then gave him battle, and returned with victory. But this proved no decisive blow to Conan, who with his reassembled troops still continued to ravage the provinces, and provoked Maximian to return again and renew the war, in which he had various success, being sometimes victorious, sometimes defeated. At last, after great damages done on both sides, they were brought by the mediation of friends to a reconciliation. Chapter 12 Maximian Overthrows the Armoricans His Speech to Conan Five years after this, Maximian, proud of the vast treasures that daily flowed in upon him, fitted out a great fleet, and assembled together all the forces in Britain. For this kingdom was now not sufficient for him. He was ambitious of adding Gaul also to it. With this view he set sail, and arrived first at the kingdom of Armorica, now called Britannia, and began hostilities upon the Gallic people that inhabited it. But the Gauls, under the command of Imboltus, met him, and engaged him in battle, in which the greater part being in danger, they were forced to fly, and leave Imboltus with fifteen thousand men killed, all of the Marmoricans. This severe overthrow was matter of the greatest joy to Maximian, who knew the reduction of that country would be very easy after the loss of so many men. Upon this occasion he called Conan aside from the army, and smiling said, See, we have already conquered one of the best kingdoms in Gaul. We may now have hopes of gaining all the rest. Let us make haste to take the cities and towns, before the rumour of their danger spread to the remoter parts of Gaul, and raise all the people up in arms. For if we can but get possession of this kingdom, I make no doubt of reducing all Gaul under our power. Be not therefore concerned that you have yielded up the island of Britain to me, notwithstanding the hopes you once had of succeeding to it, because whatever you have lost in it, I will restore to you in this country. For my design is to advance you to the throne of this kingdom, and it shall be another Britain, which we shall people with our own countrymen, and drive out the old inhabitants. The land is fruitful in corn, the rivers abound with fish, the woods afford a beautiful prospect, and the forests are everywhere pleasant. Nor is there, in my opinion, anywhere a more delightful country. Upon this Conan, with a submissive bow, gave him his thanks, and promised to continue loyal to him as long as he lived.
Chapter Thirteen. Rodonum taken by Maximian. After this, they marched with their forces to Rodonum, and took it the same day. For the citizens, hearing of the bravery of the Britons and what slaughter they had made, fled away with haste, leaving their wives and children behind them, and the rest of the cities and towns soon followed their example, so that there was an easy entrance into them for the Britons, who, wherever they entered, killed all they found left of the male sex, and spared only the women. At last, when they had wholly extirpated the inhabitants of all those provinces, they garrisoned the cities and towns with British soldiers, and made fortifications in several places. The fame of Maximian's exploits spreading over the rest of the provinces of Gaul, all their dukes and princes were in a dreadful consternation, and had no other hopes left but in their prayers to their gods. They fled everywhere, from the villages into the cities and towns, and other places of strength and safety. Maximian, finding that he had struck terror into them, began to think of still bolder attempts, and by profusely distributing presents augmented his army. For all persons that he knew to be eager for plunder, he enlisted into his service, and by plentifully bestowing his money and other valuable things among them, he kept them to his interest. Chapter 14 Maximian, after the conquest of Gaul and Germany, makes Trias the seat of his empire. By these means he raised such a numerous army as he thought would be sufficient for the conquest of all Gaul. Notwithstanding which, he suspended his arms for a time, till he had settled the kingdom which he had taken and peopled it with Britons. To this end he published a decree for the assembling together of a hundred thousand of the common people of Britain, who were to come over to settle in the country, besides thirty thousand soldiers to defend them from hostile attack. As soon as the people were arrived according to his orders, he distributed them through all the countries of Armorica, and made another Britain of it, and then bestowed it on Conan Meriadoc. But he himself, with the rest of his fellow soldiers, marched into the further part of Gaul, which, after many bloody battles, he subdued, as he did also all Germany, being everywhere victorious. But the seat of his empire he made at Trias, and fell so furiously upon the two emperors, Gratian and Valentinian, that he killed the one and forced the other to flee from Rome. Chapter 15 A Fight Between the Aquitanians and Conan In the meantime, the Gauls and Aquitanians gave disturbance to Conan and the Armorican Britons, and harassed them with their frequent incursions. But he has often defeated them and bravely defended the country committed to him. After he had entirely vanquished them, he had a mind to bestow wives on his fellow soldiers, by whom they might have issue to keep perpetual possession of the country. And to avoid all mixture with the Gauls, he sent over to the island of Britain for wives for them. In order to accomplish this, messengers were sent to recommend the management of this affair to Dionotus, king of Cornwall, who had succeeded his brother Caradoc in that kingdom. He was a very noble and powerful prince, and to him Maximian had committed the government while he was employed in affairs abroad. He also had a daughter of wonderful beauty named Ursula, with whom Conan was most passionately in love. Chapter 16 Guarnius and Melga murder eleven thousand virgins. 
Maximian is killed at Rome. Dionotus, upon this message sent him by Conan, was very ready to execute his orders, and summoned together the daughters of the nobility from all provinces, to the number of eleven thousand. But of the meaner sort, sixty thousand, and commanded them all to appear together in the city of London. He likewise ordered ships to be brought from all shores for their transportation to their future husbands. And though in so great a multitude many were pleased with this order, yet it was displeasing to the greater part, who had a greater affection for their relations and native country. Nor, perhaps, were there wanting some who, preferring virginity to the married state, would rather have lost their lives in any country than enjoyed the greatest plenty in wedlock. In short, most of them had views and wishes different from one another, had they been left to their own liberty. But now, the ships being ready, they went on board, and sailing down the Thames made towards the sea. At last, as they were steering towards the Armorican coast, contrary winds rose, and dispersed the whole fleet. In this storm, the greater part of the ships foundered, but the women that escaped the danger of the sea were driven upon strange islands, and by a barbarous people either murdered or made slaves. For they happened to fall into the hands of the cruel army of Guanius and Melga, who, by the command of Gratian, were making terrible destruction in Germany and the nations on the sea coast. Guanius was king of the Huns, and Melga of the Picts, whom Gratian had engaged in his party, and had sent into Germany to harass those of Maximian's party along the sea coasts. While they were thus exercising their barbarous rage, they happened to light upon these virgins, who had been driven on those parts, and were so inflamed with their beauty that they courted them to their brutish embraces, which, when the women would not submit to, the Ambrons fell upon them, and, without remorse, murdered the greatest part of them. This done, the two wicked leaders of the Picts and Huns, Guanius and Melga, being the partisans of Gratian and Valentinian, when they had learnt that the island of Britain was drained of all its soldiers, made a speedy voyage towards it, and taking into their assistance the people of the adjacent islands, arrived in Albania. Then, joining in a body, they invaded the kingdom, which was left without either government or defence, and made miserable destruction among the common people. For Maximian, as we have already related, had carried away with him all the warlike youth that could be found, and had left behind him only the husbandmen, who had neither sense nor arms for the defence of their country. Guanius and Melga, finding that they were not able to make the least opposition, began to domineer most insolently, and to lay waste their cities and countries, as if they had only been pens of sheep. The news of this grievous calamity coming to Maximian, he sent away Gratian Municeps with two legions to their assistance, who, as soon as they arrived, fought with the enemy, and after a most bloody victory over them, forced them to fly over into Ireland. In the meantime, Maximian was killed at Rome by Gratian's friends, and the Britons, whom he had carried with him, were also slain or dispersed. Those of them that could escape went to their countrymen in Armorica. Those of them that could escape went to their countrymen in Armorica, which was now called the Other Britain. End of Book 5, Part 2Book 6, Part 1 of History of the Kings of Britain. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth Translated by Aaron Thompson and J. A. Giles Chapter 1 Gratian, being advanced to the throne, is killed by the common people. The Britons desire the Romans to defend them against Guanius and Melga. But Gratian Municeps, hearing of the death of Maximian, seized the crown and made himself king. After this, he exercised such tyranny that the common people fell upon him in a tumultuous manner and murdered him. When this news reached other countries, their former enemies returned back from Ireland and bringing with them the Scots, Norwegians and Dacians made dreadful devastations with fire and sword over the whole kingdom from sea to sea. Upon this most grievous calamity and oppression, ambassadors are dispatched with letters to Rome to beseech with tears and vows of perpetual subjugation that a body of men might be sent to revenge their injuries and drive out the enemy from them. The ambassadors in a short time prevailed so far that, unmindful of past injuries, the Romans granted them one legion, which was transported in a fleet to their country, and there speedily encountered the enemy. At last, after the slaughter of a vast multitude of them, they drove them entirely out of the country and rescued the miserable people from their outrageous cruelty. Then they gave orders for a wall to be built between Albania and Dera, from one sea to the other, for a terror to the enemy and safeguard to the country. At that time Albania was wholly laid waste by the frequent invasions of barbarous nations, and whatever enemies made an attempt upon the country met with a convenient landing place there so that the inhabitants were diligent in working upon the wall, which they finished partly at the public, partly upon private charge. Chapter 2 Gwythelin's Speech to the Britons at the Romans Returning Home The Romans, after this, declared to the Britons that they should not be able for the future to undergo the fatigue of such laborious expeditions, and that it was beneath the dignity of the Roman state to harass so great and brave an army, both by land and sea, against base and vagabond robbers, but that they ought to apply themselves to the use of arms, and to fight bravely in defending to the utmost of their power their country, riches, wives, children, and what is dearer than all these, their liberty and lives. As soon as they had given them this exhortation, they commanded all the men of the island that were fit for war to appear together at London, because the Romans were about to return home. When, therefore, they were all assembled, Gwethelin, the Metropolitan of London, had orders to make a speech to them, which he did in these words. Though I am appointed by the princes here present to speak to you, I find myself rather ready to burst into tears than to make an eloquent oration. It is a most sensible affliction to me to observe the weak and destitute state into which you have fallen since Maximian drew away with him all the forces and youth of this kingdom. You that were left were people wholly inexperienced in war and occupied with other employments, as tilling the ground and several kinds of mechanical trades, so that when your enemies from foreign countries came upon you 
as sheep wandering without a shepherd. They forced you to quit your folds, till the Roman power restored you to them again. Must your hopes, therefore, always depend on foreign assistance? And will you never use yourselves to handle arms against a band of robbers that are by no means stronger than yourselves, if you are not dispirited by sloth and cowardice? The Romans are now tired with the continual voyages wherewith they are harassed to defend you against your enemies. They rather choose to remit to you the tribute you pay them than undergo any longer this fatigue by land and sea. Because you were only the common people at the time when we had soldiers of our own, do you therefore think that manhood has quite forsaken you? Are not men, in the course of human generation, often the reverse of one another? Is not a ploughman often the father of a soldier, and a soldier of a ploughman? Does not the same diversity happen in a mechanic and a soldier? Since then, in this manner, one produces another, I cannot think it possible for manhood to be lost among them. As, then, you are men, behave yourselves like men. Call upon the name of Christ, that he might inspire you with courage to defend your liberties. No sooner had he concluded his speech than the people raised such a shout that one would have thought them on a sudden inspired with courage from heaven. Chapter 3 the Britons are again cruelly harassed by Guanius and Melga. After this, the Romans encouraged the timorous people as much as they could, and left them patterns of their arms. They likewise commanded towers, having a prospect towards the sea, to be placed at proper distances all along the south coast, where their ships were, and from whence they feared the invasions of the barbarians. But, according to the proverb, it is easier to make a hawk of a kite than a scholar of a ploughman. All learning to him is but as a pearl before swine. Thus no sooner had the Romans taken their farewell of them than the two leaders, Guanius and Melga, issued forth from their ships in which they had fled over into Ireland, and with their band of Scots Picts, Norwegians, Dacians, and others, whom they had brought along with them, seized upon all Albania as far as the very wall. Understanding likewise that the Romans were gone never to return any more, they now, in a more insolent manner than before, began their devastations in the island. Hereupon the country fellows upon the battlements of the walls sat night and day with quaking hearts, not daring to stir from their seats, and readier for flight than making the least resistance. In the meantime, the enemies ceased not with their hooks to pull them down headlong and dash the wretched herd to pieces upon the ground, who gained at least this advantage by their speedy death, that they avoided the sight of that most deplorable calamity which forthwith threatened their relations and dearest children. Such was the terrible vengeance of God for that most wicked madness of Maximian in draining the kingdom of all its forces, who, had they been present, would have repulsed any nation that invaded them, an evident proof of which they gave by the vast conquests they made abroad, even in remote countries and also by maintaining their own country in peace, while they continued here. But thus it happens when a country is left to the defence of country clowns. In short, quitting their high wall and their cities, the country people are forced again to fly, and to suffer a more fatal dispersion, a more furious pursuit of the enemy, a more cruel and general slaughter than before and like lambs before wolves, 
so was that miserable people torn to pieces by the merciless barbarians. Again, therefore, the wretched Romida sent letters to Agitus, a man of great power among the Romans, to this effect. To Agitus, thrice consul, the groans of the Britons. And after some few other complaints they add, The sea drives us to the barbarians, and the barbarians drive us back to the sea. Thus are we tossed to and fro, between two kinds of death, either being drowned or put to the sword. Notwithstanding this most moving address, they procured no relief, and the ambassadors returning back in great heaviness declared to their countrymen the repulse which they had suffered. Chapter 5 Gwithelin desires succours of Aldroan. Hereupon, after a consultation together, Gwithelin, Archbishop of London, passed over into Lesser Britain, called then Armorica, or Latavia, to desire assistance of their brethren. At that time Aldroan reigned there, being the fourth king from Conan, to whom, as has already been related, Maximian had given that kingdom. This prince, being a prelate of so great dignity, arrived, received him with honour, and inquired after the occasion of his coming. To which Gwithelin, Your Majesty can be no stranger to the misery which we, your Britons, have suffered, which may even demand your tears, since the time that Maximian drained our island of its soldiers to people the kingdom which you enjoy, and which, God grant you, may long continue to enjoy in peace. For against us, the poor remains of the British race, all the people of the adjacent islands have risen up and made an utter devastation in our country, which then abounded with all kinds of riches, so that the people are now wholly destitute of all manner of sustenance but what they can get in hunting. Nor had we any power or knowledge of military affairs left among us to encounter the enemy. For the Romans are tired of us, and have absolutely refused their assistance, so that now, deprived of all other hope, we come to implore your clemency, that you would furnish us with forces, and protect a kingdom, which is of right your own, from the incursions of barbarians. For who but yourself ought, without your consent, to wear the crown of Constantine and Maximian, since the right your ancestors had to it, is now devolved upon you. Prepare then your fleet, and go with me. Behold, I deliver the kingdom of Britain into your hands. To this Aldroan made answer. There was a time formerly when I would not have refused to accept of the island of Britain if it had been offered me, for I do not think that there was anywhere a more fruitful country while it enjoyed peace and tranquillity. But now, since the calamities that have befallen it, it has become of less value and odious both to me and all other princes. But above all things, the power of the Romans was so destructive to it that nobody could enjoy any settled state or authority in it without loss of liberty and bearing the yoke of slavery under them. And who would not prefer the possession of a lesser country with liberty to all the riches of that island in servitude. The kingdom that is now under my subjection I enjoy with honour, and without paying homage to any superior, so that I prefer it to all other countries, since I can govern it without being controlled. Nevertheless, out of respect to the right that my ancestors for many generations have had to your island, I deliver to you my brother Constantine, with two thousand men, that with the good providences of God he may free your country 
from the inroads of barbarians, and may obtain the crown for himself, for I have a brother called by that name who is an expert soldier, and in all other respects an accomplished man. If you please to accept of him, I will not refuse to send him with you, together with the said number of men, for indeed a larger number I do not mention to you, because I am daily threatened with disturbances from the Gauls. He had scarcely done speaking, before the archbishop returned him thanks, and when Constantine was called in, broke out into these expressions of joy. Christ conquers, Christ commands, Christ reigns, behold the king of desolate Britain, be Christ only present, and behold our defence, our hope, and our joy. In short, the ships being got ready, the men, who were chosen out from all parts of the kingdom, were delivered to Gwethelin. Chapter 5 Constantine, being made King of Britain, leaves three sons. When they had made all necessary preparations, they embarked and arrived at the port of Totnes, and then without delay assembled together the youth that was left in the island, and encountered the enemy, over whom, by the merit of the holy prelate, they obtained the victory. After this, the Britons, before dispersed, flocked together from all parts, and in a council held at Silcester, promoted Constantine to the throne and there performed the ceremony of his coronation. They also married him to a lady, descended from a noble Roman family, whom Archbishop Guithelin had educated, and by whom the king afterwards had three sons, named Constans, Aurelius Ambrosius, and Uther Pendragon. Constans, who was the eldest, he delivered to the church of Amphibalus in Winchester, that he might take there upon him the monastic order. But the other two, viz. Aurelius and Uther, he committed to the care of Guithelin for their education. At last, after ten years were expired, there came a certain Pict, who had entered his service, and under pretence of holding some private discourse with them, in a nursery of young trees, where nobody was present, stabbed him with a dagger. Chapter 6 Constans is by Vortigern crowned King of Britain. Upon the death of Constantine, a dissension arose among the nobility about a successor to the throne. Some were for setting up Aurelius Ambrosius, others Uther Pendragon, others again some of the persons of the royal family. At last, when they could come to no conclusion, Vortigern, consul of the Gewissians, who was himself very ambitious of the throne, went to Constant the monk, and thus addressed himself to him. You see your father is dead, and your brothers on account of their age are incapable of the government. Neither do I see any of your family besides yourself, whom the people ought to promote to the kingdom. If you will therefore follow my advice, I will, on condition of your increasing my private estate, dispose the people to favour your advancement, and free you from that habit, notwithstanding that it is against the rule of your order. Constans, overjoyed at the proposal, promised with an oath that upon these terms he would grant him whatever he would desire. Then Vortigern took him, and investing him in his regal habiliments, conducted him to London, and made him king, though not with the free consent of the people. Archbishop Guithelin was then dead, nor was there any other that durst perform the ceremony of his unction, on account of his having quitted the monastic order. However, this proved no hindrance to his coronation, for Vortigern himself performed the ceremony instead of a bishop. Chapter 7 Vortigern treacherously contrives to get King Constans assassinated. 
Constans, being thus advanced, committed the whole government of the kingdom to Vortigern, and surrendered himself up so entirely to his counsels that he did nothing without his order. His own incapacity for government obliged him to do this, for he had learnt anything else rather than state affairs within his cloister. Vortigern became sensible of this, and therefore began to deliberate with himself what course to take to obtain the crown, of which he had been before extremely ambitious. He saw that now was his proper time to gain his end easily, and when the kingdom was wholly entrusted to his management, and Constans, who bore the title of king, was no more than the shadow of one, for he was of a soft temper, a bad judge in matters of right, and not in the least feared, either by his own people or by the neighbouring states. And as for his two brothers, Uther Pendragon and Aurelius Ambrosius, they were only children in their cradles, and therefore incapable of the government. There was likewise this further misfortune, that all the older persons of the nobility were dead, so Vortigern seemed to be the only man surviving that had craft, policy, and experience in matters of state, and all the rest in a manner children or raw youths, who only inherited the honours of their parents and relations that had been killed in the former wars. Vortigern, finding a concurrence of so many favourable circumstances, contrived how he might easily and cunningly depose Constans the monk, and immediately establish himself in his place. But in order to do this, he waited until he had first well established his power and interest in several countries. He therefore petitioned to have the king's treasures and his fortified cities in his own custody, pretending there was a rumour that the neighbouring islanders designed an invasion of the kingdom. This being granted him, he placed his own creatures in these cities to secure them for himself. Then having formed a scheme how to execute his treasonable designs, he went to the king and represented to him the necessity of augmenting the number of his domestics, that he might more safely oppose the invasion of the enemy. "'Have not I left all things to your disposal?' said Constans. "'Do what you will to that, so that they be but faithful to me.' Vortigern replied, "'I am informed that the Picts are going to bring the Dacians and Norwegians in upon us, with a design to give us very great annoyance. I would therefore advise you, and in my opinion is the best course you can take, that you maintain some Picts in your court, who may do you good service among those of that nation. For if it is true that they are preparing to begin a rebellion, you may employ them as spies upon their countrymen.' in their plots and their stratagems, so as to easily escape them. This was the dark treason of a secret enemy, for he did not recommend this out of regard to the safety of Constans, but because he knew the Picts to be a giddy people, and ready for all manner of wickedness, so that in a fit of drunkenness or passion they might easily be incensed against the king, and make no scruple to assassinate him. And such an accident, when it should happen, would make an open way for his accession to the throne, which he so often had in view. Hereupon he dispatched messengers into Scotland, with an invitation to a hundred Pictish soldiers, whom accordingly he received into the king's household. And when admitted, he showed them more respect than all the rest of the domestics, by making them several presents, and allowing them a luxurious table, insomuch that they looked upon him as the king. So great was the regard they had for him, that they made songs of him about the streets, the subject of which was that Vortigern deserved the government, deserved the sceptre of Britain, but that Constans was unworthy of it. This encouraged Vortigern to show them still more favour, in order the more firmly to engage them in his interest. And when, by these practices, he had made them entirely his creatures, he took an opportunity, when they were drunk, to tell them that he was going to retire out of Britain, to see if he could get a better estate. For the small revenue he had then, he said, would not so much as enable him to maintain a retinue of fifty men. 
then putting on a look of sadness he withdrew to his own apartment and left them drinking in the hall the picts at this sight were in inexpressible sorrow as thinking what he had said was true and murmuring said to one another why do we suffer this monk to live why do we not kill him that vortigern may enjoy his crown who is so fit to succeed as he a man so generous to us is worthy to rule and deserves all the honour and dignity that we can bestow upon him chapter eight aurelius ambrosius and uther pendragon flee from vortigern and go to lesser britain after this breaking into constanza's bedchamber they fell upon him and killed him and carried his head to vortigern at the sight of it he put on a mournful countenance and burst forth into tears though at the same time he was always transported by joy however he summoned together the citizens of london for there the fact was committed and commanded all the assassins to be bound and their heads to be cut off for this abominable patricide in the meantime there were some who had a suspicion that this piece of villainy was wholly the contrivance of vortigern and that the picts were only his instruments to execute it others again as positively asserted his innocence at last the matter being left in doubt those who had the care of the two brothers aurelius ambrosius and uther pendragon fled over with them into lesser britain for fear of being killed by vortigern there they were kindly received by king budes who took care to give them an education suitable to their royal birth chapter nine vortigern makes himself king of britain now vortigern seeing nobody to rival him in the kingdom placed the crown on his own head and thus gained the preeminence over all the rest of the princes at last his treason being discovered the people of the adjacent islands whom the picts had brought into albania made insurrection against him for the picts were enraged on account of the death of their fellow soldiers who had been slain for the murder of constans and endeavoured to revenge that injury upon him vortigern was therefore daily in great distress and lost a considerable part of his army in the war with them he had likewise no less trouble from another quarter for fear of aurelius ambrosius and his brother uther pendragon who as we have said before had fled on his account into lesser britain for he heard it rumoured day after day that they had now arrived at man's estate and had built a vast fleet with a desire to return back to the kingdom which was their undoubted right chapter ten vortigern takes the saxons that were newcomers to his assistance in the meantime there arrived in kent three brigandines or long galleys full of armed men under the command of two brothers horsus and hengist vortigern was then at duroburnia now canterbury which city he often used to visit and being informed of the arrival of some tall strangers in large ships he ordered that they should be received peaceably and conducted into his presence as soon as they were brought before him he cast his eyes upon the two brothers who excelled all the rest both in nobility and gracefulness of person and having taken a view of the whole company asked them what country they were and what was the occasion of their coming into the kingdom to whom hengist whose years and wisdom entitled him to a precedence in the name of the rest made the following answer most noble king saxony which is one of the countries of germany was the place of our birth and the occasion of our coming was to offer our service to you or some other prince for we were driven out of our native country for no other reason but that the laws of the kingdom required it it is customary among us 
that when we come to be overstocked with people, our princes from all the provinces meet together, and command all the youth of the kingdom to assemble before them. Then casting lots, they make choice of the strongest and ablest of them to go into foreign nations, to procure themselves a subsistence, and free their native country from a superfluous multitude of people. Our country, therefore, being of late overstocked, our princes met, and after having cast lots, made choice of the youth which you see in your presence, and have obliged us to obey the custom that has been established of old. And us two brothers, Hengist and Horsus, they made generals over them, out of respect to our ancestors, who enjoyed the same honour. In obedience, therefore, to the laws so long established, we put out to sea, and under the good guidance of Mercury have arrived in your kingdom. The king, at the name of Mercury, looking earnestly upon them, asked what religion they professed. We worship, replied Hengist, our country gods, Saturn and Jupiter, and the other deities that govern the world, but especially Mercury, whom in our language we call Woden, and to whom our ancestors consecrated the fourth day of the week, still called after his name, Woden's Day. Next to him, we worship the powerful goddess Freya, to whom they also dedicated the sixth day, which after her name we call Freya Day. Vortigern replied, For your credulity, or um, rather incredulity, I am much grieved, but I rejoice at your arrival, which, whether by God's providence or by some other agency, happens very seasonably for me in my present difficulties. For I am opposed by my enemies on every side, and if you will engage with me in my wars, I will entertain you honourably in my kingdom, and bestow upon you lands and other possessions. The barbarians readily accepted his offer, and the agreement between them being ratified, they resided at his court. Soon after this, the Picts, issuing forth from Albania with a very great army, began to lay waste the northern parts of the island. When Vortigern had information of it, he assembled his forces and went to meet them beyond the Humber. Upon their engaging, the battle proved very fierce on both sides, though there was but little occasion for the Britons to exert themselves, for the Saxons fought so bravely that the enemy, formerly so victorious, was speedily put to flight. End of Book Six, Part One Book Six, Part Two of History of the Kings of Britain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth. Translated by Aaron Thompson and J. A. Giles. Chapter 11 Hengist brings over great numbers of Saxons into Britain. His crafty petition to Vortigern. Vortigern, therefore, as he owed the victory to them, increased his bounty to them, and gave their general, Hengist, large possessions of land in Lindesia, for the subsistence of himself and his fellow soldiers. Hereupon Hengist, who was a man of experience and subtlety, finding how much interest he had with the king, addressed him in this manner. Sir, your enemies give you disturbance from all quarters, and few of your subjects love you. They all threaten you, 
and say they are going to bring over Aurelius Ambrosius from Armorica to depose you and make him king. If you please, let us send to our country to invite over some more soldiers, so that with our forces increased we may better be able to oppose them. But there is one thing which I would desire of your clemency if I did not fear a refusal. Vortican made answer. Send your messengers to Germany and invite over who you please, and you shall have no refusal from me in whatever you shall desire. Hengist, with a low bow, returned him thanks, and said, The possessions which you have given me in land and houses are very large, but you have not yet done me that honour which becomes my station and birth, because, among other things, I should have had some town or city granted me that I might be entitled to greater esteem among the nobility of your kingdom. I ought to have been made a consul or a prince, since my ancestors enjoyed both those dignities. It is not in my power, replied Vortigern, to do you so much honour. Uh, because you are, you are strangers and to pagans. Neither am I yet so far acquainted with your manners and customs as to set you upon a level with my natural-born subjects. And indeed, if I did esteem you as my subjects, I should not be forward to do so, because the nobility of my kingdom would strongly dissuade me from it. Give your servant, said Hengist, only so much ground in the place that you have assigned me as I can encompass with a leathern thong, for to build a fortress upon as a place of retreat, if occasion should require. For I will always be faithful to you, as I have been hitherto, and will pursue no other design in the request which I have made. With these words, the king was prevailed upon to grant him his petition, and ordered him to dispatch messengers into Germany, to invite more men over speedily to his assistance. Hengist immediately executed his orders, and taking a bull's hide, made one thong out of the hole, with which he encompassed a rocky place that he had carefully made choice of, and within that circuit began to build a castle, which, when finished, took its name from the thong wherewith it had been measured, for it was afterwards called in the British tongue Caer Corai, or in Saxon Thancaster, that is, Thong Castle. Chapter 12 Vortigern marries Rowan, the daughter of Hengist. In the meantime, the messengers returned from Germany with eighteen ships, full of the best soldiers they could get. They also brought along with them Rowan, the daughter of Hengist, one of the most accomplished beauties of that age. After their arrival, Hengist invited the king to his house, to view his new buildings and the new soldiers that were come over. The king readily accepted of his invitation, but privately and having highly commended the magnificence of the structure, enlisted the men into his service. Here he was entertained at a royal banquet, and when that was over, the young lady came out of her chamber, bearing a golden cup full of wine, with which she approached the king, and making a low curtsy, said to him, Lavered king, wacht heil! The king at the sight of the lady's face, was on a sudden both surprised and inflamed with her beauty, and calling to his interpreter, asked him what she said, and what answer he should make her. She called you royal lord, said the interpreter, and offered to drink your health. Your answer to her must be Trinkile. Vortigern accordingly answered, Trinkile, and bade her drink after which he took the cup from her hand, kissed her, and drank himself. 
from that time to this, it has been the custom in Britain that he who drinks to anyone says Vachtheil, and he that pledges him answers Trinkheil. Vortigern being now drunk with the variety of liquors, the devil took this opportunity to enter into his heart, and to make him in love with a damsel, so that he became suitor to her father for her. It was, I say, by the devil's entering into his heart, that he, who was a Christian, should fall in love with a pagan. By this example, Hengist, being a prudent man, discovered the king's levity, and consulted with his brother Horsus, and the other ancient men present, what to do in relation to the king's request. They unanimously advised him to give him his daughter, and in consideration of her, to demand the province of Kent. Accordingly the daughter was without delay delivered to Vortigern, and the province of Kent to Hengist, without the knowledge of Gorangan, who had the government of it. The king the same night married the pagan lady, and became extremely delighted with her, by which he quickly brought upon himself the hatred of the nobility, and of his own sons. For he already had three sons, whose names were Vortimer, Catagern, and Pacentius. Chapter 13 The bishops Germanus and Lupus restore the Christian faith that had been corrupted in Britain. Octa and Abyssa are four times routed by Vortimer. At that time came St. Germanus, Bishop of Auxerre, and Lupus, Bishop of Troy, to preach the gospel to the Britons. For the Christian faith had been corrupted among them, partly by the pagans whom the king had brought into society with them, partly by the Pelagian heresy, with the poison whereof they had been a long time infected. But by the preaching of these holy men, the true faith and worship was again restored, the many miracles they wrought giving success to their labours. Gildas has in his elegant treatise given an account of the many miracles God wrought by them. The king being now, as we have said, possessed of the lady, Hengist said to him, As I am your father, I claim the right of being your counsellor. Do not therefore slight my advice, since it is to my countrymen you must owe the conquest of all your enemies. Let us invite over my son Octa and his brother Ebissa, who are brave soldiers, and give them the countries that are in the northern parts of Britain, by the wall, between Deira and Albania, for they will hinder the inroads of the barbarians, and so you will enjoy peace on the other side of the Humber. Vortigern complied with his request, and ordered them to invite over whomsoever they knew able to assist him. Immediately upon the receipt of this message came Octa, Abyssa, and Cherdich, with three hundred ships filled with soldiers, who were all kindly received by Vortigern, and had ample presents made them. For by their assistance he vanquished his enemies, and in every engagement proved victorious. Hengist, in the meantime, continued to invite over more and more ships, and to augment his numbers daily, which, when the Britons observed, they were afraid of being betrayed by them, and moved the king to banish them out of his coasts. For it was contrary to the rule of the gospel that Christians should hold fellowship or have any intercourse with pagans. Besides which, the number of those that were come over was now so great that they were a terror to his subjects, and nobody could now know who was a pagan or who was a Christian since pagans married the daughters and kinswomen of Christians. These things they represented to the king, and endeavoured to dissuade him from entertaining them, lest they might by some treacherous conspiracy prove an overmatch for the native inhabitants. But Vortigern, who loved them above all other nations on account of his wife, 
was deaf to their advice. For this reason, the Britons quickly desert him, and unanimously set up Vortimer, his son, for their king, who at their instigation began to drive out the barbarians and make dreadful incursions upon them. Four battles he fought with them, and was victorious in all, the first upon the river Derwent, the second upon the ford of Epiphrod, where Horsus and Catagon, another son of Vortigern, met, and after a sharp encounter killed each other, the third upon the seashore, where the enemies fled shamefully to their ships, and betook themselves for refuge to the Isle of Thanet. But Vortimer besieged them there, and daily distressed them with his fleet. And when they were no longer able to bear the assaults of the Britons, they sent King Vortigern, who was present with them in all those wars, to his son Vortimer, to desire leave to depart, and return back safe to Germany. And while a conference upon this subject was being held, they in the meantime went on board their long galleys, and, leaving their wives and children behind them, returned back to Germany. Chapter 14 Vortimer's Kindness to His Soldiers at His Death Vortimer, after this great success, began to restore his subjects to their possessions which had been taken from them, and to show them all marks of his affectation and esteem, and, at the insistence of St. Germanus, to rebuild their churches. But his goodness quickly stirred up the enmity of the devil against him, who, entering into the heart of his stepmother Rowan, excited her to contrive his death. For this purpose she consulted with the poisoners, and procured one who was intimate with him, whom she corrupted with large and numerous presents to give him a poisonous draught, so that this brave soldier, as soon as he had taken it, was seized with a sudden illness that deprived him of all hopes of life. Hereupon he forthwith ordered all his men to come to him, and having shown them how near he was to his end, distributed among them all the treasure his predecessors had heaped up, and endeavoured to comfort them in their sorrow and lamentation for him, telling them that he was only going the way of all flesh. But he exhorted those brave and warlike young men, who had attended him in all his victories, to persist courageously in the defence of their country, against all hostile invasion, and with wonderful greatness of mind, commanded a brazen pyramid to be placed in the port where the Saxons used to land, and his body when dead to be buried on the top of it, that the sight of his tomb might frighten the barbarians back to Germany. For he said none of them would dare approach the country that should but get a sight of his tomb. Such was the admirable bravery of this great man, who, as he had been a terror to them while living, endeavoured to be no less so when dead. Notwithstanding which, he was no sooner dead than the Britons had no regard for his orders, but buried him at London. Chapter 15 Hengist, having wickedly murdered the princes of Britain, keeps Vortigern prisoner. Vortigern, after the death of his son, was again restored to the kingdom, and at the request of his wife sent messengers into Germany to Hengist with an invitation to return into Britain, but privately, and with a small retinue, to prevent a quarrel between the barbarians and his subjects. But Hengist, hearing that Vortimer was dead, raised an army of no less than three hundred thousand men, and fitting out a fleet, returned with them to Britain. When Vortigern and the nobility heard of the arrival of so vast a multitude, they were immoderately incensed, and after consultation together, 
resolved to fight them and drive them from their coasts. Hengist, being informed of their design by messengers sent from his daughter, immediately entered into deliberation what cause to pursue against them. After several stratagems had been considered, he judged it most feasible to impose upon the nation by making a show of peace. With this view, he sent ambassadors to the king, to declare to him that he had not brought so great a number of men for the purpose either of staying with him or offering any violence to the country. But the reason why he brought them was because he thought Vortimer was yet living, and that he should have occasion for them against him in case of an assault. But now, since he no longer doubted of his being dead, he submitted himself and his people to the disposal of Vortigern, so that he might retain as many of them as he should think fit. And whomsoever he rejected, Hengist would allow to return back, without delay, to Germany. And if these terms pleased Vortigern, he desired him to appoint a time and a place for their meeting, and adjusting matters according to his pleasure. When these things were represented to the king, he was mightily pleased, as being very unwilling to part with Hengist, and at last ordered his subjects and the Saxons to meet upon the Calends of May, which were now very near, at the monastery of Ambrius, for the settling of the matters above mentioned. The appointment being agreed to on both sides, Hengist, with a new design of villainy in his head, ordered his soldiers to carry every one of them a long dagger under their garments. And while the conference should be held with the Britons, who would have no suspicion of them, he would give them this word of command, Nemet Urus Saxus, at which moment they were all to be ready to seize boldly every one his next man, and with his drawn dagger stab him. Accordingly, they all met at the time and place appointed, and began to treat of peace. And when a fit opportunity offered for executing his villainy, Hengist cried out, Nemet Uris Saxus, and the same instant seized Vortigern and held him by his cloak. The Saxons, upon the signal given, drew their daggers, and falling upon the princes, who little suspected any design, assassinated them to the number of four hundred and sixty barons and consuls, to whose bodies St. Eldad afterwards gave Christian burial. Not far from Caer Caradan, now Salisbury, in a burying place near the monastery of Ambrius the abbot, who was the founder of it. For they all came without arms, having no thoughts of anything but treating of peace, which gave the others a fairer opportunity of exercising their villainous design against them. But the pagans did not escape unpunished while they acted this wickedness, a great number of them being killed during this massacre of their enemies. For the Britons, taking up clubs and stones from the ground, resolutely defended themselves and did good execution upon the traitors. Chapter 16 Eldol's Valiant Exploit Hengist forces Vortigern to yield up the strongest fortifications in Britain in consideration of his release. There was present one Eldol, consul of Gloucester, who, at the sight of this treachery, took up a stake which he happened to find, and with that made his defence. Every blow he gave carried death along with it, and by breaking either the head, arms, soldiers, or legs of a great many, he struck no small terror into the traitors. Nor did he move from the spot before he had killed with that weapon seventy men. But being no longer able to stand his ground against such numbers, he made his escape from them and retired to his own city. Many fell on both sides, but the Saxons got the victory because the Britons, having no suspicion of treachery, came unarmed and therefore made a weaker defence. 
After the commission of this detestable villainy, the Saxons would not kill Vortigern, but having threatened him with death and bound him, demanded his cities and fortified places in consideration of their granting him his life. He, to secure himself, denied them nothing, and when they had made him confirm his grants with an oath, they released him from his chains, and then marched first to London, which they took, as they did afterwards York, Lincoln, and Winchester, wasting the countries through which they passed, and destroying the people, as wolves do sheep when left by their shepherds. When Vortigern saw the desolation which they had made, he retired into the parts of Cambria, not knowing what to do against so barbarous a people. Chapter 17 Vortigern after consultation with magicians, orders a youth to be brought that never had a father. At last he had recourse to magicians for their advice, and commanded them to tell him what course to take. They advised him to build a very strong tower for his own safety, since he had lost all his other fortified places. Accordingly he made a progress about the country to find out a convenient situation and came at last to Mount Aria, where he assembled workmen from several countries, and ordered them to build the tower. The builders, therefore, began to lay the foundation, but whatever they did one day, the earth swallowed up the next, so as to leave no appearance of their work. Vortigern, being informed of this, again consulted with his magicians concerning the cause of it, who told him that he must find out a youth that never had a father, and kill him, and then sprinkle the stones and cement with his blood. For by those means, they said, he would have a firm foundation. Hereupon, messengers are forthwith dispatched away, all over the provinces, to inquire out such a man. In their travels they came to a city, called afterwards Carmurdin, where they saw some young men playing before the gate, and went up to them. But being weary with their journey, they sat down in the ring to see if they could meet with what they were in quest of. Towards evening, there happened on a sudden a quarrel between two of the young men, whose names were Merlin and Debutius. In the dispute, Debutius said to Merlin, You fool! Do you presume to quarrel with me? Is there any equality in our birth? I am descended of royal race, both by my father and mother's side. As for you, nobody knows what you are, for you never had a father. At that word the messengers looked earnestly upon Merlin, and asked the bystanders who he was. They told him it was not known who was his father. It was not known who was his father but that his mother was daughter to the king of Domitia, and that she lived in St. Peter's Church, among the nuns of that city. Chapter 18 Vortigern inquires of Merlin's mother concerning her conception of him. Upon this, the messengers hastened to the governor of the city, and ordered him, in the king's name, to send Merlin and his mother to the king. As soon as the governor understood the occasion of their message, he readily obeyed the order and sent them to Vortigern to complete his design. When they were introduced into the king's presence, he received the mother in a very respectful manner on account of her noble birth, and began to inquire of her by what man she had conceived. "'My sovereign lord,' said she, "'by the life of your soul and mine, I know nobody that begot him of me. Only this I know, that as I was once with my companions in our chambers, there appeared to me a person, in the shape of a most beautiful young man, who often embraced me eagerly in his arms, and kissed me, and when he had stayed a little time, he suddenly vanished out of my sight. But many times after this, he would talk with me when I sat alone, 
without making any visible appearance. When he had a long time haunted me in this manner, he at last lay with me several times in the shape of a man, and left me with child. And I do affirm to you, my sovereign lord, that excepting that young man, I know of nobody that begot him of me. The king, full of admiration at this account, ordered Morgantius to be called, that he might satisfy him as to the possibility of what the woman had related. Morgantius, being introduced, and having the whole manner repeated to him, said to Vortigern, In the books of our philosophers, and in a great many histories, I have found that several men have had the like original. For as Apuleius informs us in his book concerning the demon of Socrates, between the moon and the earth inhabit these spirits, which we call incubuses. They are of the nature partly of men, and partly of angels, and whenever they please, assume human shapes, and lie with women. Perhaps one of them appeared to this woman, and begot that young man of her. Chapter 19 Merlin's Speech to the King's Magicians and Advice about the Building of the Tower Merlin, in the meantime, was attentive to all that had passed, and then approached the king, and said to him, For what reason am I and my mother introduced into your presence? My magicians, answered Vortigern, advised me to seek out a man that had no father, with whose blood my building is to be sprinkled, in order to make it stand. Order your magicians, said Merlin, to come before me, and I will convict them of a lie. The king was surprised at his words, and presently ordered the magicians to come, and sit down before Merlin, who spoke to them after this manner. Because you are ignorant what it is that hinders the foundation of the tower, you have recommended the shedding of my blood for cement to it, as if that would presently make it stand. But tell me now, what is there under the foundation? For something there is that will not suffer it to stand. The magicians at this began to be afraid, and made him no answer. Then said Merlin, who was also called Ambrose, I entreat your majesty, I entreat your majesty would command your workmen to dig into the ground, and you will find a pond which causes the foundation to sink. This accordingly was done, and then presently they found a pond deep under the ground, which had made it give way. Merlin, after this, went again to the magicians and said, Tell me, you false sycophants, what is there under the pond? But they were silent. Then he said again to the king, Command the pond to be drained, and at the bottom you will see two hollow stones, and in them two dragons asleep. The king made no scruple of believing him, since he had found true what he said of the pond, and therefore ordered it to be drained, which done he found as Merlin had said, and now was possessed with the greatest admiration of him. Nor were the rest that were present less amazed at his wisdom, thinking it to be no less than divine inspiration. End of Book 6, Part 2Book 7 of History of the Kings of Britain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth. Translated by Aaron Thompson 
and J. A. Giles. Chapter One. Geoffrey of Monmouth's preface to Merlin's prophecy. I had not got thus far in my history, when the subject of public discourse happening to be concerning Merlin, I was obliged to publish his prophecies at the request of my acquaintance, but especially of Alexander, Bishop of Lincoln, a prelate of the greatest piety and wisdom. There was not any person, either among the clergy or laity, that was attended with such a train of knights and noblemen, whom his settled piety and great munificence engaged in his service. Out of a desire, therefore, to gratify him, I translated these prophecies, and sent them to him with the following letter. Chapter 2 Geoffrey's Letter to Alexander, Bishop of Lincoln The regard which I owe to your great worth, most noble prelate, has obliged me to undertake the translation of Merlin's prophecies out of British into Latin, before I had made an end of the history, which I had begun concerning the acts of the British kings. For my design was to have finished that first, and afterwards to have taken this work in hand, lest by being engaged on both at once I should be less capable of attending with any exactness to either. Notwithstanding, since the deference which is paid to your penetrating judgment will screen me from censure, I have employed my rude pen, and in a coarse style present you with a translation out of a language with which you are unacquainted. At the same time, I cannot but wonder at your recommending this matter to one of my low genius, when you might have caused so many men of greater learning and a richer vein of intellect to undertake it, who with their sublime strains would much more agreeably have entertained you. Besides, without any disparagement to all the philosophers in Britain, I must take the liberty to say that you yourself, if the business of your high station would give you leisure, are capable of furnishing us with loftier productions of this kind than any man living. However, since it was your pleasure that Geoffrey of Monmouth should be employed in this prophecy, he hopes you will favourably accept of his performance and vouchsafe to give a finer turn to whatever you will find unpolished, or otherwise faulty, in it. Chapter 3 The Prophecy of Merlin As Vortigern, King of the Britons, was sitting upon the bank of the drained pond, the two dragons, one of which was white, the other red, came forth, and approaching one another, began a terrible fight, and cast forth fire with their breath. But the white dragon had the advantage, and made the other fly to the end of the lake. And he, for grief at his flight, renewed the assault upon his pursuer, and forced him to retire. After this battle of the dragons, the king commanded Ambrose Merlin to tell him what it portended. Upon which he, bursting into tears, delivered what his prophetical spirit suggested to him, as follows. Woe to the red dragon, for his banishment hasteneth on. His lurking holes shall be seized by the white dragon, which signifies the Saxons, whom you invited over but the red denotes the British nation, which shall be oppressed by the white. Therefore shall its mountains be levelled as the valleys, and the rivers of the valleys will run with blood. The exercise of religion shall be destroyed, and churches be laid open to ruin. At last the oppressed shall prevail and oppose the cruelty of foreigners. For a boar of Cornwall shall give his assistance, and trample their necks under his feet. 
the islands of the ocean, shall be subject to his power, and he shall possess the forests of Gaul. The house of Romulus shall dread his courage, and his end shall be doubtful. He shall be celebrated in the mouths of the people, and his exploits shall be food to those that relate them. Six of his posterity shall sway the sceptre, but after them shall arise a German worm. He shall be advanced by a sea-wolf, whom the woods of Africa shall accompany. Religion shall again be abolished, and there shall be a translation of the metropolitan seas. The dignity of London shall adorn Doraburnia, and the seventh pastor of York shall be resorted to in the kingdom of Armorica. Menevia shall put on the pall of the city of legions, and a preacher of Ireland shall be dumb on account of an infant growing in the womb. It shall rain a shower of blood, and a raging famine shall affect mankind. When these things happen, the Red One shall be grieved, but when his fatigue is over, shall grow strong. Then shall misfortunes hasten upon the White One, and the buildings of his gardens shall be pulled down. Seven that sway the sceptre shall be killed, one of whom shall become a saint. The wombs of mothers shall be ripped up, and infants be abortive. There shall be a most grievous punishment of men, that the natives may be restored. He that shall do these things shall put on the brazen man, and upon a brazen horse shall for a long time guard the gates of London. After this shall the red dragon return to his proper manners, and turn his rage upon himself. Therefore shall the revenge of the thunderer show itself, for every field shall disappoint the husbandmen. Mortality shall snatch away the people, and make it desolation over all countries. The remainder shall quit their native soil, and make foreign plantations. A blessed king shall prepare a fleet, and shall be reckoned the twelfth in the court among the saints. There shall be a miserable desolation of the kingdom, and the floors of the harvest shall return to the fruitful forests. The white dragon shall rise again, and invite over a daughter of Germany. Our garden shall again be replenished with foreign seed, and the red one shall pine away at the end of the pond. After that shall the German worm be crowned, and the brazen prince buried. He has his bounds assigned him, which he shall not be able to pass. For a hundred and fifty years he shall continue in trouble and subjection, but shall bear away three hundred. Then shall the north wind rise against him, and shall snatch away the flowers which the west wind produced. There shall be gilding in the temples, nor shall the edge of the sword cease. The German dragon shall hardly get to his holes, because the revenge of his treason shall overtake him. At last he shall flourish for a little time, but the decimation of Neustria shall hurt him. For a people in wood and in iron, coats shall come, and revenge upon him his wickedness. They shall restore the ancient inhabitants to their dwellings and there will be an open destruction of foreigners. The seed of the white dragon shall be swept out of our gardens, and the remainder of his generation shall be decimated. They shall bear the yoke of slavery, and wound their mother with spades and ploughs. 
After this shall succeed two dragons, whereof one shall be killed with the sting of envy, but the other shall return under the shadow of a name. Then shall succeed a lion of justice, at whose roar the Gallican towers and the island dragons shall tremble. In those days gold shall be squeezed from the lily and the nettle, and silver shall flow from the hoofs of bellowing cattle. The frizzled shall put on various fleeces, and the outward habit to note the inward parts. The feet of barkers shall be cut off. Wild beasts shall enjoy peace. Mankind shall be grieved at their punishment. The form of commerce shall be divided. The half shall be found. The ravenousness of kites shall be destroyed and the teeth of wolves blunted. The lion's whelps shall be transformed into sea-fishes, and an eagle shall build her nest upon Mount Aravius. Venedotia shall grow red with the blood of mothers, and the house of Corinius kill six brethren. The island shall be wet with night tears, so that all shall be provoked to all things. Woe to thee, Neustria, because the lion's brain shall be poured upon thee, and he shall be banished with shattered limits from his native soil. Posterity shall endeavour to fly above the highest places, but the favour of newcomers shall be exalted. Piety shall hurt the possessor of things got by impiety, till he shall have put on his father Therefore, being armed with the teeth of a boar, he shall ascend above the tops of mountains and the shadow of him that wears a helmet. Albania shall be enraged, and assembling her neighbours shall be employed in shedding blood. There shall be put into her jaws a bridle that shall be made on the coast of Armorica. The eagle of the broken covenant shall gild it over, and rejoice in her third nest. The roaring whelps shall watch, and leaving the woods shall hunt within the walls of the cities. They shall make no small slaughter of those that oppose them, and shall cut off the tongues of bulls. They shall load the necks of roaring lions with chains, and restore the times of their ancestors. Then from the first to the fourth, from the fourth to the third, from the third to the second, the thumb shall roll in oil. The sixth shall overturn the walls of Ireland and change the woods into a plain. He shall reduce several parts to one and be crowned with the head of a lion. His beginning shall lay open to wandering affection, but his end shall carry him up to the blessed who are above. For he shall restore the seats of the saints in their countries, and settle pastors in convenient places. Two cities he shall invest with two pauls, and shall bestow virgin presents upon virgins. He shall merit by this the favour of the thunderer, and shall be placed among the saints. From him shall proceed a lynx, penetrating all things, who shall be bent upon the ruin of his own nation, for through him Neustria shall lose both islands and be deprived of its ancient dignity. Then shall the natives return back to the island, for there shall arise a dissension among foreigners. Also a hoary old man, sitting upon a snow-white horse, shall turn the course of the river Perian, and shall measure out a mill upon it with a white rod. Cadwallada shall call upon Conan, and take Albania into alliance. Then shall be there a slaughter of foreigners. Then shall the rivers run with blood. Then shall break forth the fountains of Armorica, and they shall be crowned with the diadem of Brutus. Cambria shall be filled with joy, and the oaks of Cornwall shall flourish. 
the island shall be called by the name of Brutus, and the name given it by foreigners shall be abolished. From Conan shall proceed a warlike boar that shall exercise the sharpness of his tusks within the Gallic woods. For he will cut down all the larger oaks and shall be a defence to the smaller. The Arabians and Africans shall dread him for he shall pursue his furious course to the farther part of Spain. There shall succeed the goat of the venereal castle, having golden horns and a silver beard, who shall breathe such a cloud out of his nostrils as shall darken the whole surface of the island. There shall be peace in his time, and corn shall abound by reason of the fruitfulness of the soil. Women shall become serpents in their gait, and all their motions shall be full of pride. The camp of Venus shall be restored, nor shall the arrows of Cupid cease to wound. The fountain of a river shall be turned into blood, and two kings shall fight a duel at Stafford for a lioness. Luxury shall overspread the whole ground, and fornication not cease to debauch mankind. All these things shall three ages see, till the buried kings shall be exposed to public view in the city of London. Famine shall again return, mortality shall return, and the inhabitants shall grieve for the destruction of their cities. Then shall come the board of commerce, who shall recall the scattered flocks to the pasture they had lost. His breast shall be food to the hungry, and his tongue drink to the thirsty. Out of his mouth shall flow rivers, and that shall water the parched drawers of men. After this shall be produced a tree upon the Tower of London, which having no more than three branches, shall overshadow the surface of the whole island with the breadth of its leaves. Its adversary, the north wind, shall come upon it, and with its noxious blast shall snatch away the third branch. But the two remaining ones shall possess its place, till they shall destroy one another by the multitude of their leaves, and then shall it obtain the place of those two, and shall give sustenance to the birds of foreign nations. It shall be esteemed hurtful to native fowls, for they shall not be able to fly freely for fear of its shadow. There shall succeed the ass of wickedness, swift against the goldsmiths, but slow against the ravenousness of wolves. In those days, the oaks of the forest shall burn, and acorns grow upon the branches of tall trees. The Severn Sea shall discharge itself through seven months, and the river Usk burn seven months. Fishes shall die with the heat thereof, and of them shall be engendered serpents. The baths of Baden shall grow cold and their salubrious waters engender death. London shall mourn for the death of twenty thousand, and the river Thames shall be turned into blood. The monks in their cowls shall be forced to marry, and their cry shall be heard upon the mountains of the Alps. Chapter 4 the continuation of the prophecy. Three springs shall break forth in the city of Winchester, whose rivulets shall divide the island into three parts. Whoever shall drink of the first shall enjoy long life, and shall never be afflicted with sickness. He that shall drink of the second shall die of hunger, and paleness and horror will sit in his countenance. He that shall drink of the third shall be surprised with sudden death, 
neither shall his body be capable of burial. Those that are willing to escape so great a surfeit will endeavour to hide it with several coverings. But whatever bulk shall be laid upon it shall receive the form of another body. For earth shall be turned into stones, stones into water, wood into ashes, ashes into water, if cast over it. Also a damsel shall be sent from the city of the forest of Canute to administer a cure, who, after she shall have practised all her arts, shall dry up the noxious fountains only with her breath. Afterwards, as soon as she shall have refreshed herself with the wholesome liquor, she shall bear in her right hand the wood of Caledon, and in her left the fort of the walls of London. Wherever she shall go, she shall make sulphurous steps, which will smoke with a double flame. That smoke shall rouse up the city of the Routini, and shall make food for the inhabitants of the deep. She shall overflow with rueful tears, and shall fill the island with her dreadful cry. She shall be killed by a heart with ten branches, four of which shall bear golden diadems, but the other six shall be turned into buffalo's horns, whose hideous sound shall astonish the three islands of Britain. The Danian wood shall be stirred up, and breaking forth into a human voice shall cry, Come, O Cambria, and join Cornwall to thy side, and say to Winchester, The earth shall swallow thee up. Translate the seat of thy pastor to the place where ships come to harbour, and the rest of the members will follow the head. For the day hasteneth, in which thy citizens shall perish on account of the guilt of perjury. The whiteness of wool has been hurtful to thee, and the variety of its tinctures. Woe to the perjured nation, for whose sake the renowned city shall come to ruin. The ships shall rejoice at so great an augmentation, and one shall be made out of two. It shall be rebuilt by Eric, loaden with apples, to the smell whereof the birds of several woods shall flock together. He shall add to it a vast palace, and walk it round with six hundred towers. Therefore shall London envy it, and triply increase her walls. The river Thames shall encompass it round, and the fame of the work shall pass beyond the Alps. Eric shall hide his apples within it, and shall make subterraneous passages. At that time shall the stones speak, and the sea towards the Gallic coast be contracted into a narrow space. On each bank shall one man hear another, and the soil of the island shall be enlarged. The secrets of the deep shall be revealed, and Gaul shall tremble for fear. After these things shall come forth a hern from the forest of Calaterium, which shall fly round the island for two years together. With her nocturnal cry she shall call together the winged kind, and assemble to her all sorts of fowls. They shall invade the tillage of husbandmen, and devour all the grain of the harvests. Then shall follow a famine upon the people, and a grievous mortality upon the famine. But when this calamity shall be over, a detestable bird shall go to the valley of Galibus, and shall raise it to be a high mountain. Upon the top thereof it shall also plant an oak, and build its nest in its branches. Three eggs shall be produced from the nest, from whence shall come forth a fox, a wolf, and a bear. The fox shall devour her mother, and bear the head of an ass. In this monstrous form shall she frighten her brothers, and make them fly into Neustria. 
but they shall stir up the tusky boar, and returning in a fleet shall encounter with the fox, who at the beginning of the fight shall feign herself dead, and move the boar to compassion. Then shall the boar approach her carcass, and standing over her shall breathe upon her face and eyes. But she, not forgetting her cunning, shall bite his left foot, and pluck it from his body. Then shall she leap upon him, and snatch away his right ear and tail, and hide herself in the caverns of the mountains. Therefore shall the deluded boar require the wolf and bear to restore him his members, who, as soon as they shall enter into the cause, shall promise two feet of the fox, together with the ear and the tail, and of these they shall make up the members of a hog. With this he shall be satisfied, and expect the promised restitution. In the meantime shall the fox descend from the mountains, and change herself into a wolf, and under pretense of holding a conference with the boar, she shall go to him, and craftily devour him. After that, she shall transform herself into a boar, and feigning a loss of some members, shall wait for her brothers. But as soon as they come, she shall suddenly kill them with her tusks, and shall be crowned with the head of a lion. In her days shall a serpent be brought forth, which shall be a destroyer of mankind. With its length it shall encompass London, and devour all that pass by it. The mountain ox shall take the head of a wolf, and whiten his teeth in the seven. He shall gather to him the flocks of Albania and Cambria, which shall drink the river Thames dry. The ass shall call the goat with the long beard, and shall borrow his shape. Therefore shall the mountain ox be incensed, and having called the wolf, shall become a horned bull against them. In the exercise of his cruelty, he shall devour their flesh and bones, but shall be burnt upon the top of Urian. The ashes of his funeral pile shall be turned into swans that shall swim on, dry ground as a river. They shall devour fishes in fishes, and swallow up men in men. But when old age shall come upon them, they shall become sea-wolves, and practice their frauds in the deep. They shall drown ships, and collect no small quantity of silver. The Thames shall again flow, and assembling together the rivers, shall pass beyond the grounds of its channel. It shall cover the adjacent cities, and overturn the mountains that oppose its course. Being full of deceit and wickedness, it shall make use of the fountain Galibis. Hence shall arise factions, provoking the Venedotians to war. The oaks of the forest shall meet together, and encounter the rocks of the Gavisians. A raven shall attend with the kites, and devour the carcasses of the slain. An owl shall build her nest upon the walls of Gloucester, and in her nest shall be brought forth an ass. The serpent of Mulvernia shall bring him up, and put him upon many fraudulent practices. Having taken the crown, he shall ascend on high, and frighten the people of the country with his hideous braying. In his day shall the Pachean mountains tremble, and the provinces be deprived of their woods. For there shall come a worm with a fiery breath, and with the vapour it sends forth shall burn up the trees. Out of it shall proceed seven lions, deformed with the heads of goats. With the stench of their nostrils they shall corrupt women, and make wives turn common prostitutes. The father shall not know his own son, because they shall grow wanton, 
like brute beasts. Then shall come the giant of wickedness, and terrify all with the sharpness of his eyes. Against him shall arise the dragon of Worcester, and shall endeavour to banish him. But in the engagement the dragon shall be worsted, and oppressed by the wickedness of the conqueror, for he shall mount upon the dragon, and putting off his garment, shall sit upon him naked. The dragon shall bear him up on high, and beat his naked rider with his tail erected. Upon this the giant, rousing up his whole strength, shall break his jaws with his sword. At last the dragon shall fold itself up under its tail, and die of poison. After him shall succeed the boar of Totnes, and oppress the people with a grievous tyranny. Gloucester shall send forth a lion, and shall disturb him in his cruelty, in several battles. He shall trample him under his feet, and terrify him with open jaws. At last the lion shall quarrel with the kingdom, and get upon the backs of the nobility. A bull shall come into the quarrel, and strike the lion with his right foot. He shall drive him through all the inns in the kingdom, but shall break his horns against the walls of Oxford. The fox of Cardubalum shall take revenge on the lion, and destroy him entirely with her teeth. She shall be encompassed by the adder of Lincoln, who with a horrible hiss shall give notice of his presence to a multitude of dragons. Then shall the dragons encounter, and tear one another to pieces. The winged shall oppress that which wants wings, and fasten its claws into the poisonous cheeks. Others shall come into the quarrel, and kill one another. A fifth shall succeed those that are slain, and by various stratagems shall destroy the rest. He shall get upon the back of one with his sword, and sever his head from his body. Then throwing off his garment, he shall get upon another, and put his right and left hand upon his tail. Thus being naked, shall he overcome him, whom when clothed he was not able to deal with. The rest he shall gall in their flight, and drive them round the kingdom. Upon this shall come a roaring lion, dreadful for his monstrous cruelty. Fifteen parts he shall reduce to one, and shall alone possess the people. The giant of the snow-white colour shall shine, and cause the white people to flourish. Pleasures shall effeminate the princes, and they shall suddenly be changed into beasts. Among them shall arise a lion swelled with human gore, under him shall a reaper be placed in the standing corn, who, while he is reaping, shall be oppressed by him. A charioteer of York shall appease him, and having banished his lord, shall mount upon the chariot which he shall drive. With his sword unsheathed shall he threaten the east, and fill the tracks of his wheels with blood. Afterwards he shall become a sea-fish, who, being roused with the hissing of a serpent, shall engender with him. From hence shall be produced three thundering bulls, who, having eaten up their pastures, shall be turned into trees. The first shall carry a whip of vipers, and turn his back upon the next. He shall endeavour to snatch away the whip, but shall be taken by the last they shall turn away their faces from one another, till they have thrown away the poisoned cup. To him shall succeed a husbandman of Albania, at whose back shall be a serpent. He shall be employed in ploughing the ground, that the country may become white with corn. The serpent shall endeavour to diffuse his poison, in order to blast the harvest. A grievous mortality shall sweep away the people, and the walls of cities shall be made desolate. 
there shall be given for a remedy the city of Claudius, which shall interpose the nurse of the scourger. For she shall bear a dose of medicine, and in a short time the island shall be restored. Then shall two successively sway the sceptre, whom a horned dragon shall serve. One shall come in armour, and shall ride upon a flying serpent. He shall sit upon his back with his naked body, and cast his right hand upon his tail. With his cry shall the seas be moved, and he shall strike terror into the second. The second, therefore, shall enter into confederacy with the lion. But a quarrel happening, they shall encounter one another. They shall distress one another, but the courage of the beast shall gain the advantage. Then shall come one with a drum, and appease the rage of the lion. Therefore shall the people of the kingdom be at peace, and provoke the lion to a dose of physic. In his established seat he shall adjust the weights, but shall stretch out his hands into Albania. For which reason the northern provinces shall be grieved, and open the gates of the temples. The sign-bearing wolf shall lead his troops, and surround Cornwall with his tail. He shall be opposed by a soldier in a chariot, who shall transform that people into a boar. The boar, therefore, shall ravage the provinces, but shall hide his head in the depth of Severn. A man shall embrace a lion in wine, and the dazzling brightness of gold shall blind the eyes of beholders. Silver shall whiten in the circumference, and torment several wine presses. Men shall be drunk with wine, and, regardless of heaven, shall be intent upon the earth. From them shall the stars turn away their faces, and confound their usual course. Corn will wither at their malign aspects, and there shall fall no dew from heaven. The roots and branches will change their places, and the novelty of the thing shall pass for a miracle. The brightness of the sun shall fade at the amber of mercury, and horror shall seize the beholders. Stillborn of Arcadia shall change his shield. The helmet of Mars shall call Venus. The helmet of Mars shall make a shadow, and the rage of Mercury pass his bounds. Iron Orion shall unsheath his sword. The marine Phoebus shall torment the clouds. Jupiter shall go out of his lawful paths, and Venus forsake her stated lines. The malignity of the star Saturn shall fall down in rain and slay mankind with a crooked sickle. The twelve houses of the stars shall lament the irregular excursions of their guests, and Gemini omit their usual embraces, and call the urn to the fountains. The scales of Libra shall hang obliquely, till Ares put his crooked horns under them. The tail of Scorpio shall produce lightning, and Cancer quarrel with the sun. Virgo shall mount upon the back of Sagittarius, and darken her virgin flowers. The chariot of the moon shall disorder the zodiac, and the Pleiades break forth into weeping. No offices of Janus shall hereafter return, but his gate being shut shall lie hid in the chinks of Ariadne. The seas shall rise up in the twinkling of an eye, and the dust of the ancients shall be restored. The winds shall fight together with a dreadful blast, and their sound shall reach the stars. End of Book 7
Book Eight, Part One of History of the Kings of Britain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth. Translated by Aaron Thompson and J. A. Giles. Chapter 1. Vortigern Asks Merlin Concerning His Own Death Merlin, by delivering these and many other prophecies, caused in all that were present an admiration at the ambiguity of his expressions. But Vortigern above all the rest both admired and applauded the wisdom and prophetical spirit of the young man for that age had produced none that ever talked in such a manner before him. Being therefore curious to learn his own fate, he desired the young man to tell him what he knew concerning that particular. Merlin answered, Fly the fire of the sons of Constantine if you were able to do it. Already they are fitting out their ships. Already are they leaving the Armorican shore. Already are they spreading out their sails to the wind. They will steer towards Britain. They will invade the Saxon nation. They will subdue that wicked people. But they will first burn you, being shut up in a tower. To your own ruin did you prove a traitor to their father and invite the Saxons into the island. You invited them for your safeguard but they came for a punishment to you. Two deaths instantly threaten you, nor is it easy to determine which you can best avoid. For on the one hand, the Saxons shall lay waste to your country and endeavour to kill you. On the other shall arrive the two brothers, Aurelius Ambrosius and Uther Pendragon, whose business will be to revenge their father's murder upon you. Seek out some refuge if you can. Tomorrow they shall be on the shores of Totnes. The faces of the Saxons shall look red with blood. Hengist shall be killed, and Aurelius Ambrosius shall be crowned. He will bring peace to the nation. He shall restore the churches, but shall die of poison. His brother Uther Pendragon shall succeed him whose days shall also be cut short by poison. There shall be present at the commission of this treason your own issue, whom the boar of Cornwall shall devour. Accordingly the next day early arrived Aurelius Ambrosius and his brother with ten thousand men. Chapter 2 Aurelius Ambrosius, being anointed king of Britain, Burns Vortigern besieged in a tower. As soon as the news of his coming was divulged, the Britons, who had been dispersed by their great calamities, met together from all parts, and gaining this new accession of strength from their countrymen, displayed unusual vigour. Having assembled together the clergy, they anointed Aurelius king and paid him the customary homage. And when the people were urgent to fall upon the Saxons, he dissuaded them from it, because his desire was to pursue Vortigern first. For the treason committed against his father so very much affected him, that he thought nothing done till that was first avenged. In pursuance, therefore, of this design, he marched with his army into Cambria, to the town of Genuru, where the Vortigern had fled for refuge. That town was in the country of Hergin, upon the river Garnia, in the mountain called Cloarius. As soon as Ambrosius was arrived there, bearing in his mind the murder of his father and brother, he spake thus to Eldol, Duke of Gloucester. See, most noble duke, whether the walls of this city are able to protect Vortigern against my sheathing this sword in his bowels. He deserves to die, 
and you cannot, I suppose, be ignorant of his desert. O most villainous of men, whose crimes deserve inexpressible tortures! First he betrayed my father Constantine, who had delivered him and his country from the inroads of the pits. Afterwards my brother Constans, whom he made king on purpose to destroy him. Again, when by his craft he had usurped the crown, he introduced pagans among the natives, in order to abuse those who continued steadfast in their loyalty to me. But by the good providence of God, he unwarily fell into this snare which he had laid for my faithful subjects. For the Saxons, when they found him out in his wickedness, drove him from the kingdom, for which nobody ought to be concerned. But this I think matter of just grief, that this odious people, whom that detestable traitor invited over, has expelled the nobility, laid waste a fruitful country, destroyed the holy churches, and almost extinguished Christianity over the whole kingdom. Now therefore, my countrymen, show yourselves men. First revenge yourselves upon him that was the occasion of all these disasters. Then let us turn our arms against our enemies, and free our country from their brutish tyranny. Immediately, therefore, they set their engines to work, and laboured to beat down the walls. But at last, when all other attempts failed, they had recourse to fire, which, meeting with proper fuel, ceased not to rage till it had burnt down the tower and Vortigern in it. Chapter 3 The Praise of Aurelius's Valour, The Levity of the Scots Exposed Forces Raised Against Hengist Hengist, with his Saxons, was struck with terror at this news, for he dreaded the valour of Aurelius. Such was the bravery and courage this prince was master of, that while he was in Gaul there was none that durst encounter with him, for in all encounters he either dismounted his adversary or broke his spear. Besides, he was magnificent in his presence, constant at his devotions, temperate in all respects, and above all things, hated a lie. A brave soldier on foot, a better on horseback, and expert in the discipline of an army. Reports of these, his noble accomplishments, while he yet continued in Armorican Britain, were daily brought over into the island. Therefore the Saxons, for fear of him, retired beyond the Humber, and in those parts fortified the cities and towns, for that country always was a place of refuge to them, their safety lying in the neighbourhood of Scotland, which used to watch all opportunities of distressing the nation, for that country being in itself a frightful place to live in, and wholly uninhabited, had been a safe retreat for strangers. By its situation, it lay open to the Picts, Scots, Dacians, Norwegians and others that came to plunder the island. Being, therefore, secure of a safe reception in this country, they fled towards it, that, if there should be occasion, they might retreat into it as into their own camp. This was good news to Aurelius, and made him conceive greater hopes of victory. So assembling his people quickly together, he augmented his army, and made an expeditious march towards the north. In his passage through the countries, he was grieved to see the desolation made in them, but especially that the churches were levelled to the ground, and he promised to rebuild them, if he gained the victory. Chapter 4 Hengist marches with his army against Aurelius into the field of Maysbelly. But Hengist, upon his approach, took courage again, and chose out the bravest of his men, whom he exhorted to make a gallant defence, and not be daunted at Aurelius, who, he told them, had but few Armorican Britons with him, since their number did not exceed ten thousand. And as for native Britons, he made no account of them, 
since they had been so often defeated by him. He therefore promised them the victory, and that they should come off safely, considering the superiority of their number, which amounted to two hundred thousand men in arms. After he had in this manner animated his men, he advanced with them towards Aurelius, into a field called May's Belly, through which Aurelius was to pass. For his intention was to make a sudden assault by surprise, and fall upon the Britons before they were prepared. But Aurelius perceived the design, and yet did not, on that account, delay going to the field, but rather pursued his march with more expedition. When he was come within sight of the enemy, he put his troops into order, commanding three thousand Armoricans to attend the cavalry, and drew out the rest together with the islanders into line of battle. The Domitians he placed upon the hills, and the Venedotians in the adjacent woods. His reason for which was that they might be there ready to fall upon the Saxons in case they should flee in that direction. Chapter 5 A Battle Between Aurelius and Hengist In the meantime Eldol, Duke of Gloucester, went to the king and said, This one day should suffice for all the days of my life, if by good providence I could but get an opportunity to engage with Hengist, for one of us should die before we parted. I still retain deeply fixed in my memory the day appointed for our peaceably treating together, but which he villainously made use of to assassinate all that were present at the treaty, except myself only, who stood upon my defence with a stake that I accidentally found, until I made my escape. That day proved fatal through his treachery, to no less than four hundred and sixty barons and consuls, who all went unarmed. From that conspiracy God was pleased to deliver me, by throwing a stake in my way, wherewith I defended myself and escaped. Thus spoke Eldol. Then Aurelius exhorted his companions to place all their hope in the Son of God, and to make a brave assault with one consent upon the enemy in defence of their country. Nor was Hengist less busy on the other hand in forming his troops, and giving them directions how to behave themselves in the battle, and walked himself through their several ranks, the more to spirit them up. At last, both armies, being drawn out in order of battle, began the attack, which they maintained with great bravery and no small loss of blood, both of the Britons and the Saxons. Aurelius animated the Christians, Hengist the pagans, and all the time of the engagement Eldor's chief endeavour was to encounter Hengist, but he had no opportunity for it. For Hengist, when he found that his own men were routed, and that the Christians, by the especial favour of God, had the advantage, fled to the town called Kyakonan, now Cunanengeberg. Aurelius pursued him, and either killed or made slaves of all he found in the way. When Hengist saw that he was pursued by Aurelius, he would not enter the town, but assembled his troops and prepared them to stand another engagement. For he knew the town would not hold out against Aurelius, and that his whole security now lay in his sword. At last Aurelius overtook him, and after marshalling his forces, began another most furious fight. And here the Saxons steadily maintained their ground, notwithstanding the numbers that fell. On both sides there was great slaughter, the groans of the dying causing a greater rage in those that survived. In short, the Saxons would have gained the day had not a detachment of horse from the Armorican Britons come in upon them. For Aurelius had appointed them the same station which they had in the former battle, so that, upon their advancing, 
the Saxons gave ground, and when once a little dispersed, were not able to rally again. The Britons, encouraged by this advantage, exerted themselves and laboured with all their might to distress the enemy. All the time Aurelius was fully employed, not only in giving commands, but encouraging his men by his own example, for with his own hand he killed all that stood in his way, and pursued those that fled. Nor was Eldol less active in all parts of the field, running to and fro to assault his enemies, but still his main endeavour was to find an opportunity of encountering Hengist. Chapter 6 Hengist, in a duel with Eldol, is taken by him. The Saxons are slain by the Britons without mercy. As there were, therefore, several movements made by the parties engaged on each side, an opportunity occurred for their meeting and briskly engaging with each other. In this encounter of the two greatest champions in the field, the fire sparkled with the clashing of their arms, and every stroke in a manner produced both thunder and lightning. For a long time was the victory in suspense, as it seemed sometimes to favour the one, sometimes the other. While they were thus hotly engaged, Gorlois, Duke of Cornwall, came up to them with the party he commanded, and did great execution upon the enemy's troops. At the sight of him, Eldor, assured of victory, seized on the helmet of Hengist, and by main force dragged him in among the Britons, and then in transport of joy cried out with a loud voice, God has fulfilled my desire, my brave soldiers, down, down with your enemies, the Ambrons. The victory is now in your hands. Hengist is defeated, and the day is your own. In the meantime, the Britons failed not to perform every one his part against the pagans, upon whom they made many vigorous assaults. And though they were obliged sometimes to give ground, yet their courage did not fail them in making a good resistance so that they gave the enemy no respite till they had vanquished them. The Saxons therefore fled whithersoever their consternation hurried them, some to the cities, some to the woods upon the hills, and others to their ships. But Octa, the son of Hengist, made his retreat with a great body of men to York. And Eosa, his kinsman, to the city of Alclad, where he had a very large army for his guard. Chapter 7 Hengist is beheaded by Eldol. Aurelius, after this victory, took the city of Conan above mentioned, and stayed there for three days. During this time he gave orders for the burial of the slain, for curing the wounded, and for the ease and refreshment of his forces that were fatigued. Then he called a council with his principal officers to deliberate what was to be done with Hengist. There was at the assembly Eldad, Bishop of Gloucester, and brother of Eldol, a prelate of very great wisdom and piety. As soon as he beheld Hengist standing in the king's presence, he demanded silence, and said, Though all would be unanimous for setting him at liberty, yet I would cut him to pieces. The prophet Samuel is my warrant, who, when he had Agag, king of Amalek, in his power, hewed him in pieces, saying, As thy sword hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. Do, therefore, the same to Hengist, who is a second Agag. Accordingly, Eldor took his sword and drew him out of the city and then cut off his head. 
but Aurelius, who showed moderation in all his conduct, commanded him to be buried, and a heap of earth to be raised over his body, according to the custom of the pagans. Chapter 8 Octa, being besieged in York, surrenders himself to the mercy of Aurelius. From hence, Aurelius conducted his army to York to besiege Octa, Hengist's son. When the city was invested, Octa was doubtful whether he should give him any opposition and stand a siege against such a powerful army. After consultation upon it, he went out with his principal nobility that were present, carrying a chain in his hand and sand upon his head, and presented himself to the king with this address. My gods are vanquished, and I doubt not that the sovereign power is in your god, who has compelled so many noble persons to come before you in this suppliant manner. Be pleased, therefore, to accept of us and of this chain. If you do not think us fit objects of your clemency, we here present ourselves ready to be fettered and to undergo whatever punishment you shall adjudge us to. Aurelius was moved to pity at the spectacle and demanded the advice of his council what should be done with them. After various proposals upon the subject, Elder the bishop rose up and delivered his opinion in these words. The Gibeonites came voluntarily to the children of Israel to desire mercy, and they obtained it. And shall we Christians be worse than the Jews in refusing them mercy? It is mercy which they beg, and let them have it. The island of Britain is large, and in many places uninhabited. Let us make a covenant with them, and suffer them at least to inhabit the desert places, that they may be our vassals for ever. The king acquiesced in Eldad's advice, and suffered them to partake of his clemency. After this, Aosa and the rest that fled, being encouraged by Octa's success, came also, and were admitted to the same favour. The king therefore granted them the country bordering upon Scotland, and made a firm covenant with them. Chapter 9 Aurelius, having entirely routed the enemies, restores all things in Britain, especially ecclesiastical affairs, to their ancient state. The enemies being now entirely reduced, the king summoned the consuls and princes of the kingdom together at York, where he gave orders for the restoration of the churches which the Saxons had destroyed. He himself undertook the rebuilding of the metropolitan church of that city, as also the other cathedral cities in that province. After fifteen days, when he had settled workmen in several places, he went to London, which city had not escaped the fury of the enemy. He beheld with great sorrow the destruction made in it, and recalled the remainder of the citizens from all parts, and began the restoration of it. Here he settled the affairs of the whole kingdom, revived the laws, restored the right heirs to the possessions of their ancestors, and those estates whereof the heirs had been lost in late grievous calamity, he distributed among his fellow soldiers. In these important concerns of restoring the nation to its ancient state, repairing the churches, re-establishing peace and law, and settling the administration of justice, was his time wholly employed. From hence he went to Winchester to repair the ruins of it, as he did for other cities and when the work was finished there, he went, at the insistence of Bishop Eldad, to the monastery near Caer Caradoc, now Salisbury, where the consuls and princes, whom the wicked Hengist had treacherously murdered, lay buried. At this place was a convent, 
that maintained three hundred friars situated on the mountain of Ambrius, who, as is reported, had been the founder of it. The sight of the place where the dead lay made the king, who was of a compassionate temper, shed tears and at last enter upon thoughts what kind of monument to erect upon it. For he thought something ought to be done to perpetuate the memory of that piece of ground which was honoured with the bodies of so many noble patriots that died for their country. Chapter 10 Aurelius is advised by Merlin to remove the giant's dance from the mountain Killerouse. For this purpose he summoned together several carpenters and masons, and commanded them to employ the utmost of their art in contriving some new structure for a lasting monument to those great men. But they, in diffidence of their own skill, refusing to undertake it, Trumanus, Archbishop of the City of Legions, went to the king and said, If any one living is able to execute your commands, Merlin, the prophet of Vortigern, is the man. In my opinion, there is not in all your kingdom a person of brighter genius, either in predicting future events or in mechanical contrivances. Order him to come to you and exercise his skill in the work which you design. Whereupon Aurelius, after he had asked a great many questions concerning him, dispatched several messengers into the countries to find him out and bring him to him. After passing through several provinces, they found him in the country of the Gavisians, at the fountain of Galbes, which he frequently resorted to. As soon as they had delivered their message to him, they conducted him to the king, who received him with joy, and being curious to hear some of his wonderful speeches, commanded him to prophesy. Merlin made answer, Mysteries of this kind are not to be revealed but when there is the greatest necessity for it. If I should pretend to utter them, either for ostentation or diversion, the spirit that instructs me would be silent and would leave me when I should have occasion for it. When he had made the same refusal to all the rest present, the king would not urge him any longer about his predictions, but spoke to him concerning the monument which he designed. "'If you are desirous,' said Merlin, "'to honour the burying-place of these men "'with an everlasting monument, "'send for the giant's dance, "'which is in Killerhouse, a mountain in Ireland. "'For there is a structure of stones there "'which none of this age could raise "'without a profound knowledge of the mechanical arts. "'They are stones of a great magnitude "'and wonderful quality.' and if they can be placed here, as they are there, round this spot of ground, they will stand for ever. Chapter 11 Uther Pendragon is appointed with Merlin to bring over the giant's dance. At these words of Merlin, Aurelius burst into laughter and said, how, how is it possible to remove such vast stones from so distant a country as if Britain was not furnished with stones fit for the work? Merlin replied, I entreat your majesty to forbear vain laughter, for what I say is without vanity. They are mystical stones and of a medicinal virtue. The giants of old brought them from the farthest coasts of Africa and placed them in Ireland while they inhabited that country. Their design in this was to make baths in them when they should be taken with any illness, for their method was to wash the stones and put their sick into the water which infallibly cured them. With the like success they cured wounds also, adding only the application of some herbs. There is not a stone there which has not some healing virtue. 
When the Britons heard this, they resolved to send for the stones, and to make war upon the people of Ireland if they should offer to detain them. And to accomplish this business, they made choice of Uther Pendragon, who was to be attended with fifteen thousand men. They chose also Merlin himself, by whose direction the whole affair was to be managed. A fleet being therefore got ready, they set sail, and with a fair wind arrived in Ireland. Chapter 12 Gilomanius, being routed by Uther, the Britons bring over the giant's dance into Britain. At that time, Gilomanius, a youth of wonderful valour, reigned in Ireland, who upon the news of the arrival of the Britons in his kingdom, levied a vast army, and marched out against them. And when he had learnt the occasion of their coming, he smiled, and said to those about him, Ha! No wonder a cowardly race of people were able to make so great devastation in the island of Britain, when the Britons are such brutes and fools! Was ever the like folly heard of? What are the stones of Ireland better than those of Britain, that our kingdom must be put to this disturbance for them? To arm soldiers and defend your country. While I have life, they shall not take from us the least stone of the giant's dance. Uther, seeing them prepared for a battle, attacked them. Nor was it long ere the Britons had the advantage, who, having dispersed and killed the Irish, forced Gilomanius to flee. After the victory, they went to the mountain killer house, and arrived at the structure of stones, the sight of which filled them both with joy and admiration. And while they were all standing round them, Merlin came up to them and said, Now try your forces, young men, and see whether strength or art can do the most towards taking down these stones. At this word, they all set to their engines with one accord, and attempted the removing of the giant's dance. Some prepared cables, others small ropes, others ladders for the work, but all to no purpose. Merlin laughed at their vain efforts, and then began his own contrivances. When he had placed in order the engines that were necessary, he took down the stones with an incredible facility, and gave directions for carrying them to the ships, and placing them therein. This done, they with joy set sail again, to return to Britain, where they arrived with a fair gale, and repaired to the burying place with the stones. When Aurelius had notice of it, he sent messengers to all parts of Britain, to summon the clergy and people together to the Mount of Ambrius, in order to celebrate with joy and honour the erection of the monument. Upon this summons appeared the bishops, abbots, and people of all other orders and qualities, and upon the day and place appointed for their general meeting, Aurelius placed the crown upon his head, and with royal pomp celebrated the Feast of Pentecost, the solemnity whereof he continued the three following days. In the meantime, all places of honour that were vacant he bestowed upon his domestics, as rewards for their good services. At that time the two metropolitan sees of York and Legions were vacant, and with the general consent of the people, whom he was willing to please in this choice, he granted York to Sancso, a man of great quality, and much celebrated for his piety, and the city of Legions to Debricius, whom divine providence had pointed out as a most useful pastor in that place. As soon as he had settled these and other affairs in the kingdom, he ordered Merlin to set up the stones brought over from Ireland about the sepulchre, which he accordingly did, and placed them in the same manner as they had been in the mountain killer house, and thereby gave a manifest proof of the prevalence of art above strength. Chapter 13. Percentius Brings in the Saxons Against the Britons At the same time Percentius, the son of Vortigern, 
who had fled over into Germany, was levying all the forces of that kingdom against Aurelius Ambrosius, with a design to revenge his father's death, and promised his men an immense treasure of gold and silver if with their assistance he could succeed in reducing Britain under his power. When he had, at last, corrupted all the youth of the country with his large promises, he prepared a vast fleet and arrived in the northern parts of the island, upon which he began to make great devastation. The king, on the other hand, hearing this news, assembled his army, and, marching against them, challenged the enraged enemy to a battle. The challenge was accepted, and by the blessing of God the enemy was defeated and put to flight. End of Book 8, Part 1Book 8, Part 2 of History of the Kings of Britain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth. Translated by Aaron Thompson and J. A. Giles. Chapter 14. Pacentius, assisted by the King of Ireland, again invades Britain. Aurelius dies by the treachery of Aopa, a Saxon. Pacentius, after this flight, durst not return to Germany, but shifting his sails, went over to Gilomanius in Ireland, by whom he was well received and when he had given him an account of his misfortune, Gilomanius, in pity to him, promised him his assistance, and at the same time vented his complaint of the injuries done him by Uther, the brother of Aurelius, when he came for the giant's dance. At last, entering into confederacy together, they made ready their fleet, in which they embarked, and arrived at the city of Minavia. This news caused Uthpendragon to levy his forces and march into Cambria to fight them. For his brother Aurelius then lay sick at Winchester and was not able to go himself. When Pacentius, Illimanius, and the Saxons heard of it, they highly rejoiced, flattering themselves that his sickness would facilitate to them the conquest of Britain. While this occurrence was the subject of the people's discourse, one of the Saxons, named Aopa, came to Pacentius and said, What reward will you give the man that shall kill Aurelius Ambrosius for you? To whom Pacentius answered, Oh, that I could find a man of such resolution. I would give him a thousand pounds of silver and my friendship for life. And if by good fortune I can but gain the crown, I promise upon oath to make him a centurion. To this Aopa replied, I have learnt the British language and know the manners of the people, and have skill in physic. If, therefore, you will perform this promise, I will pretend to be a Christian and a Briton, and when, as a physician, I shall be admitted into the king's presence, I will make him a potion that will dispatch him. And to gain the readier access to him, I will put on the appearance of a devout and learned monk. Upon the offer, Pacentius entered into covenant with him, and confirmed what he had promised with an oath. Aopa, therefore, shaved his beard and head, and in the habit of a monk 
hastened to Winchester, loaded with vessels full of medical preparations. As soon as he arrived there, he offered his service to those that attended about the king, and was graciously received by them, for to them nobody was now more acceptable than a physician. Being introduced into the king's presence, he promised to restore him to his health, if he would but take his potions, upon which he had his orders forthwith to prepare one of them, into which, when he had secretly conveyed a poisonous mixture, he gave it to the king. As soon as Aurelius had drunk it up, the wicked Ambron ordered him presently to cover himself close up and fall asleep, that the detestable poison might the better operate. The king readily obeyed his prescriptions, and in hopes of his speedy recovery fell asleep. But the poison quickly diffused itself through all the pores and veins of his body, so that the sleep ended in death. In the meantime, the wicked traitor, having cunningly withdrawn himself, first from one and then from another, was no longer to be found in the court. During these transactions at Winchester, there appeared a star of wonderful magnitude and brightness, darting forth a ray, at the end of which was a globe of fire in the form of a dragon, out of whose mouth issued forth two rays, one of which seemed to stretch out itself beyond the extent of Gaul, the other towards the Irish Sea, and ended in seven lesser rays. Chapter 15 A Comet Pre-Signifies the Reign of Uther At the appearance of this star, a general fear and amazement seized the people, and even Uther, the king's brother, who was then upon his march with his army into Cambria, being not a little terrified at it, was very curious to know of the learned men what it portended. Among others, he ordered Merlin to be called, who also attended in this expedition to give his advice in the management of the war, and who, being now presented before him, was commanded to discover to him the signification of the star. At this, he burst out into tears, and with a loud voice cried out, O oh, irreparable loss! O oh, distressed people of Britain! Alas, the illustrious prince is departed! The renowned king of the Britons, Aurelius Ambrosius, is dead! Whose death will prove fatal to us all, unless God be our helper! Make haste, therefore, most noble Uther! Make haste to engage the enemy. The victory will be yours, and you shall be king of all Britain. For the star and the fiery dragon under it signifies yourself, and the ray extending towards the Gallic coast portends that you will have a most potent sun, to whose power all those kingdoms shall be subject over which the ray reaches. But the other ray signifies a daughter whose sons and grandsons shall successively enjoy the kingdom of Britain. Chapter 16 Pacentius and Gilomanius are killed in battle. Uther though he doubted the truth of what Merlin had declared, pursued his march against the enemy, for he was now come within half a day's march of Menavia. When Gilomanius, Pacentius, and the Saxons were informed of his approach, they went out to give him battle. As soon as they were come within sight of each other, both armies began to form themselves into several bodies, and then advanced to a close attack, in which both sides suffered a loss of men, as usually happens in such engagements. 
At last, towards the close of day, the advantage was on Uther's side, and the death of Gilomanius and Pacentius made a way for complete victory, so that the barbarians, being put to flight, hastened to their ships, but were slain by their pursuers. Thus, by the favour of Christ, the general had triumphant success, and then, with all possible expedition, after so great a fatigue, returned back to Winchester, for he had now been informed, by messengers that arrived, of the king's sad fate, and of his burial by the bishops of the country, near the convent of Ambrius, within the giant's dance, which in his lifetime he had commanded to be made. For upon hearing the news of his death, the bishops, abbots, and all the clergy of that province had met together at Winchester to solemnize his funeral. And because in his lifetime he had given orders for his being buried in the sepulchre which he had prepared, they therefore carried his corpse thither, and performed his exequies with royal magnificence. Chapter 17 Uther Pendragon is made King of Britain But Uther his brother, having assembled the clergy of the kingdom, took the crown, and by universal consent was advanced to the kingdom. And remembering the explanation which Merlin had made of the star above mentioned, he commanded two dragons to be made of gold, in likeness of the dragon which he had seen at the ray of the star. As soon as they were finished, which was done with wonderful nicety of workmanship, he made a present of one to the Cathedral Church of Winchester, but reserved the other for himself, to be carried along with him to his wars. From this time, therefore, he was called Uther, Pendragon, which in the British tongue signifies the dragon's head. The occasion of this appellation being Merlin's prediction from the appearance of a dragon that he should be king. Chapter 18 Octa and Aosa are taken in battle. In the meantime, Octa, the son of Hengist, and his kinsman Aosa, seeing that they were no longer bound by the treaty which they had made with Aurelius Ambrosius, began to raise disturbances against the king and infest his countries. For they were now joining with the Saxons whom Pacentius had brought over, and sending messengers into Germany for the rest. Being therefore attended with a vast army, he invaded the northern provinces, and in an outrageous manner destroyed all the cities and fortified places, from Albania to York. At last, as he was beginning the siege of that city, Uther Pendragon came upon him with the whole power of the kingdom, and gave him battle. The Saxons behaved with great gallantry, and having sustained the assaults of the Britons, forced them to fly, and upon this advantage pursued them with slaughter to the mountain Daemon, which was as long as they could do it with daylight. The mountain was high, and had a hazel wood upon the top of it, and about the middle broken and cavernous rocks, which were a harbour to wild beasts. The Britons made up to it, and stayed there all night among the rocks and hazel bushes. But as it began to draw towards day, Uther commanded the consuls and princes to be called together, that he might consult with them in what manner to assault the enemy, whereupon they forthwith appeared before the king, who commanded them to give their advice and Gorlois, Duke of Cornwall, had orders to deliver his opinion first, out of regard to his years and great deliverance. "'There is no occasion,' said he, "'for ceremonies or speeches, while we see that it is still night. But there is for boldness and courage, 
if you desire any longer enjoyment of your life and liberty. The pagans are very numerous and eager to fight, and we much inferior to them in number, so that if we stay till daybreak, we cannot, in my opinion, attack them to advantage. Come on, therefore, while we have the favour of night, and let us go down in a close body, and surprise them in their camp with a sudden assault. There can be no doubt of success, if with one consent we fall upon them bodily, while they think themselves secure, and have no expectation of our coming in such a manner. The king, and all that were present, were pleased with his advice, and pursued it. For as soon as they were armed, and placed in their ranks, they made towards the enemy's camp, designing a general assault. But upon approaching to it, they were discovered by the watch, who with sound of trumpet awakened their companions. The enemies being hereupon put into confusion and astonishment, part of them hastened towards the sea, and part ran up and down, whithersoever their fear or precipitation drove them. The Britons, finding their coming discovered, hastened their march, and keeping still close together in their ranks, assailed the camp, into which, when they had found an entrance, they ran with their drawn swords upon the enemy, who in this sudden surprise made a faint defence against their vigorous and regular attack. And pursuing this blow with great eagerness, they destroyed some thousands of the pagans, took Octa and Aosa prisoners, and entirely dispersed the Saxons. Chapter 19 Uther, falling in love with Igerna, enjoys her by the assistance of Merlin's magical operations. After this victory, Uther repaired to the city of Alclad, where he settled the affairs of that province, and restored peace everywhere. He also made a progress round all the countries of the Scots, and tamed the fierceness of that rebellious people by such a strict administration of justice as none of his predecessors had exercised before, so that in his time offenders were everywhere under great terror, since they were sure of being punished without mercy. At last, when he had established peace in the northern provinces, he went to London, and commanded Octa and Aosa to be kept in prison there. The Easter following, he ordered all the nobility of the kingdom to meet him at that city, in order to celebrate that great festival, in honour of which he designed to wear his crown. The summons was everywhere obeyed, and there was a great concourse from all cities to celebrate the day. So the king observed the festival with great solemnity, as he had designed, and very joyfully entertained his nobility of whom there was a very great muster, with their wives and daughters, suitably to the magnificence of the banquet prepared for them. And having been received with joy by the king, they also expressed the same in their deportment before him. Among the rest was present Gorlois, king of Cornwall, with his wife Egerna, the greatest beauty in all Britain. No sooner had the king cast his eyes upon her among the rest of the ladies than he fell passionately in love with her, and little regarding the rest made her the subject of all his thoughts. She was the only lady that he continually served with fresh dishes, and to whom he sent golden cups by his confidence. On her he bestowed all his smiles and to her addressed all his discourse. The husband, discovering this, fell into a great rage, and retired from the court without taking leave. Nor was there anybody that could stop him, while he was under fear of losing the chief object of his delight. Uther, therefore, in great wrath, commanded him to return back to court, 
to make satisfaction for this affront. But Gorlois refused to obey, upon which the king was highly incensed and swore he would destroy his country if he did not speedily compound for his offence. Accordingly, without delay, while their anger was hot against each other, the king got together a great army and marched into Cornwall, the cities and towns whereof he set on fire. But Gorlois durst not engage with him, on account of the inferiority of his numbers, and thought it a wiser course to fortify his towns, till he could get succour from Ireland. And as he was more under concern for his wife than himself, he put her into the town of Tintagel, upon the seashore, which he looked upon as a place of great safety. But he himself entered the castle of Dimmerlock, to prevent their being both at once involved in the same danger, if any should happen. The king, informed of this, went to the town where Gorlois was, which he besieged, and shut up all the avenues to it. A whole week was now passed, when, retaining in mind his love to Agarna, he said to one of his confidants, named Ulfin de Ricaradoc, My passion for Agarna is such that I can neither have ease of mind nor ease of body till I obtain her. And if you cannot assist me with your advice how to accomplish my desire, the inward torments I endure will kill me. Who can advise you in this matter, said Ulfin, when no force will enable us to have access to her in the town of Tintagel? For it is situated upon the sea, and on every side surrounded by it, and there is but one entrance into it, and that through a straight rock, which three men shall be able to defend against the whole power of the kingdom. Notwithstanding, if the prophet Merlin would in earnest set about this attempt, I am of opinion you might with his advice obtain your wishes. The king readily believed what he was so well inclined to, and ordered Merlin, who was also come to the siege, to be called. Merlin, therefore, being introduced into the king's presence, was commanded to give his advice how the king might accomplish his desire with respect to Agarna. And he, finding the great anguish of the king, was moved by such excessive love, and said, To accomplish your desire, you must make use of such arts as have not been heard of in your time. I know how, by the force of my medicines, to give you the exact likeness of Gorlois so that in all respects you shall seem to be no other than himself. If you will therefore obey my prescriptions, I will metamorphize you into the true semblance of Gorlois, and Ulfin into Jordan of Tintagel, his familiar friend. And I myself, being transformed into another shape, will make the third in the adventure. And in this disguise, you may go safely into the town where Ilgerina is, and have admittance to her. The king complied with the proposal, and acted with great caution in this affair, and when he had committed the care of the siege to his intimate friends, underwent the medical applications of Merlin, by whom he was transformed into the likeness of Gorlois. As Ulfin also into Jordan, and Merlin himself into Brickle, so that nobody could see any remains now of their former likeness. They then set forward on their way to Tintagel, at which they arrived in the evening twilight, and forthwith signified to the porter that the consul was come, upon which the gates were opened and the men let in. For what room could there be for suspicion when Gorlois himself seemed to be there present. The king, therefore, stayed that night with Agarna, and had the full enjoyment of her, for she was deceived with the false disguise which he had put on, 
and the artful and amorous discourses wherewith he entertained her. He told her that he had left his own place besieged, purely to provide for the safety of her dear self and the town she was in, so that believing all that he said, she refused him nothing which he desired. The same night, therefore, she conceived of the most renowned Arthur, whose heroic and wonderful actions have justly rendered his name famous to posterity. Chapter 20 Gorlois being killed, Uther marries a Gerina. In the meantime, as soon as the king's absence was discovered at the siege, his army unadvisedly made an assault upon the walls and provoked the besieged count to a battle, who himself also, acting as inconsiderately as they, sallied forth with his men, thinking with such a small handful to oppose a powerful army, but happened to be killed in the very first brunt of the fight, and had all his men routed. The town also was taken, but all the riches of it were not shared equally among the besiegers, but every one greedily took what he could get, according as fortune or his own strength favoured him. After this bold attempt came messengers to Igerna, with the news both of the duke's death and of the event of the siege. But when they saw the king, in the likeness of the consul, sitting close by her. They were struck with shame and astonishment at his safe arrival there, whom they had left dead at the siege, for they were wholly ignorant of the miracles which Merlin had wrought with his medicines. The king therefore smiled at the news, and embracing the countess said to her, Your own eyes may convince you that I am not dead, but alive but notwithstanding, the destruction of the town and the slaughter of my men is what very much grieves me, so that there is reason to fear the king's coming upon us and taking us in this place, to prevent which I will go out to meet him and make my peace with him for fear of a worse disaster. Accordingly, as soon as he was out of the town, he went to his army, and having put off the disguise of Gorlois, was now Uther Pendragon again. When he had had a full relation made to him of how matters had succeeded, he was sorry for the death of Gorlois, but rejoiced that Igerino was now at liberty to marry again. Then he returned to the town of Tintagel, which he took, and in it what he impatiently wished for, Igerino herself. After this, they continued to live together with much affection for each other, and had a son and daughter, whose names were Arthur and Anne. Chapter 21 Octa and Aosa renew the war. Lot, a consul, marries the king's daughter. In process of time, the king was taken ill of a lingering distemper, and meanwhile the keepers of the prison wherein Octa and Aosa, as we related before, led a weary life, had fled over with them into Germany, and occasioned great fear over the kingdom. For there was a report of their great levies in Germany, and the vast fleet which they had prepared for their return to destroy the island which the event verified. For they returned in a great fleet, and with a prodigious number of men, and invaded the parts of Albania, where they destroyed both cities and inhabitants with fire and sword. Wherefore, in order to repulse the enemies, the command of the British army was committed to Lot of Londonesia, who was a consul and a most valiant knight, and grown up to maturity both of years and wisdom. Out of respect to his eminent merits, the king had given him his daughter Anne, 
and entrusted him with the care of the kingdom during his illness. In his expedition against the enemies, he had various success, being often repulsed by them and forced to retreat to the cities. But he often routed and dispersed them and compelled them to flee sometimes into the woods, sometimes to their ships. So that in a war attended with so many turns of fortune, it was hard to know which side had the better. The greatest injury to the Britons was their own pride, in disdaining to obey the consul's commands, for which reason all their efforts against the enemy were less rigorous and successful. Chapter 22 Uther, being ill, is carried in a horse litter against the enemy. The island, being by this conduct now almost laid waste, the king, having information of the matter, fell into a greater rage than his weakness could bear, and commanded all his nobility to come before him, that he might reprove them severely for their pride and cowardice. As soon as they were all entered into his presence, he sharply rebuked them in menacing language, and swore he himself would lead them against the enemy. For this purpose he ordered a horse litter to be made, in which he designed to be carried, for his infirmity would not suffer him to use any other sort of vehicle, and he charged them all to be ready to march against the enemy on the first opportunity. So, without delay, the horse litter and all his attendants were got ready, and the day arrived which had been appointed for their march. Chapter 23 Octa and Aosa, with a great number of their men, are killed. The king, therefore, being put into his vehicle, they marched directly to Verulam, where the Saxons were grievously oppressing the people. When Octa and Aosa had intelligence that the Britons were come, and that the king was brought in a horse litter, they disdained to fight with him, saying it would be a shame for such brave men to fight with one that was half dead. For which reason they retired into the city, and, as it were in contempt of any danger from the enemy, left their gates wide open. But Uther, upon information of this, instantly commanded his men to lay siege to the city and assault the walls on all sides, which orders they strictly executed, and were just entering the breaches which they had made in the walls, and ready to begin a general assault, when the Saxons, seeing the advantages which the Britons had gained, and being forced to abate somewhat of their haughty pride, condescended so far as to put themselves into a posture of defence. They therefore mounted the walls, from whence they poured down showers of arrows, and repulsed the Britons. On both sides the contest continued, till night released them from the fatigue of their arms, which was what many of the Britons desired, though the greater part of them were for having the matter quickly decided with the enemy. The Saxons, on the other hand, finding how prejudicial their own pride had been to them, and that the advantage was on the side of the Britons, resolved to make a sally at break of day and try their fortune with the enemy in the open field, which accordingly was done. For no sooner was it daylight than they marched out with this design, all in their proper ranks. The Britons, seeing them, divided their men into several bodies, and advancing towards them, began the attack first, their part being to assault, while the others were only upon the defensive. However, much blood was shed on both sides, and the greatest part of the day spent in the fight, when at last, Octa and Aosa being killed, the Saxons turned their backs and left the Britons a complete victory. The king at this was in such an ecstasy of joy that whereas before he could hardly raise himself up without the help of others, 
he now, without any difficulty, sat upright in his horse-litter, of himself, as if he was on a sudden restored to health, and said, with a laughing and merry countenance, "'Those Ambrons called me the half-dead king, because my sickness obliged me to lie in a horse-litter, and indeed so I was. Yet victory to me half-dead is better than to be safe and sound and vanquished. For to die with honour is preferable to living with disgrace. Chapter 24 Uther, upon drinking spring water that was treacherously poisoned by the Saxons, dies. The Saxons, notwithstanding this defeat, persisted still in their malice, and entering the northern provinces, without respite infested the people there. Uther's purpose was to have pursued them, but his princes dissuaded him from it, because his illness had increased since the victory. This gave new courage to the enemy, who left nothing unattempted to make conquest of the kingdom. And now they have recourse to their former treacherous practices, and contrive how to compass the king's death by secret villainy. And because they could have no access to him otherwise, they resolved to take him off by poison, in which they succeeded. For while he was lying ill at Verulam, they sent away some spies, in a poor habit, to learn the state of the court. And when they had thoroughly informed themselves of the posture of affairs, they found out an expedient by which they might best accomplish their villainy, for there was near the court a spring of very clear water, which the king used to drink of when his distemper had made all other liquors nauseous to him. This the detestable conspirators made use of to destroy him by so poisoning the whole mass of water which sprung up, that the next time the king drank of it he was seized with sudden death, as were also a hundred other persons after him, till the villainy was discovered, and a heap of earth thrown over the well. As soon as the king's death was divulged, the bishops and clergy of the kingdom assembled, and carried his body off to the convent of Ambrius, where they buried it with regal solemnity, close by Aurelius Ambrosius, within the giant's dance. End of Book 8, Part 2